going down, man? It's Donnie Houston Podcast. I am Donnie Houston. Check it out, man. We got a special guest today, man. Real H-Town legend, man. Um, hey, from the Swisher House, you know what I'm saying, to the color change and click, you know what I'm saying, on to a, to a legendary solo career. Uh, Paul Wall, the People's Champ. What's going down, man? What do, baby? What's what the do? deal, man? Yes, sir. Man, finally got young. People be asking me, man, why you when you gonna have Paul on? I be like, man, I talk to him all the time, man. Yes, like, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> happy to finally be on, man. You know yeah, man? definitely happy to be on. You know what yeah, I'm for sure. What's going down, man? Hey, man, just uh, staying COVID free. I got my COVID test, so you know, from that day, I ain't have it. I don't know if I got it now, you know, because you know them tests were. I could have got it the same day I got tested. I could have left the parking lot and caught it. So you know, that's how it go. But uh, I, I was happy to at least get it back. And you know, I'm, I don't got it, you know. So yeah, hey. That's right. Social yeah. distancing working so far. Yeah. How you been? How you been managing through uh, through everything been going on? I know. I saw you were doing what was it, something with Alex. Uh... Yeah, me and Alex Braven, We've been raising money for the food bank. Um, you know, just just trying to you know what I'm saying uh, it, just support the food bank. They do do great job year round, but especially in times of tragedy, you know, they always step up to the plate. And, uh, one dollar, every dollar you donate provides three meals. So you know, even if you give ten dollars, that's thirty meals that. If someone's able to eat because of you so you know it's a it's been a group effort just trying to help get people to help you know contribute donate whatever they can and it just bridge the gap from people that need it or and those that want to want to help in this time me being somebody who's been on both ends you know i i didn't got the help and gave the help you know so i i know what it means you know what i'm saying to 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 get that help so shout out to the food bank you know if you text feed hue f-e-e-d-h-o-u to 41444 it'll send you a link to your phone show you how to uh you can donate shout out to the houston food bank shout out to my boy alex bregman what's up already already now you had said something just now you were saying you know how to be on the, on the uh how to be on the receiving end you know what i'm saying talk about just because i mean everybody know paul wall now you know what i mean but talk about just early on you know what i mean yeah. how just before it was you know just man you know um throughout my whole life it's always been a you know what kind of lens do you want to look at your life today you know kind of perspective because there's been good good and bad ups and downs there's been a a, a wide range you know what i'm saying of uh, 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 just life, you know what I'm saying? And it's definitely a lot to be grateful for, you know what I'm saying? There's definitely a lot that when I reflect back thinking, I, you know, I wish I would have handled things maybe differently in certain situations or, you know, as you gain knowledge you know, of yourself and your surroundings, and, but especially of yourself, you gain knowledge of that, of, of how to kind of control yourself or your emotions or just you know, just those type of things. You know, of course, you, you grow a lot of times. And so myself, for sure, I, I've experienced that and I feel like, you know, like, man, there's a lot, uh, you know, a lot to be grateful for, but also, you know, maybe a few regrets here and there, but the good and the bad is, you know, how do you perceive it? You know what I'm saying? Because what's good to me might not be good to somebody else. What's bad to me might be not bad to somebody else. When you see people who have it worse, sometimes you kind of, you know, think, well, okay, well, you become a little more grateful. And then sometimes when you see people who have it better than you, sometimes you feel the, the opposite. You feel like you, you do, you old, you know, you entitled, you know, and sometimes that can be a motivating factor on either side. And also can, you know, sometimes it could be a, a you know, a hindrance sometimes, but uh, definitely, man, it's been growing up, you know, from my early childhood, you know, in my first earliest memories, you know what I'm saying? It, you know, there's always been, Sometimes where there's been, you know, whatever, good or bad. So I just learned to just be grateful for everything that come, you know what I'm saying? Especially the small things. I was always taught the little things lead to big things. So that mean little things like things that I might overlook, like, you know, handwriting, you know what I'm saying? When as a child, little things lead to big things. The little the messy handwriting lead to me dressing sloppy or lead to you leaving your bed sloppy where you know some part of making your bed isn't just the physical putting the sheet and having it looking nice a lot of it is just getting yourself in the habitual mind frame of clearing something off you know it's time for a new day getting yourself in a chore of you know saying getting yourself ready and prepared and it just you know a lot of people who have made beds they also you know, they their shoes are tied. You know what I'm saying? They buttons is buttoned up. They not looking sloppy. They they together. Yeah, yeah. you know they yeah. got themselves together. So it it, it necessarily don't always mean the same thing. It don't always correlate, but a lot of times it do. So that's just how I just learned to look at everything that come at me. You know, no matter how bad it might be, I always look at it like, okay, w what am I gonna learn from this? You know what I'm saying? Some is even when I'm in the midst of it, sometimes it's like, damn, okay, it's difficult, but. You know, okay, I'm, I, this means something to me. I, I know something. I'm going to learn from this. I'm going to grow from this. Something's going to come from this, uh, you know, as soon as I can overcome this. And, and you know, I feel like uh, just 
where God has led me as a, a man or a person on this earth, a lot of times you can read something in a book, but until you experience, you know, I, I can look at a cookbook right now uh, and it can talk all about flavors and stuff, but until I actually taste that and experience the taste and then, oh, okay, now I know what, how to cook or this or that, you know, or, or what this mean or that mean, you know what I'm saying? It, mean, it take on a whole new meaning when you actually get to taste the food as opposed to just read it in a book. So it's the same thing with ups and downs, man. When you go through, when you go through good, when you go through bad, you know what I'm saying? It just sometimes it molds you as a, a human being. Um, but at the same time, you know what I'm saying? It, 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 how can I relate to you if you having, if you my friend and you having a hard time and I'm not, I, maybe I can't relate to that. But if I've had that hard experience, and then now you're my friend and you're going through this hard time, I can maybe tell you, hey, bro, I done been there, man. Let me tell you what I learned from that. Let me tell you what, what God showed me or what I'm still learning from this particular experience that's similar to what you're going through. So, you know, that's how I, every situation that comes, good or bad, it's all a, you know, it's a journey. You know, they say the, the journey is the destination sometimes. You know, that just means that we might think, okay, my goal in life is to have a house, car, and the money. You know this that which those are all things you might I might strive for, but the 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 destination really is the journey is the the journey of actually going there to get those things, working hard to perfect your craft, to go out there to take advantage of every opportunity, uh, you know, and just to, to be your best self to earn the money or to earn the things, the accolades that you might strive for. Though the, the the destination is the journey, and that's just you know that that's what it means sometimes. For so sure. relate to that a lot of times, and it. Even when it's good, I know it's only temporary. You know, even, something's gonna happen. It's always ups and downs, you know, for every single person on this earth. But me, especially knowing and feeling the bad and then, you know, losing and then feeling good and then losing, feeling good news. I'm just like prepared for it. Not like I'm looking for it, but I know that just life is just a journey of ups and downs. So even when I'm up, all right, it's a great time for me to prepare for when I'm down or when other people are down or if I'm up now, who is who is down around me that maybe I can help or help lift them up or encourage them? But you know, it's just a it's a, a constant it's a constant journey. You know, the ups and the down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So man, you were saying um, growing up, man, you, you are you were you always from the north side? You grew up on the north side of yeah, your whole life? Yeah, yeah, yeah. On the me and Camino, we grew up down the street from each other. Man, uh, I don't know, maybe ten houses down over Woodland Trails West. What's up? Shout out to everybody over there, Woodland Trails, Carriage Lane, everybody over there. What's Woodland up? Trails. So, yeah. so what, what, like, what do you, what part of town? What do you consider like as Northwest? Far as, okay. So, um, yeah, like two ninety, in between on you know, Fairbanks over there, in between like two ninety all the way to the Bellway, kind of over, not not too close, not too far from Willowbrook, but kind of a little closer in by the by the racetrack over there. Okay. So shout out okay. to uh, Lucky Luciano. He, you know, grew up right around the corner, right there in Carriage Lane. Me and Camille, and of course, Woodland Trails. Well, this is a, so a few people over there. You know, <clears throat> excuse me, a few other rappers. You know, from that kind of area too. Here in that zone. Shout out to my boy Zone. He's from over there. You know what I'm saying? Uh, it's, it's a, it's a, so is that like? Is it like? Uh, like what type of area? Is it, is, it, is, it, is it super? Like I mean, it, ain't, it can't be like hood. It's like middle class. Like Ooh, what type yes, of? Yeah. It's middle class. So it depends on where you at. Depend on how close to the racetrack you at or how close to the bellway on the other side you are. So there's Tidwell run right through there, West Little York, all the way to Gulf Bank, you know, uh, Gulf Bank stop at Alabama, no, but, uh, you know, brain, all that keep running through. So it just depends on where you at. You know, you like Acres Home adjacent, but at the same time you Jersey Village adjacent. Yeah. You know, the studio right there, or, you know, Tidwell all up and down right there. So it's like all right there in the, in the middle. So you get a a uh, little bit of everything. It was, man. I gotta say, bro. Growing up, man, it was a, uh, it was uh, incredible. You know, a lot of times when you don't see someone or know someone, and the easiest way to uh, you know relate it is like maybe culturally, like um, we're uh, like uh, maybe maybe you ain't know no, maybe it wasn't too many Asian people in your school, or it wasn't yeah. too many this or that. You yeah. know, that's the easiest way just to say it. But it's a lot broader than that. But that's just the easiest way to pick, man. You know. Me and um, where we grew up, me and Kamina, it was we was blessed to be around all different types of cultures. There was a, a, a lot of Asian people. Shout out to my boy Vu, still one of my partners to this day. Uh, you know, of course, Kamina, you know, still one of my boys to this day. I know he ain't, you know, he won't hit, get hit, he won't hop on a, a remix with Toby, but I ain't, you know, I ain't mad at you, man. <laughs> nah, I'm just messing with you. No, that's my, that's my, you know, so a lot of other people too, still friends to this day that, uh, you know, just from the area of all races. 
and I only just named you know one uh, Asian, which is a very a general race, you know. And then, but anyway, we got a it was a, man a, a lot in that area, man. It was white as well, a lot of, and it was all type of white people. It was white trash. It was you know people that was like trying to be lawyers or this or that, but not quite there yet. It was whatever. It was a, yeah. a little bit of everything. A lot of Mexican people in our neighborhood. It was a lot of black people. It was you know some people who were you know. Uh, from other countries of all these it's races. It's a nice mix, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. there was people that, in our neighborhood It was like maybe just moved there from like, you know, Norway or some shit like that or from Africa or from wherever, from any, any name of place, you know. So it was growing up school too, it was very mixed where it wasn't, you know, one or the other. It was, you know, you break it down, it was kind of evenly, you know what I'm saying, where you get a, a good mixture of a lot of races. So you get to meet people of different backgrounds and, you get to see what they like. So growing up with Camille, it was like, you know, uh, both his parents, you know, they, you know, I ain't trying to sit up here and tell his story, but being that we was best friends and, you know, we lived down the street, we stayed at each other's house all the time. I got to experience a lot of his, his parents being from Nigeria, that Nigerian culture that I maybe wouldn't have if my best friend wasn't Nigerian. But since my best friend, you know, uh, his parents were Nigerian, you know, uh, you know, I don't want to, whatever he might, I don't know, you know, people, be, you know how people be, man, I'm with this and yeah. that. They, they uh some people want to claim all of it. Some people don't want to claim any of it. So that's what I say. I, and I don't know what I ain't up here sitting up here telling his story. But I'm just saying that my friend growing up, his parents was Nigerian, so I got to experience a lot of that. That like I say that you know maybe other people won't. So you it opened your eyes to a lot of things. Also now as I grew up, I got to meet a lot of friends who were Muslim. So. Uh, you know, where in Texas, if you don't know anybody who is Muslim, then you might think it's terrorist religion or you might think things that they say on the news or that, you know, but when you meet people and you know people, and they, you know, you can ask them or whatever, even as a kid, you can say, hey, man, my, my preacher say this, is this true? And they can say, nah, man, they tripping, you know, and they can point to things in the Bible, too, where they got some things in the Bible that might have been accepted in times past is not accepted in times of today. So that, and that's what, with every religion when it comes to a lot of traditions that are in the book. But, the, you know, when, you, when it comes to the, the spirit and the, the meaning of the different, you know, whatever, you know, it's, uh, it's definitely a, a, a give you a, bit of, a, a bigger, pro, broader perspective when you have, you know, friends or families that are of these different cultures, you know what I'm saying? And, uh, you know, it definitely, it, it made me feel like uh, proud to be, you know what I'm saying? Proud to be from Texas, proud to know these people, you know, it gave me a, a better understanding, even if it's not a complete understanding, it just, you know, it just, anyway, it was, yeah. uh, it was what's up, you know what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah. It definitely helped add to, you know, uh, me being an artist, uh, me being open or wanting to experience these things. And this is something too, being that my mother, my grandfather was in the military, so, when my mom was growing up, she grew up all around the world. She grew up, she was born in El Paso. She went to high school in New Jersey. She grew up a little bit in San Francisco area in the, in the middle of that. Sometimes in her early, early childhood, she was in Germany during right after the, uh, the, the war and all that was going on. My mom was born in 53. So sometime around there, she was in Germany all that because my grandfather was in the military. Sometimes she grew up, so she would tell me stories about being in Israel, being in Jerusalem, and you know these are places where you'd only see them on Indiana Jones or something. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, so it'd be like, damn, you really went there? What's it really like? You know what I'm saying? And it always made me want to travel the world and experience different cultures. So I always searched out other, you know, cultures. So growing up in a neighborhood where it was full of different cultures, it was a, uh, you know, it definitely helped, you know. Yeah. Shape, shape my mind and, and and it gave me different bars of where I can maybe say this or that and you know you, you might not know what I'm talking about but you know my Asian partner might or if I say something about something else then my Asian partner might not know what I'm talking about but you will you know uh, it just gave me a, just a, a broader understanding of just life I think you know what I'm saying it made me also be grateful to you know grow up like that you know what I'm saying yeah yeah so you were saying you were talking about your mom was it just you and your mom or did you have both parents when you were growing up my, uh, it was me, my mom, and my sister. My biological dad, he left us when I was like maybe five or six years old. He was a, uh, man, he was a drug addict, a child molester. Actually, he left us. It's a crazy story, bro. He left us, but anyway, it was just me, my mom, and my sister. Then she remarried, and I had a, uh, my stepfather, he ended up adopting us. And I had a stepbrother too, but he was already out the house. He was already grown in college and stuff. So, but we, we, we still were, you know, close, but I didn't grow up in the same household with him. It was just, me and my sister. Anyway, my father, though, let me tell you, my biological father, 
Man, uh, uh, the last time I seen him, we used to go see him on the uh, weekends, okay? I had these conversations with my mom. Now, because as a parent, you want to know these things to protect your children or whatever. Also, you know, I might have questions about who I am as a person or where do we come from or where, where did our yeah. family come from or. That's important stuff to Yeah, it's yeah, important. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, and there's all kind of questions that come with it from all kind of purposes and meanings or whatever. But, you know, you just want to know, especially with all the DNA 23 and me, all that, you know, kind of, okay. So, you know, as I've always known that my biological father, you know, was somewhat of a, a child molester and this or that here and, you know, here and there. But it was at a time, it was before the, uh, where you'd have to register as a sex offender. So, hmm. in, and in the same household, you know, I didn't, I hadn't seen him since I was, like I said, five or six. So, you don't even know what a child molester is at that age. So, you don't find out these things till way later down. I'm like, Man, he did all of that. Like, damn, man, he a piece of shit. But anyway, he, he, um, the last time we used to go see him on the weekends, like every other weekend or whatever, just for my parents were divorced. It's just for custodial rights, you know what I'm saying? And at the time, he had a girlfriend. I'm five years old. His girlfriend, she was a 12 year old with a wig on. Damn. Now, I don't know this. I'm thinking this is a grown woman. I don't know, you know. And then, uh, later on, come to find out, I'm like, where daddy? And my mama, like, he in Canada with your with the girl that lived around the corner. That was his girlfriend. He, this, he ended up kidnapping his girl, took her to Canada. The, he say they got he he his side of the story is they ran away to get married. But man, who was a grown man is you know close to forty years old doing with a twelve year old girl, fourteen year old girl. Man, it don't even make no kind of sense right there. Then you know going to Canada to skirt the law. And you know what I'm saying? It just, I, I'm not with all of that. There ain't no way you can explain that to me, especially having a daughter that's 12 years old. Yeah. There's no way anybody in this world could explain to me how it would be cool for a man my age to date my daughter. You know, that just, I, you know, I, I'm not going to fall for that. But my mom also, you know, I, I Did you, was your mom aware of what was going on? No, she, no, but they were already divorced. Yeah. She didn't know. She, so she, she was just dropping y'all off, yeah. unaware that this other person right, was there. Right. Okay, okay. We didn't, she didn't even know. And none of this, you know, the only thing I would know is I'd come over there, I'd right, go to sleep, and it'd be, a, you know, a woman there with a wig on and makeup. And I don't know the girl 14. I'm only five myself. So she so looked older than you. 14 anyway. is yeah. 30, it's 50. Yeah. It's all the same when you five years old, you know. But anyway, Come to find out, they ended up getting caught. Um, he came back. I think he in, did end up going to jail. He owed a whole lot of back child support. This is how we ended up kind of freeing ourselves from him because he couldn't pay the back child support. And uh, But anyway, the girl ended up committing suicide. Man, I, rest in peace to the girl. Uh, wow. But she ended up committing suicide when she came back. Uh, but this is like what I grew up with, you know what I'm saying? Just... Uh, there's other things too, you know. I, you know, this is the type of person he was. So there's other things too. Thank God. I, I look at it though. Sometimes, you know, growing up as a child, you're like, damn, man. When my dad was, at, you know, because how much I love my kids, I would do anything for them. Yeah. So I would sacrifice anything in the world for them if I had. To. If I had to never say a word with the letter T again, you <laughs> yeah. know, man, whatever. If I gotta, if I would do whatever I gotta do to see my kids, protect my kids, provide for my kids. So. Some of it is, man, as a child, you kind of don't understand, like, why would, you know, and maybe some of it is just naivety or just being a child or, or whatever, the pressures of the world. But I don't know, there's only so many passes you could give a person, you know what I'm saying, as a child, where until you just find it like, man, fuck it, fuck them, you know, and that's how it was for me, where it was like, even as a young child, when you find out he a piece of shit, you still kind of like, I still want my dad, but yeah. uh, you know, now as a grown person, I'm like, damn, where is he at now? How can I protect? Who is his neighbors right now, man? Dude, his neighbors got any kids? You know, who is? That's what I'm thinking. My mind is thinking, you know, and, and uh, I'm thinking like, is he around children right now? Is yeah. he, because if he's still living, you know, uh, there's still other kids out there. Yeah, that's still, what, yeah, yeah. Man, man, being a pedophilia is a disease. It don't yeah. go away with yeah. time. You know what I'm saying? So I'm like, I'm like, I'm. These are things I actively think about and talk about with, you know, uh, Miss Parker from Parents Against Predators, or with my mama. Like, man, you, I talk, especially when they caught the Golden State Killer through DNA. I'm like, man, I wonder is, 
you know, is it is there any unsolved crimes, any murders, unsolved rapes out there? That maybe you know what I'm saying? Cause ah oh, man, he a piece of shit. I'll take that DNA test in a minute just to get that familiar DNA. Okay, yeah, there's a you know, but my mom, of course, he, he wouldn't. As far as she know, he wasn't into nothing like that. But he was a serial child molester where he did it, you know, dozens of times. So man, ain't no telling what this man might have did. You know what I'm saying? And, even growing up as a, a adult too, or having children, I think, damn, man, is is that in DNA? I, I don't want that in me, you yeah. know. Like shit, yeah. do do my, do my son got that? Yeah, you know, do my daughter got that? Is she gonna pass it on her kid? You yeah. know. So these are things that science don't necessarily know, and they kind of it's a uh, taboo to talk about. You know, uh, uh, nature versus nurture. You know, is it in your DNA or is it society? Because they don't, you know, if you do something wrong, they don't want to get nobody a reason to blame something else. They want to throw you, you know, throw the, throw you under the bus. You know what I'm saying? No matter what or what the circumstances is. But I don't know. You know, some of it for me, though, is is I look at, I got to experience growing up with a, a father who was a heroin addict who- This was your step- no, my, my biological oh, yeah. father. Oh, Ollie. okay. Yeah, so, yeah. Same man, you know, he yeah. was addicted to heroin, smoked a shitload of weed. Uh, so me, sipping, drank, sipping, smoking weed, I'm like, damn. You got it honest. The apple don't fall too far from the tree, you know, <laughs> yeah. even though it ain't necessarily the same, it's similar, yeah. you know? So it, it made me think, make me want a little bit, but I think to, uh, you know, him being a, a hair, I'll I, I be joking with Zero, because. My biological father, he, he lived in the most city area <laughs> and he did heroin and he smoked weed. So I'm, I always be joking with, with Zero, like, yeah, man, that's how I made it. That's how I got my first, you know what I'm saying, breaking rap because Zero looked out for me. I was just a young kid and my, my dad used to buy drugs from him and he felt sorry for me. So he took me on his wing and showed me, hey, I'm going to show you how to freestyle. I'm going to show you the way of the trill. <laughs> so shout out to Zero. But, uh, oh, yeah. uh, that's how it happened in my mind, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> nah, nah, but, uh, yeah. but it's, you know, this is something though that I, you know, I think about. You know, I think about, damn, should I, I should I go to my go to his church and put flies out everywhere? Hey, man, this man a pedophile, you know. This, oh, who got this, a church this. now? I don't know. I'm oh, just, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm just, just saying, saying just like, in general, I, just wherever he I, I is. Just, yeah. yeah, wherever he is, yeah. I think of, uh, is this something I could be doing that I'm not doing and someone could be getting molested from even from right down today Yeah, to, you know, like, damn, it just made me think. But at the same time, I think I don't want to have no relationship with this man. I'm not like, because he, I, it's funny, somebody DM me on Instagram, hey, I grew up next to your biological father, you're a good man, you know, please forgive him, this and that. I'm like, what? That fool a child molester. Wow. Like, do you know this fool really? Then real life molested, wow. raped children yeah. as a grown man, kidnapped? Like, you, what are you talking about? Like, man, so, you know, it, it ain't, I don't know if he thinking he gonna try to, you know, manipulate me or something, or, but it, it ain't nothing where I'm like, trying to see him and, uh, you know, he, he probably fuck around and watch this, you know what I'm saying? But I'm not, because he know I'm Paul Wall, yeah. you know what I'm saying? But at the same time, I don't think he trying to come at me because he know I'm a, man, catch me in Target, I'm going to embarrass the shit out of you. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Catch me anywhere in life. Catch me in church and I'm going to say, hey, I'm going to tell the whole world, no, hey, man, this man is a pedophile. Keep your kids away from this fool. So, you know, I don't know, you know, it's just, Things that I don't, I ain't trying to poke the bear with some of this shit of, you know, uh, whoever, but it's just still things that I deal with growing up as a, as I've dealt with my whole life being in like, damn, man, and I've always had a, and also at the same time being that my mother was raped, she was molested, she, my mom was molested, and I, I mean, I ain't trying to put a business out there as well, but she, you know, she ain't tripping, she ain't on the gram like that, <laughs> she ain't gonna see it, but, you know, um, I man, I, I, like I said, I ain't trying to put my mom up in it, but some of it I will just to show you, you know, how it, you know how it affected me as a child. My mom was, she was raped by both of her grandparents, by both of her grandfathers, I should say. For, by, she was raped by both of her grandfathers on each side of the family. And she was, uh, man, she, my mama got some hell of a story she done told me to make me feel like, okay, this shit's real out it's here. Just, watch your kids, a, yeah, you know concern, what I'm saying? Yeah, like, yeah, man, yeah. Watch who your kids is around. And a lot of times it's, you know, it could be your own, it could be your own father that's the one molesting your children. It could be your your aunt, the, your sister that's doing it, and it is a disease. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So you know, a lot of times we look at it as oh, it's something somebody just 
being uncontrollable or they just whatever, which might be true. But at the same time, if we looked at it like as if somebody was uh, psychotic, would you let your kids around them now? Nah. And at the same time, you'd feel bad for them. Damn, man, you got this mental stuff going on. But you got to protect your kids. But I got to protect my kids. Yeah. And I got friends like that who I might love them, but hey, man, I got to protect myself from you. Cause you psychotic, cause you psychotic. You yeah. know, one at any time you might snap and come off on me, and I love you, but I can't put myself in that position because I got kids. Whereas if I didn't have kids, I might not have to. The same way, it's the same way we got to look at our kids around, man. Any any grown person or teenager, really. You know, it's like it, at what age do you not? You know, it's because that man, that pedophilia is for real. It's real life out yeah. there. Yeah, yeah. So damn. So are you are you are you uh listening to rap and shit around this time? Like when you growing up? Uh yeah, yep. I remember um <laughs> uh man, I my mom was very spiritual, okay. Uh also my mom, man, she before my sister my sister was two years older than me. Before my mom was born, she I mean before my sister was born, my mom had an abortion before that, okay. So by the time I'm born, this would have been her third child. You know, I'm, I'm a second child. I would have been her third child, okay? At this point, it was hell growing up. Any bug in the house, period, my mama would try to catch it and release it in the wild. And I would, I'm like, man, it's a roach. What you doing? Yeah. It's a mouse. What did you, man? We got ants, and so the had that long-term effect on yeah, her. Yeah, yeah. Just because she didn't want to take a life of any creature ever after she had an abortion. And she was just very sensitive to life and just... You know, and then she passed it on to me, and it was something I kind of fought, or I might have been like, man, hey, mama, look, and I'm stepping on all the <laughs> spiders. Look, mama, ah, look at her, ah, ah. No, don't do it, no, don't do it. And I'm like, look, mama, ah, still, you know. But, uh, just teasing her, but at the same time, because, you know, I'm like, mama, it's the bug, but she like, you don't know, it could have a soul and this and that, you know. So it did, those type of things did uh, 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 affect me, you know, being that my mama was, you know, with that with life. Now, what that got to do with music, she was always listening to music, around the house like soulful music music that was uplifting to the spirit hmm. not a mu not music that was uh a trend at the time or pop music at the time growing up she was listening to, you know to music like uh roberta flack or anything from motown you know of course marvin gay a lot good of shit. Good yeah. Shit. Yeah. yeah a lot yeah. of sade so even to this day if I if I go in my feelings and get my feelings hurt, I'm gonna go put on Charday. To this day, I'm gonna put it on, and it's gonna help me get back. It's a you know, I actually I did a uh, screw and chop. Me and Goo you, we did one time. We used to love Charday, so we did a whole screw and chop CD. And to this day, that's the man a go to anytime I feel bad, uh, cause it just is a story of feelings, and it's usually ah, then you know, I might be crying to myself, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, and I'm like, man, you can't fuck with me, come on, you know, it, just is, it helped me get my mind right yeah. of just to be prepared for to whatever I'm going through, but, you know, and uh, with that, of course, some of that was hip-hop, you know, as time went on, to me, growing up with other friends who had the same likes in music, it was, it, although we might have differed, you know, like we all like Wu-Tang, but we all had our personal favorites. You know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah. I like, Genius was my personal favorite Jizzle. growing up, Jizza, yeah. yeah. And uh, of course, Method Man, you know what I'm saying? And uh, But uh, but Genius, the Jizza was was my, my favorite. I think Kamean, I like Rizza a little bit better, you know what I'm saying? And you can kind of see that as he get a little older. You know, he do kind of remind you more of uh, Rizza, like, man, how he carry himself, just yeah. right, how he just- Just the mystery, his business. You know yeah, 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 all of that, you know what I'm saying? But. You know, so we all, you know, we, we grew up loving hip hop together where we turn on the radio and it was West Coast, like, you know, Ice Cube, a lot of, you know, anything that was West Coast, mm -hmm. Snoop, all of that, uh, you know, anything Dr. Dre, Sugar Free, E-40, all that, you know, MC8, real good gangster shit, you know, some, and, and sometimes you'd hear Houston shit like, you know, whether it would be Ghetto Boys or anything from Rap A Lot, uh, you would hear, that's one thing, man. Looking back, I was thinking about this the other day, man. Looking, we've been blessed, bro. I mean, I know we all got our criticism for the radio station. Uh, you know, we all wish we could get played more as artists, so we all want to hear our favorite artists more. If it was up to me, it would be nothing but Fat Pat and Lil Kiki all day. Nobody else. So sorry to all artists out there. I wouldn't listen to none of y'all if it was up to me. I listen to Lil Kiki and Fat Pat, and if it was up to y'all, you'd probably listen to you uh, or whoever you want, you know. But hey. They got a job to do. I was thinking about this man, bro. 
Madison and I have been supporting Houston rap since the beginning of Houston yeah. rap. Bro. I remember hearing uh, Mind Playing Tricks. I remember hearing Mr. Scarface on the radio. I remember hearing uh, Let Me Roll on the radio. I remember like all the rap a lot shit. All the, I remember hearing Tell Me Something Good on the radio. I remember hearing Street Military on the radio. It might not be every hour. Yeah. You know, it might not be the same like as you hear other stuff, but we'd hear it, you know. And it, well, there was sometimes it was just straight from the streets on Sunday or yeah. late night in the mix. But there was a time where me as a fan of Houston rap, I knew if I want to hear the newest, hottest Houston rap and, and before the Internet, where you going to get it? You going to get on a mixtape or on the radio at night or on the radio on Sunday night? And on Sunday night, straight from the streets, they play Houston rap. Houston rap would be designated Houston rap. But even just on here, you know, whether it was Southside getting played, Pimp the Pen, all yeah. the D, we did, you know, DJ Screw became a household name throughout the airways of Houston, like getting played all the time, you know. And it was just that, that really did help build the culture because it just added and it kind of gave it. Uh, you know, it solidified it. You know, when you get that radio play, that's like, okay, it's real. And then, you know, then from all the Rec Shop records, all the Swisher House records, all the Dope House records, man. South Park Michigan used to say, fuck 97.9. And he said it at the car show. Hey, everybody say, fuck 97.9. Fuck 97.9. They still play this music the next day. Like, you know, so, man, it's crazy that, man, it, to, to, to see the support that we got from a radio station, you know, throughout all this time man it's crazy so we always heard some type of houston music on the radio It'd be a little bit here and there and it might be the mainstream of the houston sometimes not always not always but sometimes but we would hear it you know what i'm saying but then if we turn on the tv we see young tv raps so or bt is all new york yeah or new york area you know yeah. what i'm saying or man all and that's it <laughs> nothing else so we know we used to oh man Man, when we saw Scarface on Teen Summit or one of them shows, it was, I mean, that was like, oh, hey, hey, come here, Scarface on, Scarface yeah. on there. We was like, what? It was like the president just walked in the door or something because you never saw that, you know, any type of Houston rep representation on TV, on, on the, on the, especially on the mainstream TV. But then when Street Flavor came along, they kind of gave it that push. Well, we had an outlet to where if you could put the money together to do a video, it will play it, yeah. you know. So, and at least, even if we didn't have videos being played, they'd interview us and show us love, you know, stuff like that. So, man, we, we had our outlets here and there, but the screw tape was where we would hear it all. And it, we for sure would hear Houston culture, Houston slang, Houston talk, Houston streets and neighborhoods, Houston, you know, restaurants, we, you know, you'd hear Houston things that you could relate to. If I, as much as I love, you know, uh, 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 Keith Murray, uh, you know, I would never hear a Keith Murray song and hear him talk about South Park or Acres Homes or anything like, you know, like that because he's not from there, you know. Right, well, right. Same with Wu Tang. They talking about Shaolin. They talking about where they from, you know. They talking about their neighborhood, they hood. So when we listen to the screw tape, we talking about places where. I could get in my car right now, go to that place and play the music outside the place right now. You know, it was real, you know, and and on top of that, it was just I don't know what it was, but my whole life I always just was taught just that Texas pride. So always my favorite everything came from Texas, even subconsciously, just so especially in hip hop. My favorite rappers, producers, DJs, everything was all from Houston. So growing up in that, I I kind of leaned on that. I think, you know. It really, really heavily influenced me, you know, um, just the, and I was proud to say this is what influenced me. I think that's a huge part of it, too. Well, I was always proud to say interview Donnie Houston. <laughs> I was always proud to say, man, this is who inspired me because, man, they inspired me so much. How could I not want to give them props or show love or something like that? That's one thing I never understood when people don't give props. It's like, what you hiding from? Ain't you proud to inspire you? Why would you be embarrassed or not want to give somebody credit? The only thing you think of is they want the credit. They don't want to give it to nobody. They don't want to share it. They want the personal credit, you know, whatever. But, uh, yeah, man, you know, um, Definitely, man. Shit, we kind of listened to everything except for maybe country. We didn't really just listen to country at all. Yeah. And uh, I don't know what that was that made us, you know, in my house, you know, 
not listening to my mama, she didn't listen to country. She didn't she didn't listen to hip hop. She listened to soul music. That's it. Yeah. Uh, or any type of gospel. Any type of gospel or music about God, that's what she was listening to. Uh, but um, me in terms of me and my friends, we kind of listened to a little like, a little bit of mixture of everything except nothing pop. Um, even whatever the, the the hot rap music was, I hated. I couldn't stand anything that was number one. It yeah. was rap. I always like leaned toward the underground, and sometimes it was like a just a by default. Yeah. You know, I, I, man. I remember when um, uh, like Vanilla Ice came out. Oh, I couldn't stand him, and it wasn't because he was white. It's because he was mainstream rap number one. He could have been anything and I would have not liked him because I didn't like and still don't like anything that's mainstream. Even my hits, those are the ones I hate of my song, my catalog. Yeah. Like the hits, the mainstream yeah. hits, those are the, my least favorite songs I made out of all my catalog. So it's just, you know, I'm even, I'm that's just me. Sorry, you know, uh, it's just how I always was. But I remember, you know, like I said, I remember when Vanilla Ice came out and other people like, they like, man, you don't like them, I thought you was going to, you like them with this, and nah, man, I don't, I don't like nothing that's on the, you know, on the radio. Only thing I would like on the radio was the Houston music, yeah. and it's crazy that I would listen to it for hours upon hours upon hours upon hours just to hear a Houston song, and that'd be like a, a drug fix to me, you know what I'm saying? Like, it really, truly would. Like, I remember listening to some of the, like, some of the DJs that still, I remember listening to GT, he used to... He, he, GT always, even to this day, he always is like one of the ones where he's, you gonna hear him play some Houston music or he gonna show love to somebody that, you know, might not normally get it, you know, uh, and it's, man, GT always would do that back in the day. Walter D used to always do that too. You hear him mix, and you'd hear a mixture of Houston slash bounce Louisiana. Louisiana bounce music, you know, where you always hear a lot of that because that was kind of the bounce music kind of got replaced by ATL twerk music, you know what I'm saying? Where it wasn't as much, but you know, when Webby and Boosie started kicking it up, even though they wasn't talking about bounce that ass and they had the bounce sound, so that's the same thing, you know, you can we can all as artists think about even when we in Houston we talk about, you know, the Houston culture. The, a Houston song isn't just a song talking about swingers and drink and screw music. It's a vibe. It's a, it's its own vibe. So same with the bounce music. It ain't just shake that ass, bounce that asshole. It's not. Nah, it's its own vibe. So you know when you see the that's man Mouse man. I was thinking, I was thinking about this earlier, bro. Mouse, all his beats, boy. He got them. Every one of his songs, boy, he got that. Yeah, man, where well it's gonna it's gonna make your body even if you stiff and too cool, it's gonna make you bob your head and yeah. I don't know, man. Rest in peace, little fat man. When Mouse and Lil Fat, even and they the ones came up with Busy Body, even the hook, they they, they, they hey, hey, we got an idea, we got an idea. All right, bet, let's do it. We in the studio, you know, whatever. I wrote my verse, but the hook, Mouse, like, hey, I got an idea. What you think about this? And you know, we going back and forth. I'm adding my two cents too but i gotta get him credit and look him and the mouse and the fat boy they hmm. man rest in peace little fat boy they used to well they was one hell of a tag team uh hip-hop tag team of uh you know like producer and artist because little fat too was little fat wasn't really like he was an artist but he was more like a songwriter yeah like i would consider a songwriter where he might be on the song but he maybe wrote the hook or he came up with the concept or his added little bridge at the end is what just make it because you just remember it and it's the part you can't wait to get to and if the dj cut it before that you're like ah why you cut it i wanted to do my part you know it's just so i oh, man i gotta get i gotta give props to uh to uh, mouse to you know shout mouse rest in peace little fat but you know that 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 houston you know the the dirty south as a whole especially as an artist you know we, we always took a lot of pride in anybody that came from anywhere in the dirty south we supported or we gave them a chance, but the ones we related to the most, at least for me, the people I related to the most were the artists that were from Texas or Louisiana, because that's where my yeah. family came from, or you know, my godmother and her family, they all came from Opelousa, so you know, that was a big influence on me as well, and then that's where I, you know, I, I shout out to, you know, rest in peace to my boy Omar, shout out to my boy Devon, you know, the whole squad, Derek, everybody from, you know, Papa Joe, Box, everybody, you know, we. Louisiana's man, we, we we got a lot of love for Louisiana, man. Yeah. So so, 
were you was that uh, when you start getting into writing? Like when they, when you was it the Houston stuff that more so influenced you to start kind of getting into writing and freestyling or whatever? Like I remember, man, you know, back in them days, it's it's funny. Like when when I watch or hear other people from other areas talk about their hip hop experiences of ciphers of freestyle stuff like that. You know the, the things they did, and they, I think, oh damn, we used to do the same thing. We did it different though, you know. So it's it, it, and even I remember when my boy PKT, he was uh, he graduated in '97. Me and Camina graduated in '98. So when he graduated in '97, he went to Morehouse. What he was telling us about it, we was like, man, we went down there like spring break or summer, some some we went down there for. We me and Camina took the bus down there. We 17, hmm. and uh, I was 17. I think Camina was 18. Um, but then we. Uh, we take the bus down there, and we right there in the AU, and they freestyle in the cipher, but it's it's a cipher, but it's different than like a H Town cipher. And anywhere in H Town at that time, every cipher was pretty similar. You know what I'm saying? It was like we might be saying different different things, but we had our way as a city or, or state, you know, of doing it, where other places have their way of doing it. So I think for so me coming from here, it made me think. Well, yeah, I'm from there. Yeah, it's good. You know, because I don't want to think I'm from there. It sucks. Mm -hmm. You know, I always, I was always taught that. You know, just, you know, love where you at. Love what God has gave you. Love, you know, your neighbor. Love, you know, everything. Treat every, you know, I want for you what I want for me. Uh, you know, uh, all of, this is how I was always taught. So love is what I was always taught to give. So to be happy or proud to be from somewhere, where I remember at the time, you know, even, you know, like there would be people that would be like, it, it's, it's so funny because. I adored, adored Houston rap, but other people that might have went to my school hated it. They thought it was local. Oh, uh, yeah, I'll never make it nowhere, you know, and it was not just it was DJs that felt like that. It was, you know, all, all people of all walks of the industry, especially when it came to major record labels, they all thought that's a local thing. That's not going to ever make it na worldwide, much less nationwide, you know. Uh, so the whole culture as a whole got rolled off as secondary, sophomoric, you know, like stepchild, you know, like everybody from there, and they all right, but yeah, whatever. And I always felt like that too as, I always felt like, man, if Scarface would have been from New York, then everybody in the world would be considering him top five rappers or yeah. MCs of all time. But since he's from Houston, it's almost like a knock where he never got the world because people couldn't relate to it they they when scarface was coming out they thought h-town was just all horses and cows well it's horses and cows now yeah i'm in niggas home my uncle they this they they this it's, yeah it's horses and cows in texas but don't get it twisted I, man it's horses all over california i mean new york they got horses there too not just it's not just like a country thing for horses and cows and we ain't riding no horses and cows to go to work and nothing like that you know, but that's what people thought at the time. When Scarface coming out, they thinking we riding horses to go to work. Yeah. If you ride a horse, it's for a trail ride, like once a year or, you know, four, three, four times a year, unless that's what you do is all you do is trail ride. You know, like, you know, the, the, the cowboy lifestyle is still going on. Some people do it, but as a Texas as a whole, we going to work in Cadillacs, Range Rovers, Benzes, everything, everybody else, Nissans, you right. know, broke down, beat up Fords, any, right. anything that's out there, we driving all of that. So, but, uh, you know, I think, and at the same time, you know, I, I don't know, it's just, I think that's a big part of it is that, uh, I don't know, I always felt like, man, Scarface and a lot of our MCs here, including myself, really, if we maybe would have came from a different area, it might have, the same thing might not have been, you know, we might not have had our same ascension to, uh, to, uh, to, to rise to power, you know, but uh, being from somewhere else, maybe being from here is what, you know, allowed us to, to come up or to find our way because that's what made us unique or different. But uh, I don't know, I just feel like Scarface to me is, man, always been, Scarface and Bun B, man, that, them two in particular, they both always have been like two of the greatest, you know what I'm saying? And I, I remember going, and that's the thing, you know, when, especially when Pimp C went to jail, Growing up, you know, through my, you know, uh, uh, I, don't, I don't know what year ex exactly he went to jail, but that's right like when I'm 2000, 2001. So that's right when I'm coming out of high school. I, we came right. out of nine eight, so I'm at U of H around this time, and he in jail. So that, that's the whole free PMC movement that Bum B took. Man, that you know it was a uh, that was a time when you would hear Bum B on everybody feature. Anybody come out 
especially if they from the south but even on the east coast like you might hear somebody from the east coast that was who they got well, they would go get Bumby and Scarface. If they got somebody featuring from Houston, it was Bumby or it was Scarface. And uh, you know, and to me, I always loved that. And that was, you know, that was why I would buy any of those records or, or albums or CDs or whatever you want, whatever they was. It was CDs or tapes. But the, uh, the only reason why I would buy them is because it said featuring Bumby or featuring Scarface. Now that's how I, that's how I got turned on to the Hot Boys and Cash Money because they would have featuring. UGK, right, right, and, right. you know, or a lot of, you know, a lot of. That's why I say in Louisiana, always we kind of always piggybacked off each other. Well, you know, the we love them, they love us, or whatever, and because we a lot of our families come from there, and vice versa, and it just culturally is how it is. So it's uh, man, it's it, it's been a, a a lot of collaborating going on for a long time, even if it's just in the influence. You know what I'm saying? Uh, but man, that that's what Bum B we used to kill it too every time and. I remember, man, Bum B used to so always, like, him him killing it, like, he would stand out. Like, his verses would just stand out, and it just would always make me be like, man, that's how I want to be. If somebody put me on a song, I wanted to be, man, who is that? Well, he killed that, whether they knew me or not. Like, I want to shine. And I remember, you know, I remember, uh, you know, rapping, you know, with other artists and being in the studio and someone saying, writing a verse. I ain't going to say who, but they writing a verse, and they saying, I I'm gonna say that for me. I'm gonna say that for me. I cause it's too hard. I ain't gonna get that to them. I'm gonna get them some I'm gonna get them something else. I ain't gonna give them that. That's that's too hard. I'm gonna say that for my album. And I remember thinking like, shit, not me, I'm gonna go hard on everything. And if it ain't hard, I ain't gonna say it. And if I could come harder, I'm gonna go back and do a new one. Hmm. Just thinking like, okay, I, I wanna yeah, some you know, but we all look at this different. Some people don't look at the rap game like with the respect or admiration for the art of it. Like to me that that's the when I think of hip hop, I think of it being an art form not just entertainment which it does entertain me you know i've always been entertained from hip-hop but not just a monetary where i can make money from it i'm looking at it like it's it's the art you know it's a you know when you look at a picture and it make you cry because the picture just is so emotion wrapped up in the picture the same thing with a song when you hear a song and it just make you cry because you hear that song whether you feeling the pain or, or something some the artist is singing or they telling the story that you can relate to or if the song song itself bring back a nostalgic experience that touch you in your life or whatever you know that you know for me that's what hip-hop has done for me you know so i remember man growing up man uh, I, I was i was i've been waiting to tell you this when you asked me did i listen to hip-hop growing up i remember man i used to love hip-hop bro just like i say all houston raps specifically but it wasn't a lot of hip hop being released on a weekly basis. So anything that was hip hop would come out, I'd buy it blindly. I just would blind buy. Go to Sam Goody, Soundwaves, uh wherever, any store that was out there, you know, that was selling music, I would go there and just what's new? Give me all the hip hop. You know, where they from? Sometimes this is before they let you listen to it before you buy it. You know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah. I probably wouldn't have bought half that shit if that, that's the case, because man, I, it was a lot of shit I would buy and be like heavily disappointed. Like, what the how is this even on sale? Uh, but you know what I'm saying? But I think some of that too might be culturally that some of the music being released was from places where I didn't know what they was talking about. So they might as well be speaking another language, you know. Um, but at the same time, I got introduced to a lot of artists like Common. I'm, you know, I used to listen to a lot of Common back in the day, and I remember people teasing me, like fucking with me, like, man, he ain't from Houston. Why you listen to that? Uh, you yeah. know, who was that, man? Uh, whatever, just because it was, you know, they only knew I used to love it. That's when I used to love it came out. But yeah, all kind of shit. It just was different to me, and I just appreciated that everybody don't have to sound the same, you know. And he was unique from everything that was mainstream at the time. So that's what led me to him. Is it? I want to listen to something that's different, you know, not necessarily all the same flavor. I want to listen to the different. So me going in there and buying blindly every Tuesday or whatever day music come out or whatever day I got money or whatever, man, that was, I'm buying whatever. But I remember, though, at one point, man, you know, my mom being spiritual, she also, you know, that's something she heavily instilled into me. Uh, you know, God, you know, I grew up Christian, um, but just being just being spiritual and being one and close with God not necessarily just Christianity and the religion itself but my mom was a, you know my whole life she was pushing it on I remember one time man just me having a feeling like 
Man, I love hip hop, man. And I remember I might have, I, I was rapping come, with, with Camille, you know, we was in high school though, so it wasn't no switch house, nothing like that. Yeah. But, you know, like, damn, this is maybe one day my dream, you know, not thinking I could ever be a rapper or nothing like that, because there's, there's no way in my mind that ever, that thought still ain't even in, in, in my mind that I could be a rapper, you know what I'm saying? I don't know why, but. Shit, to think that, man, my dream could come true and I could be an artist, man, that shit don't now, I always tell people, like, one thing you told me, I remember one of the first times you met, you was telling me how rap is your dream job and just how the way you treat it like that. Like, it's no reason to ever have a bad day because you wake up in the morning yeah. and you do what you want to do. And I always remember that, like, well, get mad at shit. Like, now you wake up in the morning, you make beats, you yeah. do, you DJ, you're yeah. doing what you want. Like, there's no reason to really have a bad day, yeah. you know what I mean? And I, I, I know I'll tell, like, an hour-long story, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But, man, I, I remember going to church one time and uh, whatever the preacher told me, whatever he said, he didn't say it to me, but it, the way he spoke to me was uh, kind of along the lines of you can love something. If you love it more than God, if you love anything on this earth more than God, that's a sin. Hmm. And I started thinking, damn, I love the fuck out of hip hop. Man, damn, do I love hip hop more than God? Like, hmm. damn, because it would always be on my mind, an artist or a song or a line or something someone else said or something they did in the video or not this before i was even writing music really i might have just started just for fun just because and the only reason why i would do it is because we do it at the lunch table or on the school bus it's so, like middle school yeah yeah. Okay, yeah yeah so everybody did it it wasn't yeah. just or anybody who you got called out and if you didn't do it you're gonna get talked about so you better try to say something even if you was whack you better try so were you, were you the only one that was that was like the white kid that was rapping at the time too i might have been um i man i might have been i think i probably was yeah i think I, yeah I definitely was, come to think of it. <laughs> yeah, I definitely was. <laughs> definitely was, yep. <laughs> yeah, definitely was. Yeah. But uh, but I remember going home after the preacher saying, if you love anything more than God, it's a sin. And, God, and, and he said something like, God will take it from you if you don't submit to God and give it to God. So, and it was something, you know, uh, maybe it was the Abraham story in the Bible. I don't know exactly, but... I just went home, got all my rap CDs and tapes, everything I had, period, and it was maybe hundreds of them, you know what I'm saying? And I put all of them in the trash can and said, no shit, man, if I gotta let it go, I gotta let it go. And walked away and then, you know, thinking that that was it, you know, and thinking that, you know, I was gonna, gonna go away. Yeah, yeah you're yeah. thinking like, damn, man. And, and I remember being torn because I loved it so much. And, and I remember Kameen even being, he might not remember it, but him making fun of me. Man, why you ain't give that to me? You could have gave it to me. <laughs> and I was just like, nah, that ain't, that, that's not how I work. I got to let it go. I got to let it go, uh, you know, because it's a sin. And I, I remember thinking it, not thinking I'm going to let it go and it's going to come back to me. Thinking, damn, I, I love you, hip-hop, bye. Forever, goodbye. Just because I love you more than I love God, you know, and then. You know, for whatever reason, here and there, I kind of got more. Uh, you know, uh, I, you know that wasn't. A, I don't remember from that point. The next time I bought something, it was hip hop. I did, you know, but it wasn't because for me, it wasn't about buying rap. It wasn't about listening to rap. It was that I loved it so much. I cherished it so much. So it wasn't that. Uh, you know, it, I don't know. I'm burning it and. I'm never gonna listen to hip hop again. Although I did feel like, you know, goodbye, because I felt like maybe I won't have those feelings again. But as soon as I hear a song that wired me up, it's like I gotta get it. I gotta get it. And then I remember even later on in life, man, when I was in college, shortly after, when I'm DJing, I'm, I was rapping a little bit, but I wasn't known. I wasn't shit. Even in the Switcher House, I was at the bottom of the barrel. I was the last man on the team fighting for a spot that barely made the combine they didn't even do a combine on me that's how bad i was coming in the switch house so the rapping really wasn't i would good to say because y'all came in what doing promotion right y'all didn't come in as rappers i came in doing promotion and then from doing promotion i started djing because i as a promoter that's you know the djs only played music that was on vinyl the record you couldn't play a cd you couldn't push a button and play a song. The only way you ever heard a music at a party, on the radio, at the club, anywhere, was a DJ had put a record on, put the turntable and needle, put the needle on the record, and put, yeah. yeah, and push play. And Wait, that was but, it. But didn't were you working with somebody before uh, Switcher House doing promotion? Yeah, that's how I got to the Switcher House was doing street promotions with Ace, my boy Ace from right around the corner where we at. We in an undisclosed location right now. I ain't gonna say, but he he right. On the corner right there. That's where we used to go to his house, meet over there before we'd go out, pick our boxes up, get our flyers over to go out to the club. And I was young, know, like 14, 15. Just, I just wanted to be a part of something. And I remember going out. and Was it a comedian that doing it with you or was it you? 
Sometimes, sometimes usually he not, not always because so you know he I don't know I had a, like a, a passion for yeah, all he just of wanted it. to do I something just, right yeah. and he was man are we can pay for that he was more realistic about it like so he always been on that always yeah, yeah. he was like all right I'll do it we get in free to the club all right I'll do it yeah, if I ain't getting free no all right who is that are we gonna we we still gotta buy the album when it come out man I'm a promo I gotta go buy the album okay you're not wrong for thinking that and saying that but at the same time. I was doing it for a different purpose. My purpose of doing it was, was to be a part of anything because I just loved hip hop. I love that. And, you know, so I wanted to. So, working for Ace, I'd see Ace or my boy 5 4. My boy 5 4, what's up? I'd see both of them at the clubs. Like any club we go to, wherever, anywhere we'd be out. And I was 14, 15. We way too young to get in the club. Hmm. We just go in the parking lot. We catch a ride with somebody from my, you know, who's a little older or whatever. We, just watch and just whatever shit until we was old enough to go in sometimes we might pay the and i i looked a little older when i was young i had a mustache and stuff you know what i'm saying uh so every, we get a, the doorman extra ten dollars we get in there you know what i'm saying i remember being there on chaka town you know sunday nights early they had the strippers in there early and we being young as fuck <laughs> thinking damn man strippers you know and now you think man you know hey it's uh it's not the same type of quality you know i'm not to degrade anybody but you know i'm not trying to degrade no women not them but man well, i remember the, the, the strippers we saw at chaka town on sunday nights when i was 14 15 are not the same caliber of professional strippers they have out there today yeah. well, let me just say that <laughs> but i remember at the time being like me and come in like we thought we was kings in chaka town on sunday you know we 15 years old you yeah. know yeah. you know so it, it was you know this is how it would be that's what, you know we'd see people from our school or other people we knew like slim thug or just other people from the switcher house and i'd be out there passing out flyers for whoever was on def jam or whoever was on no limit okay and Cash money was like I love the hot boys, but uh, I I didn't do that account. So it wasn't until later on I got down with that. You know, shout out to my boy Lump. He was the one doing Lump, all shout that. Shout out Lump, yeah. Yeah, but I used to beg Lump, man. Please, Lump, man. I, I work for free, man. Please, I love the hot boys. Please, man. So he, he'd be like, all right, man. All right, I'm all right, all right, all right. Because you know I was I used to be that annoying little kid that you know. So I, that's why I ain't tripping now when somebody come around and you know he like fuck you get on my nerves i just be thinking hey that was me yeah. <laughs> that was yeah. me to everybody out there <laughs> so anybody that showed me love thank you man lump definitely showed me love but working for lump working for ace you know ace handled def jam five four he handled uh no limit uh and with mean green mean green kind of oversaw it and he worked for mean green uh, and so i i would do that and lump did cash money so that was that was hip-hop yeah that was all the hip-hop yeah. you know in the there was anything coming out of Def Jam, anything coming out of No Limit, uh, you know, or, or and then Cash Money. That was the the late nineties of hip hop, and then you know before that it was uh, just whatever, just trying to trying to find my way. Especially anything H Town though. If I saw any artist while I'm passing out flyers, I meet somebody, I say, hey man, let me, you got something I can pass out? Let me pass them out. So some of this right now, like like me and Goo be somewhere, and somebody come up to us asking to pass out flyers. Sometimes people with me be like. Man, who gonna just go work for free? But you know, I, I relate because that was me. I would have, I love this. So you from Houston and you rapping? Even if I ain't heard your music, I'm gonna, hey, I'm gonna support it because somebody from here gotta make it. We gonna make it. We gonna support each other. So that's just, I would just, whatever. That's how I kind of got toward the switch house. But then the church I went to, my church, Living Word. Shout out to Living Word. Um, my uh, a friend of mine, uh, her brother was Ron C. And Ron C's mama, she was um, her exact title, maybe choir director, I think. Um, Ron C's stepdad was the elder at the church. He was one of the elders at the church. So little by little, you know, I, I was real close with them because they were at my church, okay? Now, Ron C had a cousin named Was Ron Brandon. C going to the church too or this just his family? Every now and then. But he was like, you know, like... Beyonce go to St. John or whatever, you know, she might go there once a year, but to everybody, she there every Sunday, you know, yeah. it's like the same with that. Ron C was a celebrity to me back then, even he was just, a, you know, I don't know what he did back in those days. He just might have just did street promotions for the boxing, was a DJ, but to me, he was, yeah, him, what anybody from Houston who was doing anything like that was, I, man, worshiped him, you know, that's why I had to let it go. Like, damn, I gotta let this go. But, uh, but I, anyway, so, that's how I got down with Michael Watts and Switzer House was my boy B. Sykes, Brandy Sykes. We both worked at James Coney Island. And he gave me the nickname Paul Wall. 
and he used to because I'd always be just freestyling, trying yeah. to rap, trying to whatever, and he just. I don't know if he he knew somebody named Paul Wall or he hey you you know I don't know why he get I hated it and I'd be like man stop calling me that and everywhere we go he said hey this is my boy Paul Wall and I'd be like man I ain't, I ain't Paul Wall I, my name I went by that time was Overflow that was my rap name so I'm yeah. like no nah, I'm Overflow I'm the, I'm the Cape Crusader whatever my rap name was <laughs> yeah. man no 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 and then, man we go to the All Star and Ron C Michael Watts would be there and Ron C would be like hey hey shout out to my shout out to my kinfolk V Sykes hey what's your boy name. Paul Wall. Shout out to Paul Wall. And I'd be like, man, why you say that, man? <laughs> nobody know me. Not everybody go to my school, anybody didn't know me. They don't know me as Paul Wall. Yeah. And that wasn't my last name. So they'd be like, I, you, I, I'd go tell you heard him give me a shout out. You heard him give me he didn't say you he said Paul Wall. Wall ain't your last name. Yeah. And I'd be like, oh man, quit calling me Paul Wall. But it it stuck. And it just so happened when I played football, man, it's funny because when I played football in high school, you know, for the Two years I did play, or one year, whatever I did play, yeah. the coach used to say, Paul, Paul, the wrecking ball, tough as a wall. Like, you need to whatever. Get, get back on live, Joseph. Probably I'm listening to you. You need to get back on. Get back on. Um, going on with the though. I got you. Pass it to me. I got you. Go ahead, Paul. I'm listening to you. Okay. Keep going. Yeah, go ahead. But yeah, we, but that's how I, I don't know. That's how I, me and B Sykes. Me and B Sykes, we was real close. We was boys, so we go to all the All Star game, you know, the All Star events, you know, at the, you know, the parties and shit, or anywhere there was parties, we'd always roll to, and he'd always introduce me to everybody as Paul Wall. So then, little by little, you know, I, Ron C, he was like, "Oh yeah, you go to my mama church, yeah, whatever." And she knew me because she knew me, and I would be at the church every day, all the time, you know, whatever. I was heavily involved in the church, so I knew her personally. And so she would tell him, him and his grandma, they would, you know, her, her and her mother, you know, they would tell Ron C, which is his mom and his grandma, they tell him, hey man, you need to watch out for Paul, man, you know, make sure you don't get swallowed up in the, the game or the rap game or the streets or all of it, you know, because, you know, as a child too, as a youth or adolescent, it's real easy to get, you know, influenced by somebody that could be turning in, turning, uh, showing you how to, you know, fuck people over or yeah. do people wrong. So I was, man, I, I got to say, man, big shot OG Ron C, he always would tell me, man, my mom told me i gotta look out for you man you better not better not mess up out here so if you mess up out here it's gonna come back on me and she gonna fuss at me so you better he used to always get on me just about everything just to motivate me to be my best self to not worry about this or that or especially any negativity he would always encourage me you know what i'm saying or just stay positive and it, a lot of it would be if you mess up hey you better not watch out because it's, it's gonna come back my mama gonna she's gonna be calling me <laughs> yeah don't have, don't have my mama calling me you know and uh, you know but that's you know it was a uh, that's how i got in doing promotions and i would see people beg to get on tapes and just get shunned and you know come at watts or ron c the wrong way and then lose the opportunity or whatever and there was no opportunity to get on a screw tape yeah that wasn't it wasn't there and then especially by the you know screw died rest in peace by the time i'm on switch house tapes he was he already passed away you know but he, but as a child as a teenager all that at least as far as i knew it was no possible way that me i could go get on a screw tape yeah. that thought nah in reality if you really think about it if i would have just showed up at screw door and whatever he, from every story I heard, he probably would have been like, man, annoying, he annoying, he annoying, he annoying. All right, fuck it, let him in. And finally would have let me in. But at, growing up on the north side, that thought was like, uh-uh, nah, this is yeah, not you just ever going to yeah, happen. Yeah. yeah. So, it, man, even being on the Switzer House tape, the Switzer House, growing up to me, you know, they was, that was, it was, you know, I, I idolized them as well. You know what I'm saying? So to have that opportunity to work for Michael Watts and Ron C doing street promotions or just doing promotions was my way of trying to get in the door a little bit just to be a part of it, you know, uh, but not only be a part of it, it was how do I, I always wanted to get on the tape, but it was always like, damn, if I act, you only get one time to act, cause I didn't been there with Watts, especially when I would do parties and I would do promotions, I would have access to a lot of the record vinyl and I'd bring it, hey Watts, I got some new vinyl for you. All right, cool, he, was, he fucked with me. Ron C fuck with me. I went to church with his mama. You know, whatever. They they fuck with me. Now they knew I rapped as well. Me and Camille and I rapped, but we wasn't all over them trying to act like we was entitled and they got to sign us and it's on you to make us a star. We were never doing that. It was just, hey, yeah, I rap. You know, hey, I'm a fan of the Switch House. I do promotion. Let me do promotions for you, whatever. And I remember even man, I remember one time Watts played one of our songs. Him and Ron C played one of me and Camille and our song. We was in high school in the All Star. We was like 
everybody was tripping like, hmm. man, what? Oh my God, this was like, you made it, you know? And this is before we was even in the Swisher house, but it was just cause he had love for me and Kamina cause we was young artists in the neighborhood, same way he had love for Slim Thug or anybody else. It was just yeah, trying to come up and make her. it. And uh, you know, doing promotions was, that was okay, whatever. You know, I, now I can kind of earn my keep and you know, kind of maybe move up to, maybe if I do ask for, because, but like I said, I didn't been with Watts where people come up to him, ask him, call him, whatever. And he'll, you know, n he'll say n he'll never answer their phone call again or whatever. And this is 20 years ago, you know, but it was at a time where everybody felt like, you know, oh, you know, if, if I meet you, you're my ticket out. So if you meet anybody that was a celebrity of any type of way, and people feel like this still to this day, when they meet a lot of celebrities or people who make it, they feel like, oh, I prayed for God to send me a sign. Now I met you. You're my way out. So you mm -hmm. owe me because I prayed for God to show me. And now you're here. And you just go into the store to get a, a Sprite and come back home. You're like, what you mean? Oh, what's that? Yeah, yeah. But, but this, this is how I felt like that too as a child. Like if I, when I met somebody, like I, I remember my, uh, whatever, just, you know, anybody said they know a celebrity. Hey, you can, can you give us some money? See if you got some money for it. Because we, you know, I don't know. You don't know. So. I don't know. It's just uh that was my way of trying to earn my keep doing promotions, yeah. then then DJing and then eventually rapping. So what what was the first uh, freestyle y'all did, and how was that like whole experience? And how did how did it even come to that to say, all right, well, all right go, today gonna be the day we gonna put y'all on the mic? Okay, <clears throat> back like I said, I was doing a lot of promotion at that time. So a lot of the stuff that come out, I'd go to the different record stores. I'd put up, uh, you know, posters, or, you know, whatever. I put up the displays, you know, that type of stuff, them type of business. I'd, you know, put flyers, leave promo items there. I'd always run into Watts. He'd be dropping off new Switch House tapes, CDs, whatever. And it's, it's man, it was a store right off. I think it was called either Superstars or Ghetto Stars. I think it was Superstars. It was right off of Cross Timbers, right by, like, Yale, North Main over there. I'm pulling up, Watts pulling out, uh, about to leave. And I say, Watts, man, what's up, man? Hey, when y'all um going to rap on some Manny Fresh beats? Because I don't never hear nobody, man, Slim Thug will kill, man, PJ will kill one of them Manny Fresh beats, man. Get your dog on one of the Manny Fresh beats. And Watts say, man, you know what? It, usually the, the artists, they come to me and say, hey, I want to rap on this beat. I let them choose. And don't nobody choose no Manny Fresh beats. And I said, man, they tripping, bro. Hmm. That's, that's them the hardest beats in Hip hop, you know, then rap music, man. Y'all need to rap, y'all need to kill that shit. And he said, Well, what's your favorite uh uh cash money beat? And I said, Man, that that cash money is an army. That beat I used to love BG. That cash money is an army. And he oh yeah, yeah. Dun 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 dum 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 dum. Watch it start doing that in his right there on the spot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that beat do go hard. Yeah, they do go hard. Oh, what would you say on it? And he just called me on the spot and I was like, What you mean what I say? Shit, and I just started rapping. And he was like, Bet, let's go lay it. So, if, to me, even so, even, Damn, to, just even, like that. even to me, it was like, now, now let me say, that never came out. So, and I didn't been able to watch plenty of times where people go, and I didn't seen firsthand people go lay a verse, and it never see the light of day. One might get deleted on accident, might get lost, the, the board might get froze or messed up or something like that. But a lot of times it's because of what the, that particular person did or said after they did it. Man, yeah, I wrecked them. I went over there and wrecked all them boys. Man, they can't mm. see me. That type of stuff. You know, them the mess. That, that type of stuff. Get back to Watts. He not gonna put you on that tape. He not putting nobody on that tape. We're gonna talk down on the other people on the tape, or it's not a part of the. You know, the the this down. You know, so I I remember even then like saying, man, I get to go lay it. All right, bet. But thinking to myself, man, it ain't real till I hear it on the actual tape and someone else got it and they like yeah i got the new switch house tape and you want it you know so i was like man okay and i okay and so he said come on let's go to let's go to switch house and lay come hop in with me i hop in the impala with him i left my car there hop in with him we go to homestead go to the dust bowl to the studio we go over there uh, and he pull up a, a you know he pull it up i lay my verse you know while i'm over there um while i'm about to leave little ron who lived a couple houses down he didn't come knocking at the door and he like 13, 14 years old, if that, you know, and watch like, hey, hey, Paul, this is Lil Ron, we just signed him to the Switch House too. It's uh, my neighbor down the street I grew up with, it's they son, he rapped too, so he down with us too, man. And I'm like, oh, what's up? And he like, oh, what's up? You know, and and man, a lot at that time, you know, like I said, I was bottom of the totem pole with the Switch House, just period, as an artist, period. I got love from certain people, but I also got shitted on by a lot of people. And, you know, a lot of it, I just, kind of just took it as a man i ain't worried about you and i chose my battles well where you know why i'm gonna let 
you know, this bothered me, you know, I'm gonna show you, I use it as fuel too a lot of times, but I did get shitted on by a lot of people in the Swisher house. So Lil Ron was like the first one showing me, I remember thinking like, oh, you about to shit on me. And he was cool as fuck, but thinking, oh, but forgetting, oh damn, he is 13. So, you know, maybe he was with all of them. They might have, you know, corrupted him and they did shit on me too. But big shout out to Lil Ron for always showing me love, man. Yeah. He showed me love. But we, man, we did, uh, I did that one and I think me, we did another one, Bling Bling. And matter of fact, Lil Ron did, we did Bling Bling together. But both of those, Cash Money's Army and Bling Bling, they never came out. And uh, it, this was just me. This was before Comedian. This was just me. At that time, Comedian uh, was signed uh, with a record deal to Hurt 'em Bad. Hurt 'em Bad is the producer from Chicago that made uh, a lot of the, the Machiavelli songs, the Tupac songs. Okay. He made uh, Me and My Girlfriend, Just Like Daddy. Um, is he from out here? That's like he's from Chicago, but he was working with rap a lot. So he'd be down here. We met him at the club one time. He was uh he was he was down here doing a lot of production for rap a lot. And we just met him at the club. And then uh, when we was doing uh, grills, Camino used to work. We both used to work for Crime. Camino took Crime to the studio. Crime was somebody who was making grills. He still made grills. He was um he took Crime to the studio and Hurt 'em Bad was there. And then so anyway, that's how he ended up falling in to you know meeting Hurt 'em Bad. Hurt 'em Bad ended up signing him, taking him to Chicago. We moved to Chicago for a little while. They were signed to uh, Frank Thomas record label with the White Sox. And uh, oh, be hurt, yeah, no shit. yeah. And uh, it was we was all like, damn, man, come in and made it. He about to make, boy, we all about to be, we about to be out of there. But it, that ain't how it worked. It that it is definitely not how it happened too. Um, so you know, I we was just doing whatever we could to just we just was all. I never, I never in my life ever thought I'd be a professional rapper anyway. So it wasn't like, oh, you know, like I, any any part of me doing anything, even rapping with the Switch House was. For fun or love or for something else. I was DJing. That's how I was making money at the time was DJing and hustling and doing other various hustles and things, you know what I'm saying? But it wasn't as being a rapper. You know, that was just something I did for the love. But, you know, as it, you know, from from there, I stayed down, stayed cool, watched. And I remember, we okay, I, I, we do the bling bling, cash money as an army and thinking, damn, I did two of them. Man, hopefully one of them will come out. You know what hmm. I'm saying? And then they, whatever. I remember mean, Watts calling me saying, "Paul, bad news. What? I lost them. I can't find them. I don't know where they are. I didn't delete them. It ain't nothing you did. He kind of like said, no, it ain't. It ain't what you think. Because I would kind of mess with him too. Like after I lay it, like, hey, Watts, you ain't gonna delete it, are you? You ain't gonna delete it as soon as I leave, are you? Man, I, you know, just because I knew the game and I respect the game too. So I'll be real, Watts. You know, like yeah. shit. And, and, and First of all, I didn't. I don't want to do nothing that's going to embarrass me or you. And if I do something that's going to make you not want to put it on, I don't want to do that. So I want to know, you know. But I'm not that type anyway. To you know, I don't know. But anyway, and he he telling me, man, don't don't worry. It ain't what you think, you know. Uh, but I, I'm a uh, look. It's cool. You you want to come? You want to get on any tapes or freestyles? If it's a beat you want to get on, let me know. We'll work it out. You know how I am. You know I'm busy. Cause at this time too, I was doing promotions for the Swiss House. And I was doing a lot of other things like manufacturing on the, you know, tapes, CDs, pressing. We we do it, you know. I don't want to talk about too much about that, but we do a lot in house. So me and that's how I met T. Ferris. We both did that, and we got real close to doing that. Um, just do, just handling that and driving. I'd hit the road anyway, so I'd go take CDs with me, and I'd go to Dallas, Louisiana, San Antonio, Austin, anywhere I could, and I, I'd drive to a city to sell them ten CDs. Mm. That's you know it, it take more gas money than that to get out there and back, but I do it just to do it. And then while I'm there, I'm hustling, selling CDs, meeting people, whatever. Just you know, just marketing, branding myself, just pushing myself, believe you know, just following my dreams. Not necessarily as a rapper, but just as a go getter, as a hustler, and always thinking DJ or promoter or marketing is where I'll get a career. Mm. You know what I'm saying? To me, matter of fact. I, it was it was my dream job as a child to be a DJ for 97.9 The Box. This is what I used to, I, my dream job. This is what I thought I was going to be a rapper. You you can't, you don't grow up to be a rapper, at least at that time. You know, so it was like, but to be a DJ, you'd hear people who was from Houston or, from, you know, you, you could see them and they, was, they were real to me. So I was, I remember being young thinking this summer I'm going to get an internship at 97.9 The Box and it's gonna be over. The next thing you know, a big scandal hit, some type of sexual scandal with somebody with an intern who was underage or something, and 
they no longer allowed any interns under 18. So I was mm. like, fuck, that crushed me right there. But that's when I kind of went from, you know, doing other things and whatever. Anyway, but Michael Watts telling me, I remember him telling me back to the story. He, uh, I'm saying, you know, hey, I know you cool with a lot of other artists, other people in the Switcher house. And, you know, you tell them. Tell them I said it's all good. And I remember saying, Watts, if I say, hey, Watts say it's all good, they going to say, yeah, fucking right. Cause everybody can say, yeah, watch this is all good. You watch, you gotta tell him it's all good. Mm. You know, and he's like, he t- him telling me, well, who you who you fuck with the most, whatever. And me telling him, man, you know, Lester Roy always cool with me. Uh, you know, Big Pick always cool. You know, just kind of give him a list of this person, J Dog, Lil Mario, you know, whoever. You know, uh, just whatever. And, okay, and he kind of would tell them. And then, you know, I remember me saying, he said, what, what beat you like? And I picked another Cash Money beat, and it was that Follow Me Now, that Juvenile Follow Me Now. And he said. Uh, all right, um, man, you know what? Lester Roy, he he liked that beat too, so I'm going to tell him to call you when he come lay it so you you come lay it. Matter of fact, you can bring your boy Chameleon there if you want to. I don't even know if he was going by Chameleon at the time. I think he was going by Chameleon. It was um, Chame- the first time I saw it, it was Chameleon, Paul Wall and Chameleon. I remember yeah. seeing that. He he had a, like me too, he had a bunch of names too, and we kind of had, to, we shared names where it was like, Payroll, that was all our name. Mm. <laughs> What's your rap name? Payroll. That's my name. No, it's my name. I came over first and we got it from somebody else, you know. So it was like, mm. it's how he was. Yeah, but uh, but I'm but Watch was like, yeah, man, you know, because Watch fuck with Comedian too. Because I did the promotions and I would kind of work more with the Switch House doing like things, but I would be with Comedian all the time. We stayed together, me and him, we grew up together anyway, living down the street from each other, but at some point, Camino moved, his his mama moved off of Antoine and DeSoto, and he moved in with her. So right when I came out of high school, I moved over there, too, off Antoine and DeSoto. Mm. So from there, it was just uh, everywhere you saw him, you saw me, you saw me, you saw him. It was a little different. He went to Prairie View. I went to U of H. But other than that, that was just so we could spread our wings and spread our reach. Hey, I'm going to hold it down over here. You hold it down over there. Hey, when the, you tell me when something's going down, I'm going to come over there. I'm going to tell you when something's down. You come over here, and we're just going to expand our reach. And, uh, you know, and that lasted for a little bit. Then Kameen there came to U of H. For, you know, he joined me over there and because – it was a, uh, you know, that's that was where it was at for us, cause we could go to U of H and TSU. Whereas if you was at PV, you was stuck at PV. Yeah. We ain't had gas money to come back and forth two ninety. You out there, you stuck till the weekend, or unless you catch a ride with somebody. Where if you had U of H, you go to U of H, TSU, back to the crib, whatever. And we had multiple regular jobs too. And on term, on top of all of this, we had other regular jobs too. So you know, anyway, he was cool. Watch was cool with Camille now too. So he was. Hey, he tell me, yeah, man, you want to come? Hey, you can bring your boy Kameen, too. I bet. And this is one of the times where Kameen, like, down here, back and forth from Chicago, but he, he like, all right, I'm down here for a couple months, whatever. And, all right, hey, why well, say we can go to the Switch House? We're going to go. Well, let's, you know, we're going to go whatever. All right, next thing you know, I get a call from Lester Roy. Hey, watch well, Tommy call you whenever we go do this. Follow me now. What's up? Where you at? I bet I'm on the way. Hmm. I, you know, get Kameen now. We go over there. Boom, we do our thing. Bam, that's our really our first switch house flow. Okay. Now from there, like I said, okay, even at that time, man, now I'm just gonna give you my interpretation. Now each other person might have a perspective, you know what I'm saying? But at the time, it seemed like to me, every time Watts come around, like I, I told you a lot of switch house artists used to shit on me. They shit on Watts too. They used to shit on him all the time, like damn to disrespect him sometimes, and I'd be like, Man, he like a god to me. Like, man, how's y'all talking to him like that? But, you know, you know, it is what it is. You know, a, a lot of people didn't see the machine. They only saw their individual part. So in a machine, an engine, there's a lot of parts. Yeah. And, you know, some parts you can remove and the machine still run. But, uh, you know, the machine is the machine. You need all the parts for it to run smoothly. But some of these... People, they thought they was the machine. Swisher House was the machine. You know, Watts was the driving gas that gave us, you know, the, the power to go. All us as artists was just, we was pieces of the machine. But me and Kameen was two of the artists that was cool with Watts, where we didn't, you know, and I it wasn't like they was just dogging him out to his face, like bullying him, you know, like that. Like, you know, the, but it was just... I don't know, and some of it's just like banter. You know how it is you in the hood. Yeah. Hey, bitch, fuck you, bitch. You know, you don't mean, oh, fuck you. Damn, you talk crazy. No, nah, you know, it's just how you talk sometimes, you know. But still, you know, I always see, that's how, that was my perspective. Like I say, these people, even Watts might have his, I ain't, I ain't talked to him about this, so he might have his complete on-take perspective on his own. But my take was, I always was like, damn, 
I love watch. He got to me. Same with me, Camille. We we loved him. So we was we was cool with him. We was like we was friends. We talk, hey, what you doing? What you got going on? What's going on? You know, whatever. As well as him being, you know, a, a hip hop icon for us. You know, so we, when he say, yeah, hey, it's cool, man, bring come in. It's like, oh, bet, come yeah. in. Hey, he said, you say you can come too. All right, bet. Bet yeah. we so I keep hitting the mic. Well, bet, man, we shit, we go over there, we do the follow me now. And then from there, this is something I thought about. And I, I realized that when every show come around, there's an intro. Like a like a new DJ come on ten to two or this you know there's an intro to the show like you know uh, ninety seven nine Carmen Contreras yeah. you know it was a remake of you know Carlos Santana but it was yeah. her version it was her intro to the show and uh, you know just same with everyone so Watts didn't have an intro at the time and I remember me and Camille and us saying hey Watts can we make you an intro and really we was just trying to get on the radio because if we make you an intro. Then every day you go on the radio, you playing our intro. That means every day on the radio we getting played. Yeah. So we was like just whatever, and we we would talk to Watts about this. So and he was like, yeah, I want yeah, bet bet I want y'all to make me make me an intro. So I don't know, maybe he he might have asked us to make it, or man, in my mind I asked, and come in mind he probably asked. I don't know, but we end up making uh at the same time when we doing the freestyle for Follow Me Now. Me and come in like man, Watts man, what's up man? When you gonna let us make you an intro? Let's make you an intro right now. And he like, all right, what beat you like? And we just, hey, you know what we like, man. Put on some Manny Fresh, man. So we go through whatever. And at the same time, we wanted the hard to find shit, you know. So we would, like I said, when I tell you I would buy something just because people was on it. Bum B on it, UGK on it, or, you know, Juvenile on it. I bet yeah. I'm buying it. You know, that's how it was. We saw Missy Elliott, who was dope anyway. And I think, as a matter of fact, I think Camino might have bought her shit anyway. But uh, I remember it. The song she had with Juvenile and, mm -hmm. you know, the Hot Boys was, was I, I believe, I thought was produced by Manny Fresh because he doing the intro. Right. He talking, you know, I'm like, damn, yeah. that's the one that, man, we love that, you yeah. know. So I was like, but we ain't no intro, ain't no, it ain't no instrumental for that. So he just kind of looped it, whatever, just cut, scratched right there, whatever, put together an instrumental. Bet I got it. And then we like, he kind of feeling it, you know, we, whatever. He like, man. Whereas there might have been other times he might have tried to rap. Other artists might have been like, nah, watch, you ain't rapping with us. Yeah. Like kind of laugh it off. To me, I love Lil' Kiki. And some of my favorite songs with Lil' Kiki, I would hear DJ Screw rapping on them. You know, and to me, it was just, I don't know, I always wonder. I don't know if he wrote his verse. I don't know if somebody wrote it for him. But I love listening to DJ Screw rap. And then he was a DJ as well. Like, of course, he was the DJ, and then right. he rapped as well. But I mean, you see, what I'm saying, no, like, that was always live to hear that. Yeah, yeah. So, to me, Watts never rapped, and I thought too. I'm thinking, hey, Watts, man, why you ain't never rap on no switch out tape? And he just, man, ain't. I don't know if it was kind of like a combination of none of the other artists wanting him to rap with him or taking him serious as a rapper or something, maybe. And at the same time. Him maybe not necessarily wanting to be a rapper. He's a DJ, so he didn't want to be a rapper. So, man, I'm not a rapper. I don't know. And me and Kamina kind of wired him up like, man, shit, get on there with us. Because we thought that would be live as fuck to have Michael Watts, who never rapped ever in the history of rap, you know, rap on a freestyle with us. And it's his intro. So he did it, you know, and then it was his intro. And, uh, you know, and I remember, bro. I remember driving my, my god sister, shout out to my god sister, Nina Taylor. I remember driving her from Acres Home to Prairie View. She went to Prairie View. I remember being on the corner, cutting through West Little York, being on the corner of West Little York and Antoine. The radio just slightly turned on. We just about to head toward 290 to go to Prairie View. And I remember hearing it in the background. And Matt, it was like the afternoon. This is when Matt Hatter was doing afternoons. And Matt Hatter kind of teasing Watts. Boy, I got something. He pumping it up. I got something exclusive. It's the first time Michael Watts ever rapped on a song. He mm -hmm. And I'm kind of hearing this, not thinking, you know, because the radio turned out slightly. I'm talking, I'm talking to my god sister, whatever, and not really focused, you know, on the music. But hearing it, and then little about, because never in a million years would it cross my mind that they would be talking about me or a song I'm on. But then, you know, next thing you know, you hear the, the beat. Dun, 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 dun. And thinking, wait a minute, like, kind of slowing down, like, it turned it on, like, oh shit, that's us. And she, my, my gosh, is like, 
It ain't you. They just he just said that's Michael Watson, man. Hat. I know you know him, but that ain't you. And I'm like, no, nah, that's me. And then my verse come on, and she's like, damn, <laughs> that is you. And thinking, oh shit, we on the radio. Like, damn, that's the man. It, it was. The, I remember the first time I ever heard myself on the radio. That type of feeling and the way they pumped it up. It was like, oh man, I thought I was the man. You know, like, hey, you heard it, you heard it. No, I ain't hear it. Man, they played me on the radio. No, they didn't. Yeah, they did. Man, no, they didn't. No, they didn't. You know, trying to convince people that they just played our freestyle on the radio. But a big portion of why they played it was because Watts was on there rapping. It wasn't because we killed it or it right. wasn't because we might have killed it, but that's not why they played it. They played it because Watts was on there rapping. But, uh, and then, so anyway, when Chopping Them Up Part 2, the Switch House tape came out, the Follow Me Now freestyle was on it. And... The, the intro was on it with Michael Watts rapping on there. And it was uh, like a really a surreal moment of, damn, okay, I'm I'm on a switch house tape for real. Like, shit, you know, like, this is crazy to me. Unbelievable. You know what I'm saying? And then from there, it's, uh, I got to get on another one. Shit. And it'd be like, shit. And I used to collect it in my mind, like, the same way I would collect screw tapes that had Lil Kiki on them or screw tapes that had Fat Pat freestyles. In my mind, I would collect... Okay, I'm on this one. All right, I got that one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm on this one. And it'll only be one freestyle on any tape ever. The first one when we was chopping them up part two twice, that's the only time we was ever on something more than once. Other than that, it was only once because a lot of the other artists, they kind of saw us as competition. So they didn't, or whatever. I don't know if that's, I don't know if that's, for whatever reason, they didn't fuck with us, a lot of the other artists. So they didn't want us rapping on no freestyle with them. They wanted to do their shit without us, you know, and, me and Command was like, shit doing our thing, and we was down with whoever was down with us, supporting them, even the ones that didn't support us. We still supporting them too, but we at the end of the day, me and Command like fuck it, it's me and you. It was me and you this whole time anyway, so fuck it, yeah. let's keep it going. But then y'all had that that big one though uh, on the explosive though, man. Like I think was that the one that really kind of just like that one right there for me kind of just like made it yeah. official. Like all right, this is this these new guys, Paul and Command, yeah. switch house, it was, uh, and they going hard, man. It was it was crazy because before that. I think um, Kameen might have, every now and then, Kameen would get on one without me. Or like, you know, and, and I don't mean like in a nefarious way, like, but it would be every now and then, he whatever, I, I'm at work or I'm at school, he not, and they, he, this the time to come, all right, you can come, I can't come, I'm at work, all right, fuck it, you miss out, you miss out. Or, you know, sometimes, a lot of times too, because Kameen, uh, he sung a little bit, you know, he wasn't like, you know, uh, Tyrese or nothing, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. But he sung, you know, with his rap. So, you know what I'm saying? He he was real clever too with flipping uh songs to, you know, doing his own versions of them. So that also would be a reason. So I think I, I might have been that uh I'm sorry, Miss Jackson. I'm just gonna keep say, asking. Haters keep asking yeah. to switch a house. Really good. Yeah, that's I, classic. I think oh that my might God, be, that's a classic. I, I, so that you know, he kinda had one before me. And I remember thinking, damn, I wish I was on. Damn, I missed out. I could have been on that one. Cause up to that, we might have went hard on our freestyles, but they wasn't like a switch house classic or it wasn't like that, you know. So when Explosive came around, that was uh I even I wasn't anticipating it, you know. I was waiting and hoping, like, man, I just hope I, I'm on a few switch house tapes now, but when am I gonna have my switch house? Hit freestyle, like yeah. man. I ain't not that I'm not wrecking, but I need one that that's one classic. And y'all end up on before the cap, and that shit yeah. was huge. Yeah, uh. but that that for sure did it. And you know, man, and I mean, in large part, thanks to Dallas Fort Worth. You know, shit, boy, I got so much love in Dallas, and it, it was so tough, bro. Being uh, it was you know the city was segregated at Houston, you know, north versus south. Even on the north side, it's segregated. Homestead, Greens Point, Fifth Ward, Acres Home. Even Acres Home is segregated. Man, over 80, like 80% of Swiss House rappers was from Acres Homes from different parts. So there's the Garden City side, there's the Heather Glen side, there's whatever, man. So all parts of, you know, Acres Homes, whatever artist was, you know, to two or three that was from this part, they was, you would hear them on all the freestyles together. Whatever, that's why you'd hear like Lil Mario and J-Dog on a lot of freestyles together because they was from the bricks, you know, or, you know, you, whatever. So it was, this is how it was. So, uh, you know, it, it was still kind of maybe not segregated with, with hate, but it was segregated. You'd hear whoever together all the time. So it was like, a, 
you know, where do me and Camino, where do we fit in? Well, we like the outsiders, where we, you know, from Woodland Trails West, or uh, Antoine and DeSoto, or even when I moved to Gulf Bank, even then it was like, we still outsiders to everybody else who was there already established within the Swisher House. So finding our footing of getting in there and representing was, it was, uh, it was, it was crucial to us, but it was one of the things where it was like, we got to, we got to find our way and make our way, but that's why we only on one per tape. So it's like, like I can say, it's, I'm on one on one tape. All right, hopefully I don't get taken off. All right, I don't get taken off. Yeah. And, and it was like that for every single tape. I hope I don't get taken off. Man, I hope I don't get taken off. You know, and then uh, it coming out, you know, it coming out and being like, yeah, I'm on it, I'm on it. <laughs> and still, people not knowing, this is what it was. It was a, a, a process of people around me or whatever realizing that that is you that I'm hearing on the tape. Cause they would see me and know me, and they listen to the music, but they wouldn't put two they wouldn't put two together. together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but as you know, the that explosive though, that's man, that it, man, that's what did it, boy. When they, boy, I got so much love in 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 Dallas, but it was like I said, going back to it being segregated. It was tough for us to find to or, or get love in Houston, cause. Everybody who had love to give in Houston, they was giving it to other people. They was giving it to the screwed up. If you from the South Side, you getting you you fuck with the screwed up. There's no one on the South Side that fuck with the Switch House in the earlier days. As time progressed, things changed. But in the earlier days, it was nah, it wasn't happening. And even then, it was like, you know, if it was like it was tough to find to make a career for yourself. So I hit the road. I'm Dallas, San Antonio with my boy Juan in Urban City. You know. Austin, whoever I can go to in Austin, Louisiana, Lafayette. Lake so from Charles. that freestyle, that's when you're like, all right, I got something. Well, now it's time to hit the road. I was doing that anyway before I was even freestyling because I was bringing the Switch House tapes to the stores. The promotional side. Right, right, right. 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 So me and T. Ferris and you know, a couple of them, usually just us, we would hit the road. And I'd go this way, he'd go that way. And I'd go to all the stores in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, drop off, collect, whatever. Meet people, meet the store owners while I'm in there, meet customers, whatever. Before I'm a rapper, I'm just somebody who's dropping off, and you know, I'm just like the guy who's dropping off the Bud Light at 7 Eleven, you yeah. know, that's all but I do. But still building relationships, right? But I'm building in. relationships, yeah, yeah. I'm learning the Dallas culture, learning it. It's different. First of all, learning that Dallas and Fort Worth not the same thing, which I didn't know growing up. I'm thinking it's the same thing. I ain't know they two separate different places. And then learning the whole entire culture just of Dallas, how it's so different than Houston. It's a little, very similar, but it's very different. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, you know, that was that was I, I got to take in these you know places. So when I would get on the Swiss House freestyles, I throw them out here and there, throw a shout out here and there, throw a street name here and there to my partners wherever they hanging out on my homeboys, whatever I, I fuck with in whatever city just to you know build a rapport up. But you know when that explosive came out, that was like the culmination of all right, I've been doing it for a few times now. Now a big a lot of people know that this is me. They know you know they've been following. They have like you know a few power freestyles and then then I wrecked it too. You know of course you know that's what did it. But boy that. Man, Dallas Fort Worth, man, I would ride down MLK, go to the South Side, go to the car wash, anywhere you would hear that song, everywhere, man. I used to, man, I used to, it was just so It's a class, surreal, I can still man. rap that shit to this day. What it do is power wild like a flow so cold. I'm 19 years old with a mouthful of gold. Yes, I'm old sir. hot, with so cold yes, in the sir. winter, but I'm hot like the summer. I'm calling Michael Watson, yeah, swaying the switch of hot summer. Mo, hot in the summer. Put some cold like, like drugs. I, I can creep and I can crawl. Like it's that boy, power wild. And I'm going to tell you. Know, y'all. Big Lee Davis on, on my side. Lee Davis on my side. Uh, took some swings off my, my ride, now I glide like, like Clyde. My ride with blind side of my boy. Big tight. Paul Walker kids bob as if I rode on the bike. bike. But I'm a riding big body with my cousin Scotty. Scotty. What's up to Scotty? <laughs> when I pass his turn, I, I barely know it still. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, they Classic. Know. That one, I mean, and then the. Um, the yeah, uh, love of my money came like shortly, like kind of almost. Were y'all still with Scotty? No, no, this was. Love of my money came a little bit later, but. What you say? Wait, love my money, but I mean, y'all were, were y'all color changing click, and then the love of my money came. Was, was well, that the order? Within the Switcher House, it was like it wasn't a record label. First of all, it was a promotional company. They'd make mixtapes for promotion. It said on the tape for promotion use only. It's a promotional company. Watts told me this from day one. Man, if you ever get on a Switcher House tape or any mixtape, it's promotion. You're not entitled to nothing. Don't look at it as a, a lottery ticket you just won. 
Don't look at it. It's promotion. You promoting yourself. You promoting an album coming out. You promoting a product you got or a store or <coughs> excuse me he, or, or anything like that. It's the Kush, not Corona. It's the Kush, not Corona. Uh, but uh, but anyway, he you know he would always instill this promotion. So it wasn't no record label. There was no artist signed to the Swiss House. It wasn't until later that it, it was a formed record label. They signed artists and put out releases as artists. Before that, it's just mixtapes. So y'all formed promotion. Color Changing Click within right. Switcher House? Within the Switcher House because that was us in the Switcher House. That was our like section of the Switcher House. Like Boss Hall was Slim. Or, now, now some of them, I don't know. I looked at it. This is Like I said, he's, pretty, he's one of them individuals. They might look at it slightly different. But I looked at it like the Color Changing Click, that was our part to the machine. You know what I'm saying? Some of them looked at they crew was their machine only and they only hear being leased out to the switch house but we looked at it like man the color change the click that's just us me and me and come in uh and then and Lou Hawk and 50 50 because 50 50 grew up with us too we knew we knew i knew we knew twins we went to school with both 50 50 since sixth grade so we knew them all you know them their whole life too since we 12 years old so hmm. shit, uh it, we uh, we connected with them a lot although um, you know, hey, shout out to my boy Fifty Fifty on lock right now, man. He, shit, he been locked up almost twenty years now. Shit, man. But hopefully, you know, I think he do got a parole coming soon. And um, but and then shout out to my boy Roger, who Fifty Fifty, who's out here now, still killing it, man. He, I seen him post a freestyle the other day, boy. He got both of them got word play out this world. So I don't know what it was in the water over there, man. But me, come in there. Both 50 50 twins, Lucky Luciano, we all, man, uh, I know I'm forgetting other people too, and I apologize, but there's a few other people from the all whole like little area that, man, we kind of really shit, you know, zone too, like I say, zone. It's, man, we, Jim yeah. James, you from, you know, shit, kind of Acres Home, same area, shit. So, but anyway, we, uh, with the color changing click, that was our way of doing our own mixtapes because I'm in the Switcher house. But I can't put out a Switch House mixtape. Like you say, you only on, you only get on what you and get I'm, on. And I'm only you ain't on got no control one, over right? That. Yeah. And any and, and there was a a wholesale process. Some of it I'm not, you know, I don't want to talk about it too. But but we go out there and hustle tapes, hustle CDs. We buy them wholesale and then go out and and, and sell our tapes and CDs and make money. So you know, some of the artists felt like what I'm rapping on the tape people buying a tape because I'm rapping on it. Why I got to buy the tape from you to sell it? Why can't I get them free? Or you owe me for rapping on the tape, which, okay, I understand that argument, but I was taught a different way. The way I was taught was this is promotion. And to me, there might be people buying it because I'm on it, but the tape itself might cost a dollar just for the actual cassette tape. The CD going to cost more. To, to press it up, the machine costs money. They always defects, so you always lose the money because it's defects. And on top of the CDs scratch, they get messed up, so it's, you lose a lot of money just off of human error. And then on top of that, somebody got to be in there working to press them up, being that I was the one doing that. I knew it took work to do that. Like, that, this shit ain't free, you know? So it's for someone to say, all right, I come in here and say a rap now, pay me. You know, okay, I do understand that, but at the same time, to me, it was uh, and it was reasonable what we paid wholesale for them. You know, I thought I thought it was reasonable. I was okay with it, you know, yeah. shit. But other people weren't, you know, and that's kind of what led to a lot of people branching off to doing their own tapes. And it's kind of like a lot of it's unspoken rule type of to the game of it. But it's uh, the easiest way I can say is that people thought they was bigger than the machine. You know what I'm saying? And uh, a lot of us wanted to prove that, you know, so Slim did that with Boss Hog, and he was able to continue to keep going, but at the same time, he always maintained, that's then still tipping, I still represent Switcher House. Same with me and Camille, and we did Color Change and Click, but we always was like, oh yeah, this our, is this our way to make our own mixtapes, but we Switcher House for life, you know, I, I'm, I'm still to this day Switcher House for life. I ain't signed to Switcher House, but I'm Switcher House for life the same way Lil Kiki screwed up for life, you yeah. know, like, shit. And even when we, okay, so at this time, me and Kameen just trying to find our way. Even at this time, I'm making money off of tapes, but I'm thinking long-term career, my career going to be owning a record store, being a DJ, because that's how I would make the bulk of my money, or owning a company and having other people run the cities and drop off tapes like I was, you know. Uh, but be a rapper was not like, it was more like I'm doing that now, just to get my name out so I can get another job somewhere else. You know what I'm saying? Like, like if I make the if I make a, 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 a star play and a, a highlight in the Super Bowl, 
but I got a shitty career. Somebody gonna pick me up because yeah. I'm known for that one play in the Super Bowl. So it's you know, kind of something like that. That's how I was thinking. Like, not that I thought I was a whack rapper or something, but it just was. I don't even know how to make a song or an album. I know how to rap or write down some fly lines, but it was a learning process, uh, you know, to develop. But with us doing Swisher House tapes was our way of doing our own mixtapes that was not infringing on the Swisher House name or whatever. Because also you want to have, you know, you want to have a protocol of the quality control. If right now, if it's 10 of us or, it's, you know, it's only three of us here, but, you know, if it's, if it's whatever, if it's at that time, it might have been 10 to 15 Swisher House rappers. Okay, if 10 to 15 people, that's 10 to 15 different DJs, they not DJs. I was a DJ, but even then, I wasn't no Michael Weiss or Ron C. I grew to get my skills up and become better, but I wasn't them, you know. So imagine anyone else who didn't even own turntables, never even DJ or whatever, like so to, to them, you know, or to some people, it's I don't know, they don't put the same passion or love for a DJ or for the other workers behind the scenes as maybe I do, you know, but so think about 10 to 15 different people putting out their own mixtape with 10 to 15 different DJs, 10 to 15 different people mixing it down, 10 to 15 people, you know, who level the bass different, you know, or, you know, or have different CD burners or whatever, so it don't necessarily always look the same. You want to have that quality control, so that was the way it worked. It, we put out color changing clip CDs, you know, you put out whatever your part of Switch House, your crew is, you put out whatever your, you put out yours, you put out yours, and then Switch House put out Switch House. But some of them felt like they can press up their own Switch House tapes and they ain't got to play Watson Run, see nothing. I didn't. I felt like if I'm selling a Switch House tape or CD, whether I'm on it or not, I got to at least give you your CD. I, if I'm on yeah. it, I'm one verse. Yeah. That's one verse. That's not even the whole song, maybe. It's just one verse out of 19, 17, whatever, I mean, 15 songs is on there. Like, man, so I don't know. I always felt like I got to pay my I, – I always respected the game and to try to pay my way. I felt like it was fair. But that's kind of how we would put out our own mixtapes is, shit, all right, we put out Color Change and Click, uh, Slim putting out Boss Hog or – whoever else putting out theirs and then like I say Watson will maybe call us all together to get on the Switch House or Ron C will call us all together to get on Switch House. Even then it was Watts putting out Switch House tapes, Ron C putting out Switch House tapes. That's kind of what it grew to. So mm. then it was like even within that they, they work real hard at the quality control and matching but at the same time you know, I don't, we boys, but I don't want to give you all my secrets. You don't want to give me all your secrets. So they wasn't always going to sound exactly the same or, you know, and they got their own unique style. So right. it's going to sound different. You know what I'm saying? But that's kind of how it was. It was just, it was watching us. He putting out their own tapes. And I, we used to think like, okay, I do DJ. I, I do, you know, whatever. Even the Ron C., our boy is the, my boy T. Needy was so baby. He helped me get my first set of uh, turntables, uh, and that was one of Ron C boys. So OG Ron C hooked me up with somebody to get a turn. I used to keep him at Ron C house. And Ron C used to tell me, all right, look, because he, at the, at whatever, at the time, he didn't have his turntables at his house. He might have had them at his, somewhere else, the studio, his mama house store or something. So he said, hey, look, you let me use your turntables, I'm going to teach you some tricks that I know. Like, oh, man, what? Shit, hmm. yeah, yeah. So he, you know, he, whatever, he'd come, he, sometimes he'd watch a video or he'd, you know, watch the, you know, the different uh, uh, events, you know, whatever, uh, uh, competition, the DJ competitions that would, you know, be on video or whatever. Uh, you know, he might learn something from somebody else that they taught it to him, or he might just be trying something, but this is how it worked. He'd go in the room with the door closed. Uh, he, you know, it might be a day, it might be what, a couple days, whatever, but when he mastered, hey, hey, somebody get power out, power out. Hey, power out, Ronzi calling you. Hey, what's up? What's up, OG? Hey, hey, watch. Check this out. Check this out. And he showed me what he did. Hmm. And I'm oh, shit. All right, now you do it. Man, I don't, I'd fuck it up, you know, mess the needle <laughs> up, everything all heavy-handed. And he's like, oh, you got to work through it. You got to work through it. You got to learn whatever he, you know, show me ways to adjust. But a lot of it was, you know, him just telling me, you know, now you're not leaving until you master it too. And now I'm not putting you on another tape till you master You know, kind of hmm. shit, like give me incentives to practice it. And, you know, that's, that's how it would be. So I'd be in there just doing shit and man it really was like a man I, I really like sometimes I, I can't even like relate that you know I, I, Run, OG Runcy has gone on to do like a kind of like a DJ Academy the Chop Stars kind of like 
similar, you know, kind of what he did for me. But that is maybe might be a little more, I, I don't know, it's uh, uh, bigger or widespread, I think. But at the time, it was just me. So just me being in, I even remember thinking at the time, like, damn, OG Ron C. And at the time, he just was Ron C, but he still was my OG then. But Ron C, he, you know, he, he, he teaching me, he learning me these things. Like, man, this is, who who get Ron C personally teaching them how to DJ? Like, damn, man, I just always was amazed by that. And I took pride in it, but I thought that's what I was going to do. I was going to be a DJ. But I'm thinking still, like, man, I, I'd be wrong as hell if I put out a Swish House tape and it said Swish House, DJ Paul Wall, this and that. Like, I know, for one, I know Watts would be upset. I know Ron C would be upset. And I don't want to disrespect them anyway. I, that ain't my place to do that. But we got Color Changing Click. Okay, and... Watts and Ron C encouraging us and encouraging each one of us. Man, y'all, yeah, y'all do y'all own, you know, whatever. Expand your shit, get it, get that shit going. Cause to them, Switch House, us being on there was just promotion anyway. So the whole purpose of us coming on there was to promote us as artists to go sign to somebody else, whatever. So that's why we ended up signing to Payton Fool, cause Switch House wasn't a record label. Mm. So we signed to Payton Fool. Also because Ron C was signed to Payton Fool to do like a compilation with them. And then from there, and actually from there, it was just gonna be me. It was just gonna be me at the time because Camino was st either still signed to Hurt Him Bad and Frank Thomas. He definitely was still out there, but he was—I think he was still signed too at the time. But he, uh, he, uh, uh, they, you know, it was Ron C signed to Payton Full, and he was like trying to bring me over there too. You know, bring me in as an artist too, and I was gonna be a solo artist, but it was kind of like Mad Hatter and Cat. They was like, and Ron C, all of us. He was like, they was like, shit. If Comedian down too, I'd rather have both of y'all and, you know, why not have both the group instead of just, yeah, we want you, but, you know, whatever. Anyway, so then we signed over there. And also, to be honest, at the time, we had some people that was, like, maybe trying to sign us, but they didn't respect us as artists. They was trying to ride the wave or make money off of us or they didn't know what they was doing or they was hmm. trying to sign us to shut us up or something along those lines. Not everybody, but the people, like, most of the people that had the power – to, to you know change our career in a positive way they were already busy doing that with other artists so we didn't really have an opportunity you know other than pay the bull you yeah. know when Matt Hatter and Cat gave us the record the contracts it wasn't really you know too many other people giving us one Especially when me and Camino went our separate ways it was not one person in the world trying to sign me other than when T. Ferris and Watts and G. Dash now, but shit, with uh, at the time, Camino, okay, we both signed with Payton Fool. We signed as a group, and we like, okay, this the this the plan. Ron C got his compilation. We're gonna do a song. We're gonna, we're gonna make. We're gonna do a song on the compilation, and whatever song it is is also gonna be on our album. You know, uh, or or basically, we're gonna one of our songs off our album. We're gonna put on this compilation, uh, and um whatever uh, or something along those lines we get on this album it just so happened that the song actually in love with my money was on the b side of another song that in love with my money wasn't even supposed to be the single it just was on the other side and no sure people just fucked with it and, and shit it was that was real as fuck shit it was crazy to nah, hear that, that took off song. that was on the radio all the time dog like i remember every yeah. time i got in the car man and love when my money was on the radio man man and being in dallas we'd hear it on k104 and 97 on beat at the same time that's a crazy feeling when you hear your song on both stations at the same time and then an hour later both stations at the same time again and then everybody that passed by you playing it on their own because they got it anyway on their switch house tape or whatever or they got the album whatever it was still is a crazy feeling so Man, and people ask me, how I feel when people ride by jamming your music? Yeah, shit feel great. It yeah. feel amazing, shit, because that's, that's what we want. Yeah. But, so, I mean, around that time, though, this is like, this is kind of around the time when you and Chameleon that kind of started going y'all separate ways, or? Yeah, we, um. Was it just growing apart, or? I mean, Because y'all been best like, friends up until that point. I mean, this, this is how I look at it. I mean, Bill Gates and Steve Jobs, they can't both be the CEO. You know, one of them got to be the COO or one of them got to be the VP in charge of whatever. You know what I'm saying? Or they CEOs of separate companies. If it's the same company, you know, it's it, it, no matter how genius both of us are or how good we are or whatever, anything of the caliber of quality of whatever we got to bring to the table, you know, it's if we as a group off top, we got to split it in half off top. 
if you're an artist, if you got 11% as an artist, that was considered a good deal, okay? Off top, man, had it gave us like 20%, 25%. So mm. we like doubling the, ind the industry standard for a good deal. It's changed a lot because artists' rights have changed a lot or just artists, you know, ignorance has changed. Now people know not to, you know, know that you can do it on your own and they know ways to get them get a higher percentage and things like that. But at the time, you got 11%. That was a good deal. We got double that. So it was, uh, man, it was, but we were always constantly thinking, we want to make, we want to make a business off of this. How can we, you know, how can we make money off of this? So we're not trying to run our bills up or promotion or spending money on this and taking people out to eat and we paid all this money on this and that and that now nah. every dollar spent me and come in are like okay basically along the lines of and we was always like no 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 don't don't, don't. We'll, we'll spend our own money we'll spend our own money because we didn't want it to come out later so we go hustle come find a ways hey we, we gotta come up with 2500 all right bet we go come hey here's my half here's your half or whatever or whatever whatever and we do it on our own if that means we pressing up on you know vinyls if that means we paying for our own posters to get done if we paying the promotion team ourselves out our pocket if we whatever we paying we doing that out our pocket so that when the album come out we making money from one cd sold or however we can do it you know so that was our view is uh you know um we don't want to be recouping sitting here recouping because you'd hear stories of people who albums went platinum double platinum and they ain't make no money well why they ain't make no money because they spent 10 15 million dollars promoting the album or doing things and that might be why it went double platinum and platinum but we wanted to make money, so we yeah. was like, "Hey, we see it, it, we getting even twenty five percent, which was a good deal." You, you put that in half, we right back to then we getting like shit. And I don't know, it just was. I think it was in both our stars to be solo solo artists. You know what I'm yeah. saying? It just this was what it was meant to be. So we solo artists, but it was very tough for me. I say very tough. Not one person in the world fucked with me. They fucked with me as a person, but as a rapper, it was a uh, unanimous. You fell off. You ain't shit without comedian there. That was the unanimous vibe. Oh, you cool, but you ain't shit without comedian there as a rapper. And uh, I don't Cause know. Cause he went on to do the, that's when he started doing the mixtape messiahs and like he really went into like branding his thing and you were still kind of just trying to figure it out. I was, right. I was kind of trying to figure it out, but at the same time, even when we, this was even still when we doing color changing click. When we was doing that, he was kind of building his own platform of his own crew. Cause to me, the color changing click was me, comedian there. 50 50 and Lou Hawk. But then it's his brother Razak. Shout out to Razak. Then it was Young Roe. Shout out Young Roe and whoever else he's bringing in or whatever, which some of them were our friends. Young Roe came in because he was signed and paid in full and he was J Mac homeboy. And J Mac was like, hey, why don't y'all let him come? Can y'all let him get on y'all freestyles to give him some publicity, this and that? And I didn't really like Young Roe at first because he was a battle rapper. But when I heard him, um, spit like dropping bars that's when i was like okay i'm convinced yeah he got it he hard i don't like the battle rap because I, I don't it's not too many battle rappers i like you know but when i he seen him drop bars i was convinced same with Razak. he was my boy just like camino was so I, I always was like man bring him on hell yeah bring him on he's our boy anyway camino felt a little different because that was his brother and uh you know i probably would feel the same if i'm bringing my blood on you know somebody who's my blood brother on because everything they do is a representation of you he could go out and get him in trouble or do something that he got to clean up or whatever or not necessarily you know not necessarily bad but it's just it's like you are it's a lot already watching out for yourself but then to watch out for it's another else, responsibility yeah it's yeah. a huge responsibility but uh you know he, he came on too but then eventually you know i don't know we went our separate ways 50 50 twin we always was cool like we all because me and his brother me and him and his brother and my mom is close with his brother too who's locked up you know and him and and his mom you know his, his whole family so we always remained close we didn't really let it bother us too much you know like me and Camille are going our separate ways but lou hawk was really kind of the one who was like riding with me like all right me and him is just me and lou hawk so we split up you know Camille continued the color changing click basically you know and that kind of turned in color changing click military you know all that but it at the time well it's like everything the screwed up click evolved too at the original of the screwed up click screwed up click was fat pat and little kiki and then it was more and more and more and more and more up to his death same with switch house at first it was others and then you know others and then me at some point and then others after me so with any of just color change click was the same way started off with us for it and it evolved to more but like you said i'm part of it was it was like 
I'm doing my own color changing click CDs. Kameen kind of doing his own color changing click CDs. While we beefing, we still color changing click and we're not making it public. Although people pitted us against each other because we the two stars on the team. So it's just, was that's how people do. But you know, they, Kobe and Shaq, you know, it's like mm -hmm. I was, you know, so. It just it was it is what it is. But me and Goo would be over there in Lou Hawk. We'd be making our mixtapes, and then T. Ferris would be the only one that would be like, "Hey, bro, fuck with everybody talking about, man. Your best days are not behind you. Hey, bro. Hey, I don't care what nobody say, bro. Your gas ain't out the tank. Hey, you still got some. Hey, hey, I heard that freestyle you did. Hey, I like what you say. Hey, you went hard on that. You know, he would always give me encouragement. And he wasn't no manager or none. He just was pressing up, pressing up CDs and tapes, doing promotions, kind of like what I was doing, you know, before I was rapping. And uh, you know, then he kind of he was doing that. He got elevated to doing other jobs at the Switch House, and I don't know what his title was at the time, but when he, you know he met Mike Jones or whatever, he, that's when he started. Even then, he, I don't think he was Mike Jones' manager, but he was like helping him out just because Mike Jones was the new Switch House artist. It was Mike Jones and Magnificent, and they was the new Switch House artist, and. He was like helping the new Squish I was artist. So it was like, hey, uh, uh, you and Kameen y'all got, got shows all the, all, all the time, man. Would you mind? This be kind of before me and Kameen was when I said, well, hey, would you mind letting Mike Jones open up for you? Because we're trying to help him get some of the Switch House, same Switch House crowd, you know, and we want to introduce him to him. So I bet that's a no-brainer, of course. Shit, never think twice. But you'd be, you'd be surprised how many people would say, nah, I don't want him opening up for me out of, hate or what they say kill the babies if they don't want the people coming after you because you don't want yeah. them to overshadow you or something yeah. like that but to me it was always uh this is something i cherish being a part of so it can't be end all with me you know it gotta because it didn't start with me so it gotta be so I, off top was like yeah yeah of course come in too it was like of course because we t ferris was both our boys me and come in this is one thing i say about t ferris man even through the whole thing of me and Kamina beefing before we was beefing, when we was beefing, after we was beefing, all of that, the whole time T. Ferris always kept it real. Him being real close with me, very close, like brotherly close with me, but also being cool with Kamina there, not being two-faced with either one of us in any way, not being fake in any way with either one of us, respecting that he is my brother, but this is somebody different, and him also seeing the bigger picture of one day y'all gonna be back cool and I need to some type of way lay some of the foundation so that when that day come. So he'd be doing things like telling come in uh, same thing. Like, man, I know you and Paul ain't getting along, but one day y'all gonna get back, man. You know, what just planting them type of seeds. So, man, you know, it just is, uh, it's, you know, looking back is something that, that it, 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 man, God put an angel, you know, in my life when he introduced me to T. Ferris. Cause hmm. he, man, he took me and said, hey, it, he would always tell me these things that man, I'm, I'm still you still you still go hard. I'm still fucking with you. And then he came to me one day and said, "Hey, bro, I talked to Watts. I talked to G Dash. We ain't trying to sign you, or we ain't trying to definitely ain't trying to put no pressure on you. But we just want you to know, the Switch House door is always open. If you ever want to come over here, rap on Switch House tapes." Sign as an artist, it's a label now, so if you want to come over as an artist, we'd love to have you. And Watts, G-Dash, they both feel the same exact way. And, you know, whatever you do, we all going to support, but the door, Switch House door is always open to you. Little did he know that's the only door in life I had open. Every other door was locked, jammed shut with an outer barrier, burglar mm. bars, alarms, sniper guard, everything, dogs in the front. That's, every other door was shut tight. And, you know, it was kind of like I didn't have nowhere else to go. Because the paid in full situation, what, something happened with the paid in full situation. Was it South by Southwest Wholesale? Was that closing and it affected y'all or something like that? Yeah. Southwest Wholesale was the distributor at the time. Kind of a lot of artists out there to kind of explain it. A lot of artists, you know, they know about Empire Records. Empire, not from the TV show. Empire, they put out digitally, they distribute, or not just digitally, but they distribute a large portion of hip hop music, especially independent artists. So a lot right. of people put out music through Empire. So that's kind of like what Southwest Wholesale was. They didn't put out all the independent music, but they put out a lot of the independent music and they handled the distribution and they were located right here on the north side in Houston. So they were a big part of the Houston rap scene cultivating and thriving. Uh, so uh, with that, when they went bankrupt, it was right after In Love With My Money came out, our album came out. We sold over 100,000 copies uh, of our album, 100,000 independently at $8 a piece. 
plus the money we making off of other you know every, man we had a big check coming to us but there's a clause in our contract as is in any contract of any artist out there pretty much it's a simple clause it's just you know whereas if uh, uh, uh if it's like an act of nature or if something happens or the, the company something goes beyond, bankrupt, your control. Yeah, beyond yeah. your control you can i can't go after the company for something they haven't been paid so this is how it works the the, uh, the distributor gives the music to the, the store you buy the music from the store the you know the money come back to the distributor 90 days later three months later they cut a check to the record label. The record label, do, record label, do their inventory and accounting. Then they give you a, a check. Sometimes ninety days later. Sometimes it's twice a year, four times a year, whatever, whatever it is, whatever. Usually it's not that often, but it's a trickle down thing. So, but Southwest Wholesale went bankrupt. We didn't get. We hadn't got our first check yet. So we hadn't got not one check yet from our hundred thousand plus to date. We sold like. 250 something I don't know what we sold today but at the uh that time we it was a hundred thousand plus so we was looking at like almost a million dollars now we wouldn't have each got a million dollars but we looking at a lot of money we would have made you know uh it wasn't there all of a sudden it just ain't there it's like you go to work and you got a check coming and they say hey sorry you're not getting a check this week what you mean I getting you just you just not it's not there it's, ain't there, yeah, it's not available yeah they bankrupt when they go bankrupt they absolved from having the responsibility of having to pay out what they owe so they don't pay the record label. The record label don't have to pay us. So technically, that was it. We didn't get paid. Man, I had it, old man. That's that's why I got love for him, man. I got love for him for a lot of reasons. But man, he said, man, you know what? Him and Cat Buff, they said, man, he said, man, you know what? Y'all worked so hard on this music. Y'all, you know, went out there, did your own, and we already we didn't we didn't have nothing to recoup because we came out our own pocket for shit. That's the worst part is that me and Kamina was investing in ourselves a lot. So this really was gonna be a nice. Yeah, we we didn't even get paid back what we invested. Yeah. Like damn. So well, man, man had was like, you know what? I'm gonna pay y'all out my personal account. So we, I never to date, I've never missed a paycheck from Matt Hatter from any royalties, from anything that's sold. You know, even whether he got paid for it or not. If it's sold, he paid me what I was owed. You know, and that. Man, who in their right mind would pay somebody? That's real, yeah. Did they, you know, like that? Like, so I just, man, I got a number of love for him. But he, he as well, you know, me and Camino went our separate ways. You know, he, I had love for him because of how he took care of us and took us under his wing and showed us a lot of the game and helped us a lot, you know. So, and he was my first person that gave me a record deal. So, like, of course, you know, it went, it went great for me. I loved it, you know. So, shit, I, it always meant something to me. So, but from there, T. Ferris telling me that and I'm coming to Switch House. I'm like, bet Matt Hattie used to always tell us too, hey, y'all color change and click, but y'all always Switch House, always Switch House. Y'all not no longer Switch House, and you now color change and click. Nah, that's you're always you Switch House for life. He used to always tell us that, man. You always Switch House for life. Don't ever run from that or hide from that, or like in a way like. Uh, 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 trying to like separate yourself from that or something like that, you know, like nah, nah, nah. At the end of the day, when the album came out, it said Paul Wong come in there of the switch house, house, not yeah. of the color changing click. That wasn't until way later where that type of stuff was coming out. So uh, me going back to the switch house was something that somebody I admired, respected, took care of me in ways that was unbelievable, instilled in me from day one. You always switch house. You always switch house. You always switch house. So when T. Ferris telling me that I ain't got no other choice. I bet I'm going to go over there, too. I go over there. It's like, shit, that's what's up. And it was me, Mike Jones, and Magnificent. That's it. And uh, that's when they were working on The Day Hell Broke Loose, too, uh, around that time. But this is when I started coming back in the mix doing freestyles. And I just, me and T. Ferris, we, we was already boys. We Like, me and T. Ferris was boys like this. Like, hey, man, you seen the game? Man, you seen what? So, 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 you seen the interception? Hey, bro, you seen? Hey, you seen who the Astros just signed? Hey, you know you saw this and that. Hey, man, you see that girl? Man, she fine. You know, we he was my boy, my homeboy. He wasn't like a rap associate. He was my friend, my personal friend, brother. You know, like that's what he was. So, me being signed to him, he was too. Like when when he trying to bring me to Switch House, my response was, "All right, I want to do it, but I want you to be my manager." He was like, nah, I don't know how to be your manager. I don't, I, ain't, I went to college, but not for management of artists. Yeah. You know, I don't know how to do that. I, he didn't want to fuck me up. He didn't want to fuck my career up, you know, or, or let me down or something. But I was like, I, I, at this point, I had never had a manager in my life ever once. I never had a manager. And I said, man, you know what? I don't, 
you know, I'm not worried about that. My concern is somebody I can trust, who believe in me, who have my best interest long term at heart. Not right now best interest, but somebody who long term, you got my best interest at heart, you believe in me, and you fuck with me, and I can trust you. That's the most important to me. And he had a great ear for music. He'd always come to me with. I was gonna say, talk about T. Ferris because he the one. He's the one who played a role in the in Steel Tipping, because Steel Tipping initially had Chameleon out on there and they had a different beat and all that, and yeah. that was on Dale, uh, Day Hair Broke Loose, right? Yeah. And T- then T. Ferris came to you with the beat, right? T. Ferris back in those days, he would be the one who, if Watts wasn't there, he'd be the one recording us in the studio. He'd be the one. That was it. He wasn't like. He would give his input. You know what I'm saying? But it wasn't like a controlling thing. He, you know, he let us do our own, what we do. We kind of took it different ways. I kind of followed his direction a lot more, whereas a lot of the other artists that would be around might be like, all right, I'm going to do it my way, though. You know, kind of mm-hmm. like that. Or I'd be like, all right, fuck it. I'm going to do my way and your way. If not on this, I'll do my way on another one. And I'll just, whatever, you know, whatever. So that's how it would be. Um, but he'd say, hey, I, hey, why don't y'all rap on this beat? Or... Hey, I got a good idea. This is producer. I think y'all sound real good. Cause whatever. He just had a good ear for music and he would think beyond just, all right, where's the beats? It'd be a he a thought out process of I, you know, I met somebody, I listened to their beats, and they do got some. I think you'd sound real good on here. And when you talk about this type of stuff in your raps, I think it'd sound good on here. And that, you know, he wouldn't like write a verse or nothing like that, but he'd say that, and that that's a lot of direction for you as an artist to come in. All right, what are we doing? I mean, it's producing. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And even when we'd be in the in the studio with the producer, he'd be in there like when, would break them off. It was okay when break them off came about. The beat you hear, uh, nah, I got slim thug work mm-hmm. wood wheel. Nah, I got to work my wood grain wheel. Yeah, nah, I got that was the original beat for break them off, and this is how this happened. T. Ferris said. Hey, Mr. Lee, we, we go to Mr. Lee's house every single day. He, he, he recorded stuff. He said, hey, I want to do a, a beat that got these like horns in it. Like boom, boom. Just some type of horns. Because I want it to be something that the, the, uh, the bands can play. And I, you know, in college and in high school. So I want something with some horns. Okay, so Mr. Lee came back with the wood grain wheel. And it was just the beat. And okay, when he had the beat, I had to, I, I at the time, as well as now, I got a library of my favorite various bars the little kiki said fat pat said big pokey said whoever just my favorite bars where i got them edited it's two seconds three seconds just this line or bar or whatever and because of where i one time i was just bored and i said man i'm gonna go through every freestyle i could find and cut out anything that i think might be substantial like to sample like wordplay wise not like a whole line but just a couple words here and there like that's like when I did um, They Don't Know, when we did They Don't Know, shout out to PT, Calvin Earl, Gridiron. When I, 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 a lot of people don't know I DJ'd the hook on there, but that's- I don't know shit. Yeah, I, I had, because yep, I, I had in my mind, I wanted to make a song about just all the Texas samples. Like in all my, fa- Texas motherfucker, that's where I stay. Houston is the home of the players and pimps. pimps. You know, all of that. Showing Nick it is in the great state, state of Texas. Texas. Just all the Houston yeah. or the Texas samples of artists you know so i just put it together and did it so will will Wood, Wood, grain wheel was like that when he came break him off was like that so he played the beat which is Wood grain wheel he played the beat t ferris like man the beat jamming but i wanted it to sound a little different though man it's just something about it i don't know it's just something and i'm all right I, I i'm getting my sample together i'm you know i'm djing so i go in there i dj the so, and then uh, original it went like this i'm gonna break them off real bad I'm gonna show him throwing up Deuce and Ron Slab. Now I got to work my wood grain wheel. It was both hooks oh, together. Oh, no shit. But I said, man, you know what? I think I need to separate them and make them two separate songs so that it can repeat. The four bars repeat and the other four bars repeat. So, it, okay, whatever. So this is along the lines of me figuring that out. T. Ferris saying, man, I wanna make a new beat, man. So Mr. Lee use all them same sounds, maybe the same drum pattern or some of the things, but make it a little different. And T. Ferris like, okay, go like this. Make it, make it go, and T. Mr. Lee, and it's just like a collaborative process. You know, it's, cause T. Ferris will be the first one to tell you, he don't barely know how to turn the power on. And he never <laughs> want credit or ask for credit at all. He's not gonna tell you, I produced, co-produced, I did nothing. He gonna say, man, I ain't do shit. They did it, I ain't do nothing. All I did was just, they asked, I gave my opinion, that's it. That's what he gonna do. He's not gonna claim no type of credit. But he was there saying, hey, make it go like this. Bum, bum, bum. 
and Mr. Lee doing it, and then Mr. Lee adding a little bit, bum, 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 you know, adding to it, and then they uh, going back and forth, and me just being there like, yep, no that's jamming. Shit. Yep, all that's jamming, everything jamming. So shit, they doing it. So originally it was a uh, break them off, and then the wood grain wheel, to me was, this gonna be the remix. We got break them off right here, we got the remix right here. That both beats sound very similar because they're all the same sounds, and both samples are the same sample. This one that I split in two, you know. So that was my view. But the way it happened is we did break them off. It came out, and then I guess I ain't put out the remix quick enough because <laughs> it came out. But it, shit, Slim killed that bitch, and to me, it's better that way because shit, that's me DJing on there. Even though I don't got credit for it, I'm not. You know, to me, it's not about that. It's about the contribution of it means something to me not that i get credited for it or any money at all i don't want none of that I, i'd sign off on that in a heartbeat even right now if whoever owned that well, but it's it's just about me knowing like i contributed to something to something who one of my he, he one of my he always been one of my favorite but yeah. shit, i can't think of another song i scratched on as a dj for slim thug so for me to have scratched on a song with DJ, you know, yeah, man, that's what's up. Now, even then, some of them times, there's other ones, I, other songs I done scratched on too, or samples that I done scratched in. A lot of times, I would always double back to Watts and say, hey, Watts, I got it how I want it to sound, but it didn't need that. And then I just can't get right. Can you? And he'd put his funk on it, it would just be, ooh. So, man, even the ones that I didn't scratch on, you know, shit, it ain't tell Watts come on there and put his touches, did it really sound legit? You know, it sound like what's up, but shit. It was, uh, you know, shit, it did have been a few others too, but that's, anyway, that's how, that's how Break Em Off came, because like I said, I got a whole library of samples of just various shit, but was, man, going back to what you were talking about though, with, with T. Ferris, you know, him being in there, when I come over there assigned as a, <clears throat> as an artist to the Swisher House, it would, a lot of times it'd be me and him in the studio, me, him, and Watts. But Watts moving and shaking, he DJing, he on the radio, he doing this and that. He got a family. He's a little older than us, so he had a family. You know, he had kids. You know, so it was like we was we didn't have that, so we could literally stay there twenty four seven, eight days straight without thinking twice. You know, and it was nothing because we didn't have nothing else to do. Shit, this is our dream anyway. Why not? You know, so a lot of times it'd be me and T. Ferris in there and we just would be talking and he'd just be giving like real advice, you know, on human being advice. But when it came to me signing, he was like, all right, working on Day Hell Broke Loose Part 2. I got a CD right here with all the beats we got. These are all the beats we bought. Uh, Sally Williams did most of the beats. Who, yeah, that's who did Still Tipping. He did Sin Sideways. He did Back Then They Didn't Want Me. Uh, he did a bunch of other beats too, but just those are the ones a lot of people know him from, you know, associated you know, with us. But he, um, okay, he, he said, uh, we got, it's about eight beats on there. Uh, pick any ones you like and rap on them. And I'm like, I'm hungry. I'm just happy I'm getting the opportunity to do what I love because everyone else in the world told me I ain't shit without coming in there. So let me just do anything. I'm just hungry to just to rap on anything. So I rap on every one. And I don't know what number still tipping was, but it was one, it wasn't the last one. It was probably like four, but I came back to it last. Like the little I like, man, what the fuck am I doing this? And I'm listening to it on a a little a little C D boom box, which, you know, it, it, you know, like the size of a pill, but it ain't sounding like no beach pill. Back in them days, there wasn't no bass in them. Yeah. You know, and, and I don't know if they if the beat got, you know, changed and I just heard the raw version or if it was just that bullshit ass boom box. But all I remember is do 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 do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do. Nothing else. So what the fuck I'm going to rap about on that? There ain't no other, there ain't no bass drums, no sounds at all. Just do-do-do-do-do-do-do, violin, and doom-do-do-doom. Thinking, what What am I going to first of all rap about? There ain't no sample, there ain't no steel tipping sample. It ain't nothing, it's just nothing. And I'm like, hey, T. Ferris, what am I doing this? And T. Ferris said, I don't know, it's just something about that beat. It just sound different. I just thought, man, maybe y'all might come up with something to it. So I don't know if you can't. Come That's up, crazy. If you can't come up with nothing, just freestyle. I said, bet. And me and Magno too. Magno did it because at the time, Mike Jones, all three of us was like, I don't know. T. Ferris might be tripping with this. <laughs> we didn't. The version we heard was very raw. You know what I'm saying? Like I said, I don't know if they changed it or 
It might just be the CD, but I'll be, I will admit, I wasn't feeling it. I didn't know what the fuck to do or rap about, talk about, or even how to rap on it. Because you can't even hear nothing, you know, but the do, 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 do. Okay. So Mike Jones was like, uh uh, I'm good. Next, me and Magnificent, like, all right, bet we'll get on it. And we both got on it. <clears throat> and it was just, I got a verse. Magnificent got a verse. No hook, nothing at all. Okay. Now, going back, at the same time, they just did. Still tipping the first version, which was with Big Time, the producer Big Time, excuse me, him and Watts, they were uh, doing something together in some type of way. They got into it or went their several ways, and basically Big Time took all the beats and Watts took the vocals, basically. Uh, that's basically what happened. And so the original Still Tipping was Slim Thug, Mike Jones, and Chameleon there. With still tipping hook that we you know that we know from the sample from his freestyle, um, okay. So anyway, at this time they already was looking for a new beat for still tipping, and I remember Watts um, and maybe G Dash, but I remember Watts being like, "Man, he, they wanted to use this uh, this Nutcracker beat because there was this other beat that had the Nutcracker." It was in a, it was a Nutcracker sample, and it was around Christmas time. So Watts was like, "Hey, it's Christmas time, you know, this is, they'll eat this up. We got to hit with this one. Let's use this beat." And uh, T. Ferris was just like, "Man, I don't know. It's something about this other beat with this violin." And you know, he kind of made it all happen, put it together, and even then, still was like, "I wasn't expecting it." Till one day he said, "I got a surprise for you." I'm like, "All right, bet." And he pulled up and said, I'm going to let you hear something. And he pushed play and let me hear it. And he's just smiling, bobbing his head, smiling. I got the last verse. And he's just smiling. So I'm just feeling kind of sad because he's hearing it. And I hear the beat, okay? And I know, damn, that's the beat I already rapped on. But I also hear Slim Thug and Mike Jones rapping, still tipping, and hearing the hook. And so I'm putting two and two together. Okay, they put still tipping on this beat. And I'm thinking he just letting me hear Cause he telling me, hey, I got this is what he tell me, hey, I got a surprise for you. I'm gonna let you hear the new hit. This is gonna be the new hit we're gonna push. This is gonna be the new switch house hit. This is gonna be a single. This is gonna blow us. This is gonna put a switch house, like take us to another level. This so thing. he knew it back then. He, he knew, but this he didn't tell me I was on the song. He just telling me this is the new hit. All right, bet he pull up and then he played the song. And I'm I'm interpreting it as, oh, you used that beat I rapped on for the still tipping beat. Cause I knew what was going on with still tipping, too, where they trying to find a new beat for it. And I'm just thinking, damn. I got took off the song, damn, shit, this bitch is down, but damn, I wish I was on that bitch, man, fuck. And then next thing you know, my verse come on, and me thinking, oh, shit, I'm on that song. And he's like, yeah, fool, you think I'm gonna let you hear the song? You ain't gonna make all this big deal, I ain't gonna put you on some man, yeah, man, you on it, man, what? <laughs> but yeah, I remember, but even then, it's crazy, because the original Still Tipping, and the Still Tipping that we know, like with me on it, and uh, you know the, the Mike Jones version from his album and Day Earl Broke Loose Part Two, that version it, they different tempos. So that was you know Watts was like, man, they don't even go on that. This is slower tempo. We got to slow the vocals down. But T. Vera was like, well, yeah, but you know when you slow it down, that you know, screw the vocals down. Yeah, you gonna screw them up anyway. So they kind of give it that feel. And it, it true enough, it worked perfect. Shit, but it's crazy that I'm the only one that rapped on that beat. They, you know, they flew them in, but I rapped to the beat. But even then, it was like, a, all right, we can't have four people on it, so who are we going to put on it? And Kamina, we can't have five people on it, so who are we going to take? Kamina, Slim Thug, Mike Jones, Paul Wall, Magnificent. We can't have five. We can't have four. We're going to have three. Slim Thug got to be on it. It's his, it's his sample for the hook. And he wrecked the motherfucker. Mm -hmm. He ain't taking him off anyway. And Mike Jones wrecked it too, so then from there it was, uh, all right, well, Paul Wall, Magnificent, it was a business decision from there. Paul Wall, Comedian that signed with Switch House, Comedian that not signed with Switch House. We're going to put our own artists on it so that we, we got two of our own artists on it and featuring Slim Thug instead of two non featured two featuring artists and one Switch House artist because they was going to push it as a radio single. So that was the whole purpose of it. So then it came down to who's going to be on the Mia Magnificent and shit, I just, man, I just wrecked that bitch. Shit, and they, they put it on, you know, they kept me on it. Thank God, shit. Cause that for shit show changed. That changed everything. everything yeah. Shit. Yeah. Video wise too, that's the first time we had a video on BT Uncut. Yeah. Ooh -wee. Still tipping is a classic uncut video, man. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, so, man, okay. So talk about, uh, I mean, after that, it's like, all right, now it's time to work on a solo album. Yeah. So you do, uh, you working on People's Champ. Talk about that. That whole time, well, even amongst that time, this is right, I was signed, it was kind of weird because me and Camino was our separate ways. Due to time, my contract was up with Payton Full. We had a deal with Payton Full where we did a five-album deal, me and Camino, five albums. It was going to be... Uh, Two Power on Camino albums. It was gonna be a solo album from me, a solo album from him. Then it was gonna be a Water Boys album with me, Camino, Fifty Fifty, and Lou Hawk. Okay. We only did one album. Get your mind correct. That was it. Then we separate ways. So I felt even and there's a it was a clause that was you know if a certain time passes and you don't put them out it's we free and clear or whatever. So you can kind of wait out your contract. But nobody want to sit out five, six years, you know. And I remember, rest in peace with Cricket, he used to always tell me, hey, bro, it's been a long time since you put something out, bro. And love of my money ain't going to be hot forever, bro. You got to put something. You got to keep your name hot. You got to keep putting shit out. And he, he really, I never forgot it, him telling me that, you know. And um, that's when I used to do a lot of uh, party promoting, and we'd run commercials on the radio. Me and Goo used to throw parties and shit. But, um, but anyway, uh, so it... We um, I felt like we owed him five albums. We only gave him one. Get your mind correct. I felt like I can't give you four more albums, and I don't really want to. He Matt Hatter too was kind of like almost almost done because he's full time radio. He didn't care about rapping. He's doing full time radio, so he didn't really care about being a record label. And he never really was like in it to be a CEO record label, out signing artists, this and that, discovering artists. He only formed a record label to put his own self out. You know what I'm saying? Kind of same way I got all the mob. I only started all the mob so that I could put my own music out the way I want to without someone else trying to tell me, hey, put this kind of music out because it sell more music. You know, no, nah, I want to put out what I want to put out for all the reasons that I want to put it out, you know? And so anyway, that's, I just felt like he kept it real with us and paid us when he didn't have to, when Southwest, went, Southwest Wholesale went bankrupt. Man, Matt had, let me keep it real with you. I, I was already signed to the Switch House. This is, I just signed a deal. I signed a deal. And I went to I went to them too as well to say, hey, you cool with me doing this? This is what I want to do. This is kind of like, well, actually, I, I, when I say I, I was already signed, this was like kind of like, all right, I'm going to sign, but let me do this to make it right with them. And they was cool with it because, for one, it showed you that if it come down the line with me and them, I'm going to uphold my it. end with yeah. them too. You know, so, and as well, they saw that, me putting anything out with Matt Hatter, anything, period, is only going to help, or not even just with Matt Hatter, but only with him because he do good business. You know, he handle his business. But he, um, from, so I, I came to him, I said, Hatter, look, man, watch, I just signed with Watch and G-Dash, and they cool with this. Look, I want to do an album with you first, because I was already, me and Kamina was working on solo albums with Payton Fool already anyway. So I already had half an album over there anyway. Done. This is the Chic Magnet album. This is the yeah. Chic Magnet. The other half I was recording on my own at the Gridiron with Pretty Todd. So in, in Calvin. So um, Calvin Earl. So <clears throat> one time, one day, Matt had a met me over here at uh, man, as a uh, man. Actually, you know what? To be honest, now that I'm actually kind of went a little different. They had a contract there with me, and they telling me, and I'm asking them, is it all good? I called Watts, I mean, I called Matt Hatter over there to the gridiron, and he came over there. He sat down there with me, with me in his bins. I sat there and kept it real with him, how I felt about what me and Kamina had going on. At the time, Kamina had a studio right right there where Peyton Fool Studio was, right above it, or like around the corner, right the same building. So if I ever, any time went to the studio of Peyton Fool, I was always going to see Kamina. Now, if I'm going over there to create art, I don't want to be running into every single time somebody that I'm not getting along with or that I'm getting into it with. I don't even want to think that that might even cross my mind. I'm trying to go in another direction. So I kept, I told him straight up, man, there is no way I could even possibly come over there and do nothing with you going further when it comes to recording over there because I'm not trying to run into comedian and get into it with him or nothing like this. or what. I'm not trying to go there. So let me, the way to keep it healthy long term right now is just for me to whatever. I know my contract is up with you. But... I got music over there I've been working on, and I got music here I've been working on. Come in here and check this music out. He came in there, he checking the music out, and he was kind of surprised, because I was kind of giving him a presentation. And he was kind of surprised because he wasn't expecting it. 
And I was like, man, this is what I propose. Man, let me put out my album with you, Chick Magnet, just so that I can feel like I'm living up to some part of my end of the bargain. Watson G, that's cool. I'm going to sign with them. I'm, so basically, I'm signing with them, but they cool with me doing this with you, making right with you. So I'm not going to give you, and he was, like, he was like, man, I ain't trying to put this out just to put it out. And I'm like, nah, if it got my name attached, I'm going to put my all into it. I'm going to get my, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to promote the fuck out of it. I'm going to try my best to put a good album together. You know, it's my first ever solo album, so what the fuck do I know what I'm doing? And I'm, you know, there ain't no A&R or nothing like that, so what the fuck you, what do I know what I'm doing? You know, but I, I tried my, my best. I really did. And shit, we put it out. We sold a shitload of music, and it did work. But that was kind of like my way of kind of, at least thinking and thinking he might not had him might not have gave a fuck. Had him might have been doing me a favor just by putting that out anyway, to be real. Yeah. But in my mind, I felt like I gotta do right by you at least some way, even if I'm up due to contracts. And then we put out controversy sales as well. And then that's when and since he let me put out I mean, since you know we did Chick Magnet, they don't know what's on Chick Magnet at first. And that's how I ended up on People's Champ too, because it kinda had ran its course in Texas on the radio, but when we were signed, they loved it. All the people at, what you call it, you know, Asylum and Atlantic, they was like, hey, this need to be your next single. And I'm like, nah, it already didn't been played out in Texas. Played out. So it's like they played the fuck out of it. So they're not going to play it again like that. Like, so, we, But they just was like, nah, we need it nationally so that we can show the nation what's going on in Texas. So I'm like, all right, whatever. Y'all know what y'all doing. I don't. So shit, bet. And it was a big hit nationally too for us too. They don't know, but that's why it was on the Chick Magnet and it was on uh, the People's Champ. But I was all, that's why I also I was very adamant of I gotta remix it some type of way. It can't be the same. So I did a, another verse at the end, and Bum B did a you know him and Mike Jones split a verse. Mm -hmm. And y'all did the video and all that. Yeah, the video for it. Mm -hmm. So man, talk about um, talk about sitting sideways, man. Did T. Ferris pick that track? Yep, that was one of the Sally tracks. Yeah. Um, you know, did he going forward? He had picked where he had a bunch of them. You know, um, you know, he had that, a couple others. He had uh, um, chunk of the deuce, but originally chunk of the deuce was a uh, it was a Twilight Zone no 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 sample hmm. that we couldn't get cleared, so they had to remake it, and they remade it. Mr. Lee, re you know, Miss Lee made the original. But we couldn't get it cleared. He made the, you know, the one you hear now, but we couldn't get it done quick enough. So that's why that one wasn't on. Um, I think that was supposed to be on Get Money, Stay True, though. Um, but anyway, they uh, with, with the People's Champ album it was sitting side. There's a few of them on there that was like <clears throat> that he had picked from Sali. And at the time, it was other ones like he had back then. They didn't want me for Mike Jones. And I remember Mike Jones was like, nah. Mike Jones had his own ideas, the direction he wanted to go. You know what I'm saying? Like a lot of artists, a lot of, this is something I learned. A lot of artists, they think they know what they're doing. You know what I'm saying? They and that's why Shit. you got producers, yeah. and that's why yeah. more artists yeah. use producers, yeah. man. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm quick to tell you, man, my whole show set is mostly songs I was not feeling when I wrote them. So I'm quick to tell you, I don't know what I'm doing all the time, you know, but anyway, not saying that Mike Jones don't know what he's doing, but we're talking about Mike Jones, he had his own way he wanted to do stuff. He had his own kind of style of music he wanted to make. He had his own type of songs, his own themes of songs. He had his own producers he wanted to work with. Even when he worked with these producers, he had his own style. Like, man, I you know, I don't, I ain't trying to tell all his none of these people's stories, you know what I'm saying? But I remember seeing him, and this is how I met Kanye West. This is how I met a, a, a couple producers was because Mike Jones got a beat from them and then ended up not using the beat. And then I'll bump into the producer and they'll be like, what happened? Why he ain't use the beat? And I'd be like, I don't know. I thought it was jamming too. Shit. But it'd be because, at least as far as I know, you ask Mike Jones, he might have a different perspective of why or whatever. But from what I saw, it was uh, Kanye made him a beat. He wanted a, this kind of Kanye beat. Kanye gave him a this kind of beat. And instead of communicating that, he just was like, yeah, yeah, I'm gonna use it, and then didn't use it. Mm. Same with Nanny Fresh, Jazzy Faye, Swiss Beats. We in the studio with Swiss Beats in New York. Oh, man, this is like, man, I got like, man, maybe three or, you know, maybe a handful of hip hop regrets, you know what I'm saying? But this is like one of my main regrets, bro. We was in the studio 
New York right after shortly after Steel Tipping come out before Sin Sideways or maybe right after Sin Sideways, but definitely before our albums because we were in the studio. It was Mike Jones' studio session to work with Swiss Beats. And Joey IE set it up and he said, hey, I got a studio session. It's late, it's after the club, but we got Swiss Beats for a studio. Can you come, Mike Jones? Mike Jones said, bet, I'm, I can do it. I'm gonna come. And I'm like, oh shit, because this is just like a domino of one by one, any producer you dream to work with, you like are meeting or you getting to work with them or Mike Jones getting to work with them or Slim Thug or Chameleon. But these are people like- Y'all really in the game now. Yeah, yeah. we like, wow. So it's like, shit, enjoy. I, I'm like, man, can I come? And Joey, I saying, hey, you can come, but it's Mike Stetson. And him kind of, the same way I'm looking is how he's looking at me. So I'm taking it like as a, okay, what did that mean? You know, like, okay. And he's just like, all right, you can come, but it's just chill. If Mike wants you on the song, so I'm not knowing what's going on, if it's something that is coming from, we were on, we were on Asylum, but I was on Atlantic Asylum, he was on Warner Brothers Asylum. How did y'all get split up like that? Because that's how Asylum was. Asylum was an incubator label for Warner Brothers, Atlantic, and Elektra. Then Elektra and I think Warner, or one of them, I don't know, they merged. And, but anyway, it was like, they were, it was a sister company, so it was the same company, basically. <clears throat> but different Asylum, divisions, yeah, 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 yeah. Asylum was like the G League, kind of. Yeah. And if you make it in the G League, you get drafted. But, it, you know, and if you're struggling in the NBA, they might see you down to the G League or whatever, you know, whatever. But it's basically like this what it was. It was like, you know, the, the minor league. So, but we came to Asylum off top. Off top, we came, and they was like, hey, you coming to the minors, but we drafting you immediately. And you starting in the majors on opening day, you gonna start. Yeah, y'all so, were the first ones to really come out on sound. Like I remember y'all right. and like Webby and like all right, them. Right, yeah, right, right. And that was a, a lot of us even being on Asylum was doing pack in part to uh, Jay Prince making it happen because mm. they were trying to do a rap a lot deal, and Jay Prince was like, "Hey, these hot, they the hottest coming out of our city, or they maybe they they hot coming out of our city, uh, you know." They need a deal. You need to sign them, and we ain't, I ain't doing my deal unless you sign them. Hmm. He basically, basically, that's basically what he did. That was real. He, yeah. They signed us, and he yeah. also made sure they didn't screw us. Like he talk, if you listen to Jay Prince's book, he do talk about it a little bit, and you know he definitely knew more about the game with experience. It was something he was saying. He was telling Swisher House to do, and yeah. that y'all didn't make the right, decision. Right. It well, ended up not really working it out. Ain't y'all? Like because I was an artist, yeah. not a you know, but. I wouldn't know what the fuck I'm doing one way or another anyway, so <laughs> shit, I yeah. probably would have fucked it up way worse if I wasn't the one making the decision. But I was just an artist on the label. I wasn't the one making the decision anyway. But even then, I don't know, I saw the benefit of him making sure we was protected, you know, even just uh, business-wise protected. Like, that's what it was. It was a sign them, you better not fuck them over. Kinda, yeah. You know, and so he took care of us within the industry to make sure you know, it's, we didn't get uh, ate up by the wolves, sharks, and snakes, you know, because they there. Um, but whatever he did, I don't know, I always saw it as a, shit, we got Jay Prince watching our back. Shit, Straight. whatever he say to do, yeah. it worked for him, why wouldn't it work for us? You know, uh, I don't know, but I was never part of any of them conversations, so I don't know what he told who to what. Yeah, no, I just remember in his book he had talked about it. Yeah, yeah, I, I just remember hearing it too. Details, like, but he was saying. He, he, when I heard it, I was like, oh, well, I don't know what was going on in none of them conversations anyway, because I was an artist, not a CEO anyway. But yeah. this is something too that, man, a lot of us are artists slash CEOs by default because we don't get signed to a label and we don't want somebody bossing us around telling us what to do. We want to do it on our own, so we do it ourselves. But just because we do it ourselves, that don't necessarily mean we are CEO inclined or we know what we're doing as a CEO. You know what I'm saying? But a lot of times success can mask that because you could be successful and oh, I must be doing it right. I'm successful, you know, where that might not be the, the reason for the success. But shit, I don't know. I just, I don't know. I didn't, I never at any point, even to this day, don't want to be a CEO. I want to be an artist. I want to make art. I'm good at marketing and seeing other sides of the game and some type of mentorship, leading hand, you know, helping this. And, but my heart is being an artist, you know. So I'm only self-CEO by default because this is the easiest way I can do the type of art I want to do how I want to. But, you know, hey, at the time, it's a, hey, I want to be an artist. G-Dash, Michael Watts, Mike Clark, T. Ferris, y'all the ones making the decision. Anybody on Asylum, Todd Moskowitz, Joey High E, 
Ron Spalding, you know, Jay Grand, they helping us and anybody else on Atlantic or Warner Brothers. Hey, I'm kind of almost going blindly, but at the same time, skeptical because you hear about everybody fucking everybody over and being sharks, but just not really knowing. At the end of the day, I was just in it for the ride. Like, a, shit, I'm this. I can't believe it's real. So whatever I'm doing, yeah. I just do my best and be use it as a stepping stone. Also, I I was blessed to say this, man. I'm, I'm very blessed as an artist to be signed to CEOs or presidents or record labels who looked out for me, cared for me personally, who cared about my future as an artist, as a human being, as a family member, as a member of society and community. Uh, you know, so they weren't, I, I've been blessed not to been signed to anybody who fucked me over or screwed me over or took me down the wrong path. I thank you, shout out to G Dash, Michael Wise, shout out to Big Cat, Mad Hatter, and, <clears throat> and everybody else who ever, you know, big bro me and yeah. really took me under their wing. Yeah. So you get in, talk about it, because you started talking about it, and I mean, I, I yeah, kind of know, know I, but... I talk my ass off. Nah, it's cool. Talk about uh, uh, the the Kanye thing, how you at the event with uh, with Kanye, and he came oh, yeah. in and started freestyling. We saw, we with it, it was for King Magazine, if uh, you know this, if people remember, that's when they used to be fat asses all on, you know, oh, yeah. in front of the cover. Uh, that's so... Uh, they, they, you know, they they had good articles too. You know, what I'm saying <laughs> they had good articles too. They uh, they did an article one time of all the coming kings, the upcoming kings, and it was like you know the upcoming entrepreneur, upcoming author, up, upcoming CEO. You know, Common was there as an actor. There was a basketball player, 17, about to get drafted to the NBA. I, you know, I was there as an entrepreneur selling grills. It was you know. Kanye West was there as a CEO for good music, um, you know. So it was just the up, upcoming talent in the in, you know around the different industries of the world, and it's an industry mixture. It was very industry too, but it was a lot of dope people there. But it was very industry kind of uptight a little bit. It just was the vibe of it, you know, just how it was at the time. And Kanye West come in out of nowhere, and he wasn't you know Kanye West that we know now but he still was Kanye West you know what I'm saying when Jordan won the dunk contest he didn't have six titles but we all knew he still was yeah he was the one coat. though he was yeah. Jordan so it was yeah. the same thing but you know he come in out of nowhere he just mob in there and he say man it's a hip-hop event with a hip-hop man ain't no cypher going on I don't see nobody cutting and scratching <laughs> what kind of hip-hop is this <laughs> I and he just bust out. Hey, put on a beat, and whoever was DJing was uh, whoever was the coming king as a DJ. Came went over there to D, I guess went over there and DJ put on a beat. He just bust out a freestyle, and then everybody just like, man, that's what's up. And then he like, man, who ain't that's it? And I'm, man, y'all ain't hip hop, man. Who ain't nobody gonna come behind me? And I'm, you know, I'm like, and I said, oh, I'm from H Town, boy. You can't call me out on the mic freestyle. I think I ain't gonna come. Come on, I just bust a kick around. You know, like any real true MC would, just kick around and that's it. And then from there, the ice got broke. Everybody started kind of, you know, coming. But I think, you know, for sure, I dropped some, you know, bars. It was off the top of the head, whatever I said. And, you know, but I, you could see, you could tell, you know, respect uh, or earning someone's respect. And I could see kind of Kanye, you know, looking at me. And then he, from there, so, you know, I could see, you know, just the, the respect. And then he, he say, yeah, I'm, you know, I, I met your boy Mike Jones, you know, but I guess real sarcastic. I guess my beats ain't good enough, you know, he ain't use them, you know. And I already know the stories because every other producer done told me I was there with Swiss Beats, you know. I didn't see, you know, it's just whatever reason, he chose not to use the song. Of that so producer. the Swiss Beats oh, thing, what happened? Did he not show up for the session or did y'all, or did it just not with go away? Swiss Beats, when he, he just, I don't know, we went in there to the studio. It's me, Mike, Swiss Beats, Joy IE is all for us. Swiss Beats trying to get a vibe going. It's late at night, maybe 3, 4 in the morning. I'm hyped. Everybody else somewhat sleepy, maybe a little bit. You know, um, every beat he put on, I'm getting hyped too. And it's just, and Mike just like, I don't know. He just, Mike couldn't catch the vibe he wanted or what, I don't know. And it just kind of, at some point, got to the point where it was like. We just ain't here wasting time. I, well, now nah, it was, uh, I, could, I already kind of knew from the conversation me and Joy IE, it was like, hey, I'm, I'm kind of getting in the way by being too hyped. You know, I'm too eager to rap on this shit, and I'm just too excited. Considering that he's ain't really, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. even then at the time, man, all love and respect to Mike Jones, man, he, at the time, it was a little com competitive, you know, so he wanted to do his thing. I I was a little bit more of a team player, um, but coming off of the heels of me coming out being teammates and then going our separate ways, I also was like, I ain't mad at doing my own thing, you know, um, but, 
you know, it just was for sure though. It was like a, like Joey, he told me from day from the jump, it was this is Mike's song. It's not my song. It's Mike's song. If Mike say, "Hey, you want to get on it?" Then I can get on it. But it ain't even my place really to ask, "Can I get on it?" So that was kind of understood to me going there. I'm only there as a fly on the wall, and it really was only so he could introduce me to Swiss Beats. And he said Swiss Beats fuck with me. You know, he, he said Swiss Beats fuck with both of us. So, mm -hmm. you know, and we get there, we meet him, Swiss Beats, cool as a fan, real as fuck. He got one of his homeboys passed out on the couch drunk or just <laughs> passed out on the couch. So I didn't, I didn't know, I didn't catch his name. But we go in there, whatever. I'm getting hype. Mike Jones not getting hype. Joey, I give me that eye like, hey, man, go away in the lobby. And I go in the, you know, lobby room, game room, whatever. Yeah, I'm sitting on the couch where Swiss Beats homeboy drunk, and I'm just sitting there chilling, just still excited about the moment of just being man, there. In New York City, yeah. man, see the studio with Swiss Beats. Oh my God, shit, just I can't believe it. I just met Swiss Beats, and he told me he fuck with me, even if he was just bullshitting. Still, like just to hear it come from Swiss Beats, yeah, that. yeah, he yeah. Be like, oh, yeah. nice to meet you. Or you can say what's well, so what else? But then not the next thing you know, Swiss Beats homeboy kind of come to. And he look at me and he like, Paul Wall? And I said, yeah, what's up? And he was like, are you Paul Wall for real? And I was like, yeah. He was like, nah. He was like, I'm, I'm fucked up right now. I, I, was doing, I just was drinking a lot and I'm drunk right now. I'm just like, am I drunk or are you Paul Wall? And I'm like, yeah, I'm Paul Wall. And he just was like, hey, man, you know what? And I was like, what's your name? And he's like, I'm not going to tell you because I'm drunk and I don't want you to. I still to this day don't know who it was. But he was like, I don't, I don't want you to ever remember me being drunk. I'll meet you later, and you know, and you ain't gonna. I ain't gonna tell you then it was me either. But I'll meet you later, and you'll meet you. But right now, I'm not telling you my name because I'm drunk, and I don't want that to reflect on how you whatever. And he just was like, "Hey, who, who, who what you doing here?" And I'm like, "Oh yeah, I'm. We in here, Mike Jones in the recording." He's like, "Why you ain't in the recording too?" And I'm like, "Well, it's Mike's session. It ain't mine." And I'm kind of getting in the way, you know. I'm just, you know, I'm just, I'm just chilling, waiting for it to be over. I guess, you know. And he's like, oh, well, shit. Hey, me and Swiss fuck with you. Swiss fuck with you. We fuck with you. And I'm like, for real? And he's like, nah, I'm not riding your dick. I'm gassing you. Nah, he fuck with you. Swiss really do fuck with you. And I was just like, damn, no shit. Like, and he just was just telling me like a little bit of different verses or this or that here and there, just telling me. He really was up on this shit, yeah. yeah. Was, and I'm like, damn. And I'm just like, shit. Man, what's your name, man? I need to holler. I need to get with y'all, man. Shit, I'm trying to fuck with Swiss. What's up? Shit. But at the same time, thinking, okay, well, you know, it's, I'll fuck with Swiss later because I'm not supposed to do none of this anyway. I'm just barely even supposed to be here. So yeah. and then we go our separate ways, and that's it. And then no Swiss beat song come out with Mike Jones ever. But I don't know. For all I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't know. Mike Jones probably got his own side of the story. They might have been. You know, it might have been a million dollar beat for all right, I know. Right, or right, right. It might not have been the vibe he wanted. Or, you know, some artists are very picky about their shit. I've learned that my way ain't always the right way. So let me not be as picky when it comes to these type of decisions. But I don't know. Whatever reason, he went in the studio and got beats from all these people, but didn't end up using them at the time for whatever reason. But um, so, so, the, so with the, with the Kanye thing, though. Okay. That was the, that was the main. Uh, on, that was a, so he was he was saying he was telling you that, that the same thing happened again. Yeah. So now y'all getting ready to. And yeah. I'm I'm like, hey, I didn't heard that from other people. I kind of name drop a couple people that didn't, they had the same similar experience. Uh, they hype about producing for Mike Jones and him saying, yeah, it's gonna be my new single. It's gonna be my next single. Gonna be my next single. Gonna be my next single. And then he don't even use the song or the song come out with a different beat. And they like, what? We it'd be the same right now as if. Lizzo or Beyonce or Sauce Walker or Travis Scott called you and say, Don Houston, I need you to produce my next single. It's going to be, man, it's going to be a hit. We're gonna, video going to be number one. We're going to get sponsored this and that. It's going to win the Grammy. I need you to produce it. All right, bet. And then you do it. And then the song come out. And it's got a whole nother beat under it. And you're like, wait yeah. a minute. Ain't that the song? What? Yeah. yeah. You'd be like, what the fuck? You know, but like I said, I'm only telling it from my perspective. So with all love, respect to Mike Jones, man, this was my, this is how I saw what was going on. So I'm, I really am curious as to wondering, like, why wouldn't you using these people? Because I, in a heartbeat, would have used all of their beats. Yeah. You know, even then, it wasn't, okay, the me and Camille in mind frame of staying in the budget, that was independent. When we was on the major, my mind frame was way different. It was use their budget to parlay a long-term career. So I'm down to spend a million dollars to get a beat from somebody so that I can have this hit 
for life to yeah. perform. Yeah. I'm down, you know, to do even if that means I never get a royalty check from this album because I'm gonna be recouping for life. All right, I'm gonna get it. Open up other opportunities, right, yeah. And I'm gonna make my money from the independent albums, and that's basically how it worked. And I made my money from performing, doing shows, or doing features, and it wasn't really from royalties from albums it was from publishing but not royalties from the albums because we was using that money to get producers or this or that or because that's that i don't know so i'm curious as to hear mike jones side of it if he even has a side he might not he might just be like oh i didn't like the beats and that could be as simple as it was you know but i don't know i remember that and then i'm meeting kanye and he like I, I, you know, I earn his respect, at least as an MC, at least off top that I'm not scared to kick a flow, you know, not saying that I kicked the flow and immediately it was like, oh, now I'm in the club, but at least he know I ain't scared to kick a flow and I'm about what I'm about and I was kicking bars, but then he, you know, he tell me, yeah, man, I, you know, real sarcastically, man, like, man, you know, I, I, I went in the studio with your boy Mike Jones and, uh, you know, I guess he, my beats ain't good enough, I mean, you know, maybe I'll, I'll work, tell him I'll work harder and maybe next album, maybe I can make the cut next album. And I, I remember, I already remember hearing about the, this whole Kanye situation from T. Ferris and Mike Jones telling me that we went in and it just, whatever we didn't, but it was because I, I, him specifically with Kanye was, he gave Mike Jones a beat. Mike Jones wanted a soul sample, like through the wire, one of them kind of beats. Mm. And he gave him a beat like maybe drive slow. Hmm. Both jamming, but different kind of beats. Drive slow is not a soul sample. It's a sample, but it's not a soul sample. And it's singing on it, but that ain't that's, that's Tony Williams. That ain't just that ain't the uh, uh, sample. But anyway, instead of Mike Jones, this is and I'm only saying this to advice to any artist out there. Speak your mind. If you in there with anybody, me, whatever, who ain't, any artist you with, period. If you doing a song with them, tell them what you want. When I did grills, Nelly say. I'm like, man, what, what you want me to do? I want you to come in there. What it do, baby? It's power, wow, baby. What oh, he it told do, you that. No he shit. tell me that. So that's why I say, what it do? It's, baby, it's the ice man, power, wow. I said, because he, he said, just like that, I want you to say, what it do, baby? It's power, wow, baby. And I just took the, what it do, baby, added the, it's the ice man, power, wow. It didn't say, baby, at, at, you know, shit. Yeah, yeah. So don't be scared to tell an artist you working with or a producer that this is what I'm looking for. You know, unless you open for whatever. But if it's something you particularly want and you working with this person because, hey, they got this song like this. I love this song when you do this. I want something that kind of got that vibe. Don't be scared to tell them because you might end up coming out and the song ain't going to be how you want it. Then that might be the only song you ever get to do with that person. You know, uh, you know, uh, Cause, it, cause I mean that's that's kind of what happened with this. Cause you did you did the verse right, and that was kind of a it was a leftover verse from Steel Tipping, right? right? I mean, I Steel Tipping from uh, Sitting Sideways. So right, so speed it up a little bit for Kanye. I meet Kanye. We talk about this. I tell him, "Hey man, I apologize. I don't know why he didn't use your beat. I love you. I would love to use your beats. You got some beats I can do. Can I work with you? Whatever. Anyway, we got to be." A little cool here and there. He ended up getting grills. That day, he ended up getting some grills from me. You know, um, Don C, we kept in contact. You know, we had a, a few mutual friends, too, within the industry and from Chicago and just whatever. We just was cool. Um, little by little, Plain Pat, who was his – Plain Pat was Kanye's A&R, and he had tried to sign me as a solo artist to Def Jam, but it didn't work out. The people over him didn't want to sign me. It's all good. Um, we kept in contact, though. He's one of the few people that I kept cool with who they tried to sign me, but him and Salim, they like, the, you know, everybody else who tried to sign me, once they don't sign me, they, a lot of times they don't really fuck with you no more. But Salim always fuck with me, even though he tried to sign us back in the day, we didn't sign. And, uh, you know, my boy, he he always, he tried to, you know, playing Pat, he, he he tried to sign me, didn't work out, he still fuck with me. He say, hey, I'm a on Kanye album. He told me he met you, man. He say, fuck with you, man. I, I asked him, he got this beat, it's just a beat laying around. Would you be down to do a verse on it? You know, he said he down with, he fuck with you, you know, um, but if he don't fuck with the verse, he's not going to use it. So come with it. And, uh, you know, we might not even use the song, whatever. Just do something, send it back, and we'll see you. I'm like, all right. Okay. I go in the studio, and I say, off, and this was, and I go in there and lay the verse you hear, the drive slow verse. Now, where that verse came from, was when I did Sin Sideways, when I originally did Sin Sideways, when I wrote Sin Sideways. The first version of Sin Sideways was Sin Sideways with me, Big Pokey, and Lil Kiki. 
Big Pokey was on the hook and he had a verse and Lil Kiki had a verse. Okay. Asylum, Atlantic Records, they was like off top. You signed to us, Paul Wall. Lil Kiki not signed to us. Big Pokey not signed to us. We can't promote. Like, it's, you can't do that. It's like uh, unprecedented to. We can't put out a song that is our single of our. Uh, you're our this is your first single, major single. We can't put it out featuring two unknown artists, unknown, where well, they might be known underground or in Houston like that, or, because this is what I didn't get, because I'm like, how you, how you say they unknown? Everybody know Lil Kiki and Big Pokey, especially anybody that know me know them, you know, for sure. But they was like, nah, 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 they unknown in terms of major record label releases. Neither one of them have any major record label releases. They're all independent. So you can't put two independent artists that's not signed to us or signed to anybody on a song. It's unprecedented. We'll let you put one. So I'm like, man, ah, this is my two favorite artists. How, what, what you? That's like you got a song with Biggie and Pac, and you got to take, take one off. So it's like, what, what am I going to do? So what we did was, since Big Pokey was on the, the sample for the hook, we kept his verse for the uh, on the song. And um, Lil Kiki, we took off, and we was like, all right, we're going to use it as a remix. When we do a remix, it's going to be... Uh, this is going to be the verse. But at the time, Sin Sideways, it was Lil Kiki had a verse, Big Pokey had a verse, and I had a verse. The verse I did, I went in there. I, this is how I used to write rhymes back in the day. I didn't change a lot. But back in the days, even now I got a real hyperactive mind where I'm constantly thinking, distracted, thinking about shit. You ask me a question, I talk. I answer 10 other questions you didn't even ask me. You know, and then come, <laughs> then come back and answer the question you asked me. You know, it's just crazy. So I used to get the tempo to a beat, get a, one line, which was always what it do is Paul Wall, and from there it was, and I would start it with that, always because I'm trying to say my name, so if you know anything, you know my name. If you turn it from there, you heard my name, bam, you heard my name, promotion, because this is, when you are artist, you're trying to get heard, you want people to hear you, recognize you, know your name, you know, you want, you're trying to establish that, so anyway. I answer, you know, I come on every verse, what it do is Paul Wall, and then say something else. And whatever I said, that would be my tempo. And I'd catch that tempo, what it do is Paul Wall would be. And uh, Denali, I'm an expert in dishes. You know, I ride on deep dishes, I'm an expert in pottery. Mm. Okay, that's the vibe. I go to the bathroom, other room, turn the beat off, go sit in the car, whatever. Sit there with that line in my head and then just go from there. And that's the vibe, the tempo I got, just go from there. Then I come back in the studio, and later verse, a lot of times, oftentimes, it's way more words than it's time to say them because I'm not writing to the exact same tempo and I'm writing it how it's supposed to be said in my mind, like spoken word, not necessarily like bars on the verse. And I didn't like doing punch-ins. You know, we was, we was from the Pac era where Tupac always said he did one take and he'd be fucked up, oh well. The first take is the best take because that's when you're the realist. That's what he said. So we always thought like it was a knock on you if it took you more than one take or you you had to punch in. It's like, you know, how you so you make sure you get it right and when you go in there, you lay it. So I wasn't big on punching in at the time. So I would lay it and it'd be a, a did, 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 kind of jumbling of my words. But that's kind of how I like, that's how it would be. So I go in there, I do my verse, still tipping, I come in there and lay it. T. Ferris look at me and say, hmm, scratch his head. Pow wow. Don't take this the wrong way, man. The verse is fire, bro. It is fire, but it's something about it. It just don't go. The tempo ain't, I don't know, bro. It just, I think you need to, man, just, can you write another verse? And I was like, oh, nah, I know you didn't just say, oh, man, you tripping. This verse hard, whatever, oh, whatever. And he's like, all right, man, it's it's cool. Man, if you don't even want to try, I didn't mean to offend you. If you don't even want to try, that's cool. You ain't got to try. And I just was felt like I let him down. So I was like, shit, I can't let my coach down. I can't, you know, I can't. Man, if Phil, Phil Jackson say run the triangle, I got to run the triangle, you know? So shit, I was like, all right. And this is at the time where he say, they say, he say, hey, we got to pick one. We can't put both of them on there. We can keep one for the remix, but what are we going to do? And we kind of all unanimously was like, well, we'll keep Pokey because he was had the hook. You know, it was his sample for the hook. And we wanted him to eat off of it, being that it was a sample for the hook. 
you know, we want him to be. I want man. I would. I wish both of them could have been on there, but for sure, being that it was his sample, I don't want to just take his sample and right. you know, take I got, him I off the record. Song. Yeah, right, like, right, 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 right. Shit, you know, it's his song. Just it's more, more his song than my song. It's his sample. Shit, it hooked. But um, from there, that's when I. It was like okay, I either had to use the one verse and add another, or come with two new verses. So T Fair is telling me come with another verse. I said fuck it. I'm gonna come with two new verses and scratch this one all together. So I scratched that verse, kept it on paper, kept it, put it in my pocket and said, I'm gonna use it one day. One day I'm gonna use it and pull it out when I need it. It might be when due to time I need something or if a big dog called me to get on something, I'm gonna pull it out of my pocket or whatever. But I got like a little, little, little secret pocket, you know, verse in my pocket to pull out any time. So I wrote two new verses for Sin Sideways and then what you hear in Sin Sideways is what I wrote, okay? But that secret verse, playing Pat, when he said, hey, hop on this for Kanye, I said, man, I got about, you know, eight hours in town to lay it. So I don't know how much time I got to even write a verse anyway. This is perfect. And it's for Kanye. It don't get no bigger than that, even though at the time he still was only one album deep. He still was Kanye. So I did it, and it went Perfect. That shit beat. was. I'm Perfect. posted up in the parking lot, my trunk waving. The candy paint is immaculate. It's candy simply amazing. Man. Come on, man. It's a star studded event when I valet park. Open up. Come on, dog. That shit is. But even then, though, <laughs> bro, it's like a. You really got on the song with Kanye and talk slab, dog. Right, like yeah. that's see, that's see, it's <laughs> it's funny because that's how I saw it, and that's what. First of all, the song was drive slow, but on top of that. That's why I say I'm I'm jamming on some screw. What it do? I'm drive slow. All of that I, I had to. If I'm gonna be on here with Kanye, gotta I gotta represent for yeah. H Town. And it's like, so some people upset with me for that. Like, ah, oh, you doing that local shit with Kanye? You should have went. You should have no, went. No, that there was the time him. to do the but shit. Yeah, I look at it the exact opposite. I'm like, nah, I got to put our. I got to represent for our shit, you know. And uh, did it. I still though. Um, I did my verse. I did it in Houston. Sent it to him. Playing past say, hey. Yeah, yeah, he fucking with it, but he wants you to come do it out here with him. He got a little hook, a bridge, some other stuff. He might want you to do some other stuff. Just come. He wants to do some more. So can you come to the studio out here in L.A. when you're going to be out here? Bet, whatever. But I'm in my mind the whole time I'm thinking at the end of the day, not like I don't believe in myself, just being realistic. Like this is going to come out and I'm not going to be on it. Like I don't know if I'm going to be on it. Kanye ain't going to put me on his album. This is just not. Who do have I even met that was on a Kanye album? You know what I'm saying? How would I be on a? Nah, yeah. that ain't gonna happen. So when he's telling me that, I'm like, all right, bet. Just you know, going through the motions, but still thinking, I, I, I'm not gonna be on a song, but I, I know you're gonna take me off, whatever. But shit, bet. Come out there, do my verse. Even then, we land at the airport. As soon as we come off the escalators, the baggage claim two detectives. One come to me, one come to Goo. We thought we was getting punked off top. They like, yeah, where you coming from? Let me search your bags, this and that. And I thought I was getting punked, so I started going after him, like going hard on him, talking shit. Cause I, I'm like, <laughs> yeah, catch you ain't gonna have me looking like no punk on yeah. punk on MTV shit. So I was talking shit, and he was about to. Probably, we was in public in the airport. Uh, Cause the disturbance, yeah. Post 9-11. <laughs> yeah. You know, so but he would have. He if we wouldn't have been in the airport, he I might have got my ass kicked because the way I was talking to a, a police officer in LA. You know, uh, but I thought it was—I thought I was getting punked. I wouldn't—I wouldn't talk to no. I—I I know firsthand from experience from getting beat up by police. So I'm not. No, I would never talk to a police officer like that. Uh, but eventually, he was like, his partner was like, "Come on, let's go. Come on," because he's trying to search my bags, and I was like, "Fuck it, come on, search my bags. You want to search all whole ass clown ass cop?" <laughs> and Goose just looking at me like, "Boy, you tripping?" I'm like, "Nah, fool, we getting punked." And he was like, yeah. <laughs> And he like, he like, oh, oh, we're not getting punk food. We're not. And I'm like, whatever. And I told, I told everybody that was with me. And this was like right around when Mike Jones got punk, but before. I told everybody, hey, I don't care who you are. If I get punked and you don't give me a heads up, I'm never speaking to you again. <laughs> shit. Because I, I ain't no punk. So, that shit you know, was so big at the any, time, any, though. Any, yeah. any one of us, anybody listening right now, you can, you can all say, if they try to punk me, nah, I ain't no punk, so they ain't gonna punk me. But at the same time, they catching everybody slipping. Yeah. And they they putting the worst situations that will stress you out and they stressing you out to the max to get you to go crazy and go wild, man. Hey. But I wasn't from the habit. 
that's man, you if I get punked and you don't and you know about it and don't tell me, I'll never speak to you again. But anyway, so I thought I was getting punked. I wasn't getting punked. Then from there we go. I whatever we do this and that, this and that. Goo didn't come to the uh, studio with me. I think he stayed at the hotel because it was like a just me kind of thing where they, I, I was the only one who could go. But um, we went. I mean, I don't know. They probably would have let him go. If I really would have asked, but. You know, we, we like to tread lightly, and, you know, I'm, I'm sure Goo probably would have wanted to go, but he respected and he tread lightly, too. You don't want to mess it up for me, too, knowing that, shit, yeah, this is big. Yeah. So I go to the – I'm going to the uh, studio. We pull up to the studio. I'm in a car, though. It's like car service, like a limo. It's like a Lincoln Town car, though, but it's car service. We're in the far left lane. The driver – this is before, like like uh like GPS type. This is in the baby stages of GPS, so – it ain't on no iPhone type shit. Ain't Google Maps. Uh, you know, it's it's uh, you know, the the Garwin or whatever they call mm -hmm. Garmin, whatever, but nah. He was this this guy was having trouble finding the studio. We in the far left lane. He gotta turn right though. We're at the light. We're in the front lane in the left turning lane, but we have to turn right. So out of nowhere, at the red light, ain't no cars around. He run the light, turn right, cross over. One, two, three lanes of traffic to turn right. But it wasn't no cars at the green light, so it wasn't no big deal. But what he didn't see in the far right lane, uh, if, you know, I know I'm probably confusing a lot of people, but in the far right lane that he cut in front of was a cop. We get pulled over right there. I'm like, oh, okay, we get fucked with in the airport. That's not a punk. But I'm thinking maybe they was punking me, but I just didn't fall for it. So they're like, now nah, let's catch them later. So now they're catching me. Now they're trying to catch me. I'm thinking, oh, I'm getting double pumped. The same. No, nah, no. Nah, uh -uh. Nope. I'm ready. I'm about to go. I'm about to get out the car and run. I'm about to talk shit to the cop. I'm about to fight the cop. Because uh, I'm thinking it's not a cop. I'm thinking um, this is an actor, you know? So I'm like, shit. Anyway, we right there. While the driver's getting the ticket, I asked the, and he was a driver, certified driver. I was a passenger, so, and it was all proof, right? Yeah, this is my passion. I'm driving him. He's like, all right, I'm going to give you a ticket, this and that, this and that, whatever. And he might have was, I don't know. So I, anyway, I asked, I was, hey, officer, that's where I'm going. Do I got to wait? Can I go? Because I'm late for a studio session with Kanye West. And he was like, nah, you can go. It ain't got nothing to do with you. You can get out. And I'm like, peace. Hmm. I'm out. But I really was trying to ditch getting punked. You know, yeah. I'm trying to like, shit. <laughs> so I'm like, you know, all this is still going in my mind, weighing on me, like, damn, okay. Is it, are they 0 for 2 on punking me? I'm, it's Kanye, and I'm thinking the whole time Kanye set me up to get punked. And this is like payback for Mike Jones not using his beat. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> shit. And I'm like, damn. So, okay, I'll go up there. He's like, hey, yeah, come upstairs. Go. I want you to do your verse up here. He kind of tell me this and that, whatever. And what, you know, the, the, the bridge, the hook, whatever. I, whatever. I lay my verse. Downstairs, Nas laying his verse for the song. Sure. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, and it, that just is crazy. And I don't do my verse, and I'm just – Kicking in, he like, yeah, you know, I was just lazy versus this verse. He letting us hear it and everything. And we just like, everybody tripping, like, man, you got, you know, not because even then at that time, Nas was like semi retired, you know what I'm saying? So even for Kanye to have a song with Nas was that was big for Kanye. Even, um, uh, matter of fact, I think he might have, did he mispronounce his name in the song? Or maybe not, but anyway, uh, that's, how, that's how fresh the guy it was. Maybe that's a different song, but anyway, but anyway, that that was it. And then next thing you know, the song come out, and I'm on it, and it do come out, and I'm on it, and I'm like, and everybody like, hey, you on Kanye album? Like it blew everybody mind because it just was out of nowhere. And then, man, Craig Calvin, a lot of people who was at Atlantic that called the shots, the executives. They used to be at Def Jam calling the shots at the executives. So they knew all the artists over there. They, Jay Z was the president of Def Jam at that time. They knew Jay Z because he was their artist while they were the president and et cetera. So they was like, um, Craig Calvin was like, hey, Paul Wall, what you think about this? Drive Slow also being on your album. And I'm like, what you mean? He's like, yeah, I talked to Jay Z. He said, it's cool. He's going to let y'all, he's going to license it out to you. Kanye cool with it. They all cool with it. They're going to let you use the album. They're not going to charge you. They're not going to charge you to clear it. None of that. They just they give it to you, basically. Uh, I think the only thing we, we might have had to pay for whatever. Oh, we did. They said the only thing Jay-Z said you got to do is you got to pay whatever Kanye's feature price is for a beat. Matter of fact, <laughs> this is a revelation right now I'm getting. He said... 
So whatever he charged for beat, which was either twenty thousand or fifty thousand, something like that. I was like, okay, so if I being Atlantic, which ain't my money, money I'm never gonna see anyway. If they pay you this, you gonna let me put Kanye West Drive Slow on my album? They's like, yeah. And Craig Cobb would say, and we're gonna promote it, it's gonna be our single. Uh, we're going to cross-label promote it. We're going to try something new because it's on multiple labels. He's on Def Jam, but that's our old label. You know, and this is, you know, whatever. We're going to try something new. Y'all going to perform it at the MTV Awards. And I'm like, fuck yeah. Hell yeah. That's what's up. Okay. He said, but the only thing is you got to, but all I got to do is pay him his feature beat, his beat price, whatever he charges for beats. So I'm like, bet. You know, they waiving all the other fees and all that, bet. But like I say, now that I'm having a revelation, that's all Kanye wanted for me. Maybe that was his way of, yeah, he could use it. But he got to pay for the beat since Mike Jones ain't want my beat. He got to pay for it. Yeah, <laughs> shit, it yeah. might have been all, maybe not, but shit, I wouldn't give a fuck. I'd do Damn, it. Damn, y'all did the video and shit. And like, did the video yeah. with Hype Williams. Yeah. Only video I ever did with Hype Williams. Man, that's crazy, bro. Shit, he, he had, that, that was a crazy experience, that whole thing. And then, then performing it at the $2 Bill concert. Man, when we performed it at the $2 Bill concert, I remember this was like one of the first times I smoked OG. And this is when Satellite OG was in its infant stages. And the name Satellite came from that, from the song. So anyway, and I said it twice. I said it on uh, Break Em Off. I'm hiding the satellite. satellite. And yeah. I said it somewhere on Drive, somebody being high as a satellite. Anyway, but my boys who they created Satellite OG, they said, hey, they didn't have a name for it anyway. What's the name of it? It's just, we ain't got no name for it. We just grow weed. It's just good weed. Shit, and okay. Oh, it's just OG, because that's the type of weed it was. But it wasn't a name for the particular type of OG. And it was like, hey, we're going to call it Satellite, because you said you're high as a satellite. This, this shit definitely going to get you high as a satellite. Bet. So that's how I got the name. So this is one of the early stages of me smoking Satellite. Well, I would, I smoked a lot. You know, I, I wasn't a, a, a heavy smoker like I am now. But I smoked a lot in the studio or around other people, but it wasn't me calling the weed man, rolling my weed up. It was, if Kiki smoking and he passed it to me, yeah, I'm going to hit it. If we were dip set and they smoking and they pass it to me, yeah, I'm going to smoke. And, uh, you know, kind of like not necessarily just because of who it is, but if I'm around some, if I'm around T. Ferris and he's smoking and he passes it to me, yeah, I'm going to smoke. But I wasn't calling up, you know, buying weed, rolling the weed like that. It was getting passed to me. Hey, 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 where the weed? You ain't got no weed, man. Get some weed. Like, I, that for so, yeah. that evolved later on. So, I was smoke weed, but our weed was a lot different than the OG, especially than Satellite OG. Even now, we, any weed out there is all a lot different than Satellite. This Satellite is a little bit topper of a notch. So, I remember smoking it before uh, uh, the $2 bill concert and my, my boy Skinhead Rob had some, and I was like, let's, yeah, I'm smoking. I'm, I had a cup, too. But I'm thinking I got, you know, regular weed. Not Reggie weed, but just what normal you used to. good. Yeah, 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 which was, yeah, completely probably. It wasn't Reggie, but it was Reggie compared to Satellite. <laughs> but I remember smoking it backstage thinking already off top, we wasn't performing to instrumentals. We performed songs with the words in them because we performing in clubs with janky sound. So you can barely hear the beat anyway. You got to have the words in it. Otherwise, you ain't going to catch the beat because you ain't going to know where to go. You can barely hear the sound. So we wasn't performing the instrumentals. We was performing to the song with the words in it. So the drive slow. So the $2 bill MTV $2 bill concert, that was we, you perform everything to the instrumental or to with the band, which I had never done in my life. So other than just like freestyling or something so i was nervous this was also my first time ever performing basically basically my first time maybe second of performing drive slow so i'm like okay i gotta get the words right i better not fuck up i'm gonna fuck up kanye ain't never gonna fuck with me again he ain't never gonna bring me out i'm gonna lose all he gonna, he gonna lose all his respect for me he had if i can't remember if i can't even remember my own words he gonna think somebody else wrote it you know just all of that this is coming through my mind like just the, the self-doubt of but it's also motivating me to practice so i would sit there practice 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 but then i hit that satellite thinking it's just some weed and i'm like next level high where it's like i'm like out of this world 
especially my first, you know, this was like not my first time smoking satellite, but in those stages, it was few. So I was like, oh, I'm definitely going to fuck up now, man. What the fuck? I was, this is, man, probably most nervous I've ever been in my life was throwing out the first pitch at the Astros game back in the day. Hmm. Uh, this is probably second. <laughs> Performing with Kanye West with just to the instrumental. But I went out, knocked it out the park. I didn't fuck up, thank God. Uh, and shit, and then we performed in other occasions, Madison Square Garden with Jay-Z, Diddy, all of that. We got, that's what's up. But I was high as a kite, and I was so nervous I was going to fuck up. And that's when I told myself, man, I ain't. I am not smoking before I get on stage. It took me a long time before I would smoke at shows because I didn't want or I wouldn't drink at shows, smoke at shows, nothing because I don't want to fuck up. I do not want to fuck up. And I, I got a hyperactive mind, so I'm going to be on stage looking at the person way in the back watching, you know, mm -hmm. this and that. People have a conversation. You know, I'm, I'm, I lose track easy of my verses while I'm performing. Still, I still do. I fuck up grills, still tipping, still to this day. <laughs> So man, but talk talk about uh talk about the record with uh with Jill Scott. How did that come along? That's another one. That's that's another one of my hip hop regrets. But it, I got a second chance, man. Um, there was the album she put out before that album. She had uh, I already I I can't remember how I met her, but I met her through somebody, and we got to be pretty good like friends, text friends. You know, I didn't see her that much, but you know, we were phone friends. Of course, I was a huge fan of her. Still, of course, still huge fan of her. Um, but yeah, no, I saw you know when they did the verses in the comments. Oh man. my yeah. god, I was yeah. I was waiting for so gone. <laughs> oh, yeah. she play so gone right now. <laughs> yeah. If she to play so gone, well, I, we might I might have got my wife pregnant. <laughs> but, <laughs> but anyway, we uh, before that she uh, she said, "Hey, I got a I got a song I want you to get on, man. I, you down? Bet, of course. I was on tour though. I was on a Honda Civic tour with." Uh, Fall Out Boy and uh, Plus 44, Blink-182, uh, Cobra Starship, a couple other people. So, uh, 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 see, I had a studio on my bus, but to me, that's good enough. Because when we did Still Tip, bro, when we did Still Tipping, it was a microphone just like this. It wasn't a microphone, like a studio microphone. It was a Shure mic. Is this, yep, a Shure sure, mic, just like this, the same ones you hold. We held the mic with a t-shirt over the mic. The t-shirt was the popper stopper. Wow. So that was still tipping. We just still tipping, holding the mic in Michael Watts' house. So uh, to me, recording on the bus was normal, was cool. Hey, I can record on the bus. It wasn't the quality, it was the capability of, does, can, are you capable of pressing record? Can you yep, my vocals? Right, yeah, 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 yeah. Shit. So I do a verse, send it back to Jill Scott, and she like, uh-uh. This is not what I wanted. And I thought it was because of the sound quality of the booth, uh, you know, because of the studio. So I was like, all right, well, I'm on tour, you know, for the next three months, and I'm in the middle of fucking nowhere. There ain't no, you know, uh, let me uh, let me get to the studio, maybe or something, I'll work it out. I go record it again, whatever. Same, I did the same studio setup, but I didn't do it in the bus. I moved it to the hotel room, and we, put the mattresses up to catch the sound, absorb the sound so it wouldn't be no echo, shit like that. Still, she was like, man, it, uh, I, it ain't it. I wanted something different. I wanted you to come a little different. To a different type of verse. The same way I'm telling you, any artists out there need to tell, hey, what you looking for? That's the same way she spoke up to me. And she said, I want to be there with you so I can tell you and show you how I want to do it because I can't do it over the phone. I'm sorry, I just can't use it. And it was like heartbreaking to me because this is like my favorite, you know, or one of my favorite or my favorite because she was like, I love Jill Scott. So it was like, oh man, but I respect the game. I appreciate the opportunity. Hands down, appreciate the opportunity because that's just, to me as, a, as an artist, all you want is a shot, you know? So you're going to give me a shot. That's just as good as putting me on the song. You get, if I fail to step up to the plate, if I strike out, that's on me. That ain't on you. That's on me. But the opportunity, oh, we. And the, the album came out, the song came out, and I remember it, like thinking even to the last minute, like, man, maybe she'll keep it and I'll be on it. And I remember it came out. And in the song, her intro, she gave me a shout out, pow wow, something else, and then something else, and then I came on my verse. And then when the song came out, you know, my shout out was 
missing along with my verse missing and just thinking like that was my uh, hip hop regret like man how, oh, how did I miss this fuck my mama's never gonna forget and, and, what, and what record was that this I don't remember exactly which one it is but if you pull up Jill Scott album it came out before the one I was on I could go right to it if I hear but it was one of them and anyway it I'm just thinking, like I said, my mama, my mama loves you because so I'm thinking, man, she never gonna forgive me for missing out on this. Like, but she, man, I, we still was cool. I still, I love, still love Jill Scott. So she was, you know, she's an amazing person, not just artist, but a human person. She's not even a human. She's an amazing spirit. Whatever she is, she's amazing. So, man, of course, I still loved her, and she. Gave me another shot one time, and she was like, hey. And we kept in contact. We was friends. You know, I think I made her grill. I can't remember if I, I made her. I made her a few grills. So, you know, her and my wife got to be friends. You know, my same, you know, kids is it's Auntie Jill. But when she gave me another chance, this was, uh, this was, uh, man, it's a, Man, it's a lot of blessings out there if you look, man. It's, it's it's hardships if you look too. That's why I say, man, when with the good and the bad, man, I gotta focus on the good, bro. Cause one day, <clears throat> this was maybe one of my biggest days, like just the most memorable, like me as Paul Waller artist. This this particular day was one of the biggest days ever for me in in hip hop and me. Like I'm in L.A. Kirk Bangs just signed to Warner to Asylum, maybe even before he was signed to Warner. He just straight Asylum, I don't know. I fucked with him, D. Will, they from Houston. First of all, I'm rooting the fuck for him. I want to give him any game I could give him, especially when it comes to holding your nuts on the labels because I've seen a lot of people paint themselves in the corner and never come out because they want to be right with the label instead of just letting the label do their thing and come back around next go around and do your thing so i wanted to share the knowledge i had with him <clears throat> and joey ie was uh, i was still signed to joey ie too at this time but anyway he uh he was like hey we uh going in the studio dj drama kirk bangs they working on a uh, mixtape you fuck with drama we got of course i fuck with drama for years before i was even in switch house i was fucking with drama um f like literally um shit and then it, I fuck with Kirk Oley from Houston. Why don't you come in here and be like the conduit? Because they don't necessarily know each other the way they might relate to me. And I'm like, all right, cool. I come over there. And it wasn't really to get on a song with Kirk Oley. It was just like the, just like, it wasn't tension. So not to ease the tension, but just like to break the ice. You know what I'm saying? Just to, shit. So I was kind of doing that, kind of giving them a little game. I already, you know, whatever I'm whatever anyway we he let me hear his music of course it's amazing it was his mixtape i think um progression was, yeah yeah and it was uh it was before his album but and it's just he going ham and i'm like man you gotta let me get on something because ain't no way you gonna have me over here and i can't let me please i begged him let me but he you know it was like he wanted to work with me anyway but i'm literally was like hey man let me put me on something that wasn't why i was there but i'm like Hey, While I'm here, let's get yeah. to let's get yeah. to this. Yeah, I, 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 let, let me get on some. So then we we did the uh, that's when we did uh we, we did that a uh, Devin song, um but uh, but um then we over there I'm done with that okay whatever we they was in the because they was in the studio drama and Kirk Bangs for like three five I don't know days straight twenty four hours a day I just came over there for one point to kind of hey Kirk been been in the studio. Why don't you come bring drama some weed? You know what I'm saying? Because, you know, they, neither one of them was from L.A., but I was living in L.A. at that time. This is when I was working a lot with Travis Barker. So I moved to L.A. to work with him, record an album with him. Um, so I was in L.A., and I had satellite. I had the, <laughs> the goodest, of the best of the best, of the best, of the best, the toppers of the show. And shit, so of course I brought some to, to drama. And shit, I don't even remember if Kirko was smoking at the time, um, but... Shit, he might have, he probably was, but really, you know, it was just like, I was just there to kind of break the ice, so just show some H Town love a little bit, whatever. And then if I get on the song, so be it. Got on the song, and then when I'm done, I'm chopping it up with drama, with uh, 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 with Joey Ie, and we, and he just like, Paul, what you got going on, man? I know you're working on the album with Travis. You know, with the album was Heart of a Champion. We did expensive taste shit too, but 
he, what I'm talking about was my Heart of a Champion album. And he just like, you know, um, what else you got going on? And I was like, you know, just telling him. And I was like, well, you know, Rick Ross, I fuck with Rick Ross a lot. He um, he keep trying to sign me as, you know, he, but I'm- Cause he was supposed to be the, the, he wanted you to be the Houston person when he was putting right. MMG together. Right, right. Rick Ross had a plan. He had a vision of, he was gonna sign artists from all over the country and get behind them and build an empire. And it worked, <laughs> shit, he, he, mission accomplished. Uh, but he, I was gonna be, you know, the, the Houston edition. Um, but what can you do? I was already signed to Switch House. I owed them multiple albums and I owed Atlantic multiple albums. So I wasn't in no position to do that. I might have, could have did it just like in, in name. Like, yeah, you signed me, but contractually, I'm signed to two other artists, Switch House and Asylum and Atlantic. And at that time, it was not Atlantic. It was Warner Brothers So for me. So, uh, it, you know, but he always fucked with me. We, we was in the same, like, freshman class of rap. So we, a lot of us who came out that year, we all had love for each other, supported each other. So, you know, he just was, you know, trying to, so I, I'm telling Joey how he did this. I'm like telling him, he like, what you doing? I'm like, yeah, I fuck with, you know, this, that, whatever. I'm fucking with Rick Ross a little bit. He always fuck with me. He keep telling me you want to sign me. And Joey, he's like, what? What you mean he want to sign you? And I'm telling him like, well, yeah, you know, he, how he doing his label thing. You know, he want to sign me as one of the Maybach artists and be like the Houston representative. And Joey's like, seeing the big picture, seeing what is gonna, Maybach music is gonna turn into, which it did turn into. And he's like, wait, 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 wait. Rick Ross wants you to be a part of that? You know, like, man, that might be a good idea. And I'm like, well, you tell me how that's gonna work. I'm signed to you. How am I gonna, what? You gonna let me out my contract to go sign with him or what? Cause I'm literally signed to you. So how is that gonna work? Yeah. And he's like, well, why you ain't tell me that? And I'm like, what am I gonna tell you? Hey, somebody want want to sign me when I'm already signed to you? You gonna be like, nah? But he's, I didn't get it. I didn't see the what, you know, the vision. But, but he, he could have worked it out. Yeah, he did, and he was like, damn, oh, that's crazy, man. That's what's up. Oh, whatever. And then while I'm telling him all of this, my phone ring is Jill Scott, and I'm sitting there talking to Joy. I eat drama, and she, what you doing? None. I'm over in the studio. Are you in the studio, man? I'm over in the studio too. You know, shit. You uh. I got something going on, man. I want you to come jump on. I, I, I you know, or I, she didn't even say jump on. I got, I got something going on. I, I need some help with. I want you to, uh, you down to come over in the studio and maybe help me out a little bit. And I'm thinking, how the fuck could I help Jill Scott in any way? Hmm. Could, what could I possibly contribute to somebody who was at the utmost epitome of? Talent in every aspect. What could I possibly contribute? Even and I'm already knowing that I missed the shot and I struck out the last time. She asked me to get on the song, so there's no way she asking me to get on the song. I'm thinking maybe she wanna. I don't know what she want, but it ain't to get on the song. It's something. But like I said, we was friends, so she. You know, I'm like okay. It's only strange that she would ask me to the studio because I'd never been in the studio with her before. But it, you know, other than that, we. We friends, you know, so shit, okay. So I'm, hey, hold on, hey, I'm talking to Joy. Hey, oh, oh, damn, Jill Scott calling me. And he's like, what? And I'm like, yeah, Jill Scott, hey, hold, hold on. Step out, talk to her, come back. And she tell me, yeah, come to the studio. I'm like, all right, I'm come. And I tell him, yeah, I'm about to go to the studio with Jill Scott. And he's like, Jill Scott is calling? And he's also like, how you over here with, with Kirko doing this with Kirko? And then you just dropped this Rick Ross bomb on me. And then Jill Scott called you too? And then he and Joey's like, do you think that he didn't see the value in you and in, in being like connected like that and really being that type of like? Nah, 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 not a, not like that. I, and I don't mean it like that, but I just mean it in that. I mean, maybe, but I don't think so because Joey, I he always believed in me, and he was always bringing me to. He didn't want to introduce me to Dipset. Hmm. He didn't want to introduce me to Khaled, Cool and Dre. He didn't want to introduce me. You were on the first Khaled album, yeah, right, right. About that, yeah. So you know I, that. Nah, it was it was more so. That's what I was thinking too when he's telling me, "What you mean, just got?" And then he hits me with the, "She got a contract right now that her lawyers got. I'm trying to sign her at Warner Brothers." And he, this was Joy. He said, "I'm trying to sign her at Warner Brothers," and she just called you. And Rick Ross, you tell me about Rick Ross. I'm trying to sign Rick Ross too. I'm trying to sign his label, and you, he, he and you fucking with him like that, and you fucking with Just Got like that. And he was like, just it was just blowing his mind that. Two major things he was had in the works, I was also like you you connected know, to. Connected yeah. to, yeah. So he was like, "What you gonna do with Jill Scott?" And I'm like, "I don't know." She told me to come to the studio, so 
Bye. <laughs> Bye. Y'all motherfuckers. I'll see y'all later. Shit. I'm going to go see what you was got. I'll, see. I'll let you know in an hour or two. Shit. But he was like, damn. Well, tell her. Tell her say what's up. And I'm like, she don't know. She, she don't know you. He's like, nah, fool. She do. He didn't say nah, fool. But he's like, nah, she do. Her lawyer got a contract right now. I'm trying to sign her. That We're working out the details. And she may be signing Warner Brothers. And I go to the studio. I tell her, yeah, I was over at the studio right now with Joey I.E. He say, uh, you know, and he tell her what he, say. he say he trying to sign you or something. You got to kind of, I don't know, say somebody you might sign to them. And she was just like, um, I don't know. Basically, she ain't wasn't trying to talk about all that. And I got that vibe, and it wasn't my business. So, and this was, I don't, I don't know what, you know, that type of stuff wasn't my business. So I was just like, just relaying the message. And from there, that was it. I ain't bring it up again, you know. And then, then we go in the studio with her. She kind of tell, you know, whatever. I mean, her just kicking it outside. We we both smoking, and we both smoking that satellite too. And then we go in there, and then she kind of let me hear a song. She like this is what I got. The song isn't just like. A lot of times, like how I do songs is I hear a beat, I write a verse, I write a hook. She does it, she does it a little more thought out, you know what I'm saying? Like she was like, hey, this is the story. This song is a story we telling. And this is the story. And she tell me the whole song, and it's about her being uh addicted to a relationship, unhealthy relationship. Or somebody who was dicking her down, and she don't know how to say no because it's just the sex so good. Because it's something she went through personally, and a lot of other people can relate to. So she was, you know, she had a whole perspective of how she wanted me to come off on there and everything. So she telling me this, and I'm like, all right. She like, just try something, come up with whatever, whatever. However long my verse was, went in there, did the verse, laid it, came back out. She was like, man. Don't take this the wrong way. And I'm like, fuck, I already struck out on the first <laughs> song. Now. And she gave me three strikes on the first song, by the way, that I struck out on. Now I'm like, okay, this strike one. Now she's going to give me strike two. And I'm like, and she kind of tell me, she like, also, by the way, I was very clean in my verse. Because I'm thinking, she is just got is my mama favorite artist. Just got is my wife favorite artist, my mother in law favorite, my sister in law favorite artist, my favorite artist as well. But I'm thinking, but she also, wanted you to talk that talk though. She wanted me to talk that talk. Yeah. So she was like, that's why she was like, look, you don't take it this wrong way, but don't be afraid to say you're gonna give me that dick. And I'm like, I I don't think I ever said dick on a verse before. I said that. <laughs> I man, I I didn't even pussy is a word I wouldn't say. Like, that was like saying the N-word to me. You know what I'm saying? Like, so any of that was like, I don't really talk too vulgar also because I'm married. So I don't want to just, some of that I toned down out of respect to my wife and my daughter. And out of respect to my mother-in-law having to hear a song of son-in-law saying he doing this and that. Like, this, you know, like, I'm just hearing it. Even though they might not, they I've never once ever had my wife or mother-in-law or anyone ever ask me to tone it down. Yeah. It's just, in my mind, I feel like, just respectful. Yeah, yeah just, she's just maybe out of respect. I've had my wife do like Jill, tell me, why I didn't even curse till I met my wife, bro. I was this is when I did not curse. I said, ish, uh, cluck them. You know, I, we made it we thought I we thought cussing was a lack of intelligence. Cause you don't got another word. My mama taught me that's what curse words were. You can't think of another word to say to motherfucker, bitch, shit. Then that means you ain't got what kind of mind you got. Use your mind, say something else. You know, it's just like my teacher told me, a lot. You, I'm never allowed to say a lot. So come up with another word for a lot or, you know, whatever. A, a plethora, you know, a bundle, you know, a bunch. Same thing with this. So I would never cuss. I, and come in. Both, neither one of us cussed. We, at that time, I don't know if he cussing now. I'm cussing like a motherfucker now. But I don't know about him. But, he, but we, uh, we didn't cuss. We made up our own cuss words. The meaning is still there. But the word that you associate with the meaning is a, a, word, a different word for me. I associate a different word with that meaning. So anyway, that's what it was. I didn't cuss until I met my wife and we was dating. And she was like, you sound like such a nerd saying this. <laughs> and I was like, what you mean? Thinking I'm playing. And she was like, uh-uh. I am never having sex with you again until you say fuck bitch shit. <laughs> and, she, and I was like, nope. And she was like, all right, bet. <laughs> and she won that battle because I was cussing shortly thereafter. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, it was from there it was, uh, but even in my rhymes, it took a long for, long time for me because the same, same thought process of I want to, you know, use my vocabulary, not just say some bullshit that I got for a lack of vocabulary. So, Anyway, I'm on there doing my ish up cluck 
you know. I remember when I first said it, I'm like, damn, bro, you kind of talking that yeah. shit out here, man. God but, damn. but it's because Jill's like, uh, okay, another baseball analogy. I struck out on the first one. This one, she get I struck, went in there again. She said, man, whatever. You don't be afraid to say dig or whatever, put or whatever. I go in there, change it up a little bit, come back out. That's strike two. She give me some more. Said, nah, I want you to be like, I'ma pull your hair. I'm a this I'm a ooh, I'ma have your eyes rolling back. And that's what I said. But she didn't rhyme it. I just rhymed what she said to me. But shit. So I was like, all right, went in there, put it, come back, whatever. She said, all right, go back in there, whatever, change it. And I'm just like, striking was foul tip. I'm foul yeah. tip striking. You know, so shit, you keep hitting them foul tips, you can this a long you could be a long at bat. So I had about 20 strikes, but you know, they was all foul tips. And then eventually I shit, it was it was where she wanted it, where it needed to be, you know, shit, and where well, where it is, you know, at least good enough, you know, shit. I don't know. But she damn yeah, wrote my verse. I mean, that was a big deal. Yeah, that was huge for me. For me especially too, because when you when you when you did a video with somebody, even now it just shows that the real collaboration of the I fuck with them. Not always, but that's the perception a lot of us see. You know what I'm saying? So that's the, the perception I wanted to put out there for sure. And yeah, I want to do a video with y'all. I'll pay for whatever I got to. See, yeah. what we got to do? Shit. And I, I, oh, man. This is after I had my surgery, too. So I was I lost weight and I was flabby as fuck. <laughs> oh, I was flabby. I, it would have been cool if I was fat. But I was flabby. I was losing weight and a little bit flabby looking a little weak. I was, man. <laughs> They was like, hey, you ain't got no white beard or no? Because they knew I wanted to take my shirt off. I was like, all right. I took my shirt off under the white beard. And it was like, uh, hey, you want to do some push-ups or something real quick? <laughs> I'm really sitting there doing push-ups. Like, yeah, I know I'm looking weak. Let me do some push-ups because, shit, I can't be on this video looking weak. Oh, man, they cropped it, though. So, they, you know, they did me justice because I was looking weak. But anybody who was there will tell you, when we were shooting the video, that was like one of the jokes is, how weak I was looking with my wife beat her on. Like, it was like, and I was telling a lot of the jokes, so it wasn't like they yeah. were bullying me or nothing. But and I remember Jill saying, Paul, Jill, don't, I know Crystal, she ain't, don't worry, she's not gonna be mad. I already talked to her, she cool. This art. So, what we do right now is art. So, whatever we got going on, don't worry, she cool, whatever, don't worry. And I'm like, all right. Well, we about to have a sex scene or something? <laughs> what about to do? No, 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 I ain't said. But that's what I'm thinking, like, yeah. why, what you mean? But then that's like when we did the scene where, like, I'm all up on her from mm -hmm. behind the chair, all this. Even then, I was like, shit, I don't, because out of respect for her, I don't want to, you know, and at the same time, just knowing how a lot of dudes be. You mm -hmm. know, shit, they going to feel on your ass if they get the chance. You know, shit, I'm like, I don't want to disrespect her in no type of way or none of that. But it was, man, that was, man, to work with her like that into have an opportunity to perform it with her on the stage. Man, that was my biggest hip hop regret where I got a second chance where it was like, oh, thank you to, who thank God? All the gods of hip hop, man, and and the God, thank you, thank yeah. you. Cause man, that was something. Yeah, now that was live, man. We've been talking for like three and a half hours. We're gonna have to do another part two cause it's a whole <laughs> yeah. lot of shit we ain't talked about. <laughs> but a whole lot that we did. Uh, any last thing before we wrap this part up? Um, shit, man, yeah, man, big shout out. Uh, to Jill Scott for putting me on the, uh, <laughs> for keeping me on the. Oh yeah, let me finish this this particular story of this okay. day in hip hop. And I say this is this is like part of my my best day of hip hop. You know, cause I I'm in there with Kirko Bangs. I do a song with Kirko Bangs, and drama and joy. I like these is big names in hip hop. Yeah. you know what I'm saying. Yeah. And then I get a call and I go do a song with Jill Scott. It's huge for me. Huge for me. Then I chop it up with. Joy IE about Rick Ross, and he tell me, yeah, I'm trying to sign Rick Ross. And then I backdoor tell Rick Ross, hey, Rick Ross, you know, whatever. Hey, then Joy IE say, you know, he trying to sign your, your record label and all this and that. And he like, yeah, I know he been telling me that since we did Holla At Me, you know, as we Rick Ross say. Because when we did Holla At Me, Joy IE the one who put that together. He brought me over there to the studio to do the song with them and shit, it, it worked. He was, that's why I gave him a shout out in the song. Mm -hmm. Joey I, he got the sweet. <laughs> shit, he showed enough pay for that motherfucker on his credit card. Shit, yeah. Shout out Joey I, he paid for the sweet. But then, uh, so anyway, he Joey I, he called me and said, hey look, this the play. Since you fuck with Rick Ross like that, I'm trying to, I told you what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to sign him 
and Maybach Music, his label. Not him as an artist necessarily, but his label. And he say, he on tour right now in Canada. I already talked to him, already talked to his people, all right, blah, you know, line it up, we good. You down to come out there with me for a couple of days? You, we just going to fuck with him in Canada on his tour. I'm like, I ain't got shit else to do. This is when I was, like I said, living in California. So this is, we go to Cal, you know, and and all this happened that same day at the studio. But then we, okay, we go to, then we, you know, th that's when he lined up the flights. And then the next week we go out, a couple of days later, we go out to Canada. We go out there, we, we fuck with Rick Ross a little bit. I actually had a beard then too, where I was trying to grow a full beard back then too, but it just was looking kind of weak. <laughs> <laughs> so I cut it off. And this was before Instagram. So I, I cut it off because we did a show. We did a show in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and me and Goo came out there. I just lost weight. I had a beard. We just so happened to both have on a Swisher House shirt, or the same shirt, expensive taste shirt, something. We had the same shirt on. And people in the crowd was looking at him, looking at me, looking at him, looking at me. Hmm. Like, because Goo was my hype man at the time, too. And they was like, well, which one Paul Wall? We know he lost weight, but which one is him? And a girl in the, in the front row was like, Oh, nah, that ain't no Paul Wall. Hey, y'all, this is a fake Paul Wall. That ain't a Paul Wall. This is a fake Paul Wall. You is not no Paul Wall. I know Paul Wall. I done seen him in concert, and I'm like, what? And it's about to get ugly. And I'm just like, man, and I'm like asking her, what you say? You say, ain't Paul Wall? You crazy. I'm Paul Wall, baby. I say something, and then she's like, ah, it's Paul Wall or something. But yeah. I did not look like Paul Wall. I lost a shitload of weight. I went from being 350 pounds to being 165 like Pac. I, hmm. I, I tried to grow a beard, all that. So I was, after that, I, I didn't even make it to the house. My car was parked at Goo House. I went inside, I said, Goo, let me go inside right quick. Went inside, shaved off my whole thing, went back to the soul patch, the <laughs> Lenny, the old, the, the original Power Wall beard, and I was like, man, that ain't it. But we went out there, we we, we chopped it up with Rick Ross. Before um, Joey I came in the room, you know, when we had our meeting, it was just me and Rick Ross, and he just, he was fucking with me. He's just telling me, man, I, I fuck with you. You know, you you one of my favorites or or my favorite out of Ace Town. You the hardest, you know, or, or one of the hardest out of Ace Town. He, he's quoting my raps. Well, anybody who's been like uh, like uh, uh, winding down by record labels, they're quick to gas you up and tell you the greatest shit on earth and your shit don't stink. But he wasn't doing that. He was like putting shit out there. Quoting various songs that well, you could tell what he yeah, what he I'm meant like, what he was saying. Yeah. yeah, like how do you even know that verse? And he's telling me the bar of the verse. Like yeah, I always, you know, telling me just different shit. And he fucking with me, telling me his plan or how you want to sign somebody in every city and kind of, you know, build or something. And he like, hey, I want you to be, you know, my ace town. And I'm like, hey, let's get Joey to okay, let's make it work. And then call Joey and he tell Joey and Joey kind of give him. A thing and Joey, Joey tell him, man, I, I love what you did with Diddy because Rick Ross kind of like co wrote and AR or something with Diddy album or something he was doing at the time. He was like, I love what you did with this, that. And he just was going through a list of shit and he was like, hey, I love you as an artist, but I want to sign you as a AR CEO. And let me show you what I can do with your artists that you discover or you find or whatever under your crew. Let me show you what I can do, how I can work them. You're going to love it so much, you're going to want to come over here and sign as an artist. Rick Ross say, all right, bet. This is exactly what he said. Bet. First artist is going to be Paul Wall. Oh, no shit. And I'm like, and I'm just like looking at both of them, watching. I'm surprised I'm even in the room because they talking business that really ain't my business. I yeah. shouldn't even be in here watching. We was in Canada. This one, I, I met my boy Corey from Vintage Frames. You know, he... Yeah, icon now. Yeah, Vintage Frames. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. But this is, you know, he was he was big then too, but he wasn't like a global icon. He was, he was successful. He was a successful entrepreneur. I ain't trying to discount what he was at the time because he still was the man. But of course, he's the man, 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 man now. But you know, that's when I met him back then too. But I'm like still just surprised I'm in the meeting. You know, he say that, and I'm like, shit. I'm looking back at Joy like, oh shit, what Joy about to say? You know, and Joy was just like. All right, well, you know, we'll get to that later. That'll come up. We know that's fine. That's fine. But let's get it work. He didn't like just necessarily say yeah, but he didn't necessarily say no. But I was definitely feeling like, wait a minute, that ain't uh, that ain't a yeah, but that's a, you know what. And he, Joey's just like, don't worry, you're gonna be good. I'm gonna make sure you straight this and that or whatever. And I'm just like, all right, you know. And uh, but Joey was like, Paul, man, I really want to do it with you, and I think it would be good, but. I don't remember verbatim but what he said, but the spirit of our conversation was along the lines of, it is a lot going on within 
Swisher House, Paul Wall, Mike Jones, other artists, G Dash, Michael Watts, and T Ferris, the whole thing. It was a lot of people pulling in different ways. Mike Jones already was no longer Switch House. He's only Ice Age. It was a big, big, big deal. It was a whole lot of uh, animosity or like just, I don't know, tension or just like, which is weird amongst all of the cooks, the chefs that were in the kitchen because that was kind of what the problem was. There was Michael Watts and G-Dash were co-CEOs. So that's two CEOs. Then there's Joey I.E., who was, uh, I don't know what his title was, president maybe. Then there's Ron Spaulding, who was the general manager. Then there was Todd Moskowitz, who was the CEO. Then there was all the Atlantic people or Warner Brothers people, which were just as many. Then there was like Leo Cohen and the big dogs, you know. So there was like Julie Greenwald. Not only was there Julie Greenwald, Craig Cowman, Leo Cohen, Kevin Lyles, but there also was the middlemen that was also big dogs, like G. Robeson um, or Mike Karen or those type of people. So there was a lot of people who were fighting for their songs to go on albums or were pushing for this or that. And I'm just there as an artist. I don't know what the fuck to do or how. I'm just doing whatever they telling me to do. All of them are doing. I'm just, as you know, to this day, I can honestly say I did right by, I ain't do wrong by none of them people. I did, hey, whatever they told me to do, I did. Whatever they told me to do, I did. Whatever they told me to do, I did. I did right by all of them, you know, even if it, shit, at the time, it was what we felt like was the best. But, uh, you know, Joey was just straight up real with me. He was just like, it ain't going to work. How is it going to work where you got two CEOs already over here, now Rick Ross going to be the CEO too, and this and that, and you already signed to them, and you got multiple albums with them too? Like, did you still owe for us? So he was just, just too much. Yeah, yeah, he just he kept it real with me. But he was like, "Hey, I." He took care of me in a few other ways that I ain't gonna talk about. But he did, you know. He did. He, you know, man. Shout out to Joy Ie because he 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 looked out for my long term well being as an artist. He he taught me a lot of positivity in the game. He showed me too with his actions, you know, how to keep it real, man. So big shout out to to Joy Ie. You know, a lot of a lot of the ways he did kind of. First of all. All I was was a fly on the wall. Rick Ross shortly thereafter signed, Maybach Music signed to Warner Brothers, and then not too long when Rick Ross' uh, deal with Def Jam was up, he also signed to Warner Brothers. But none of that was because of me or had nothing to do with me. It just was, I happened to mention to Joey, and Joey was like, oh, I'm already trying to sign him. He trying to sign you too. Why don't we do something together? And then we tried, and it didn't work out, but... It's crazy to think that I was just, damn, I'm in part of that meeting. Like, now I was in that meeting. I mean, you were instrumental with a yeah. Maybach music yeah, deal, yeah, man. Yeah, that's but, big, man. That's, that's history, but, but he, man. But I'm just saying, like, the Joey, I, you know, he did, like, he took care of me after that, for sure. He took care of me, man. So, man, even though I wasn't a part of Maybach music, like, artist-wise, he did take take care of me, man. But uh, all of that came from that, that one day, shit, of, shit, of being in that studio. Well, it was a good day for me in hip-hop, boy. It was a good day. Yeah. But... That's what's up. Well, shit, man. Any last words, man, before we get about it? Like I said, we're going to do it again because this is. I'm going to give 20 minutes of last words. <laughs> <laughs> and another thing. Uh, man, nah, man. Thank you for having me on here, man. Shit, this is a uh, part. This is part one. Yeah, we're we going to have part one. Then we can finish up some shit, keep going with other stories, and then maybe we'll get some reactions from some people or maybe that'll spark something too. Maybe we could get shit. We could see what, you know, maybe what the fans and listeners, what they might have to say. They might, it might be something we might have talked about. They might want to know further about or might want me to elaborate on. So, yeah, this, this is a good part one, man. Thank you, baby. For sure, man. Paul Wall, this is Donnie Houston Podcast, man. We out. Donnie Houston.